Part One of The Naval War of 1812. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson. The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. Part One. Preface. The history of the naval events of the War of 1812 has been repeatedly presented both to the American and the English reader. Historical writers have treated it either in connection with a general account of the contest on land and sea, or as forming a part of the complete record of the navies of the two nations. A few monographs, which confine themselves strictly to the naval occurrences, have also appeared but none of these works can be regarded as giving a satisfactorily full or impartial account of the war, some of them being of the popular and loosely constructed order, while others treat it from a purely partisan standpoint. No single book can be quoted which would be accepted by the modern reader as doing justice to both sides, or, indeed, as telling the whole story. Any one specially interested in the subject must read all, and then it will seem almost a hopeless task to reconcile the many and wildly contradictory statements he will meet with. There appear to be three works which, taken in combination, give the best satisfaction on the subject. First is James's Naval History of Great Britain which supplies both the material and the opinions of almost every subsequent English or Canadian historian, can be found the British view of the case. It is an invaluable work, written with fullness and care. On the other hand, it is also a piece of special pleading by a bitter and not over-scrupulous partisan. This, in the second place, can be partially supplemented by Fenimore Cooper's Naval History of the United States. The latter gives the American view of the cruises and battles, but it is much less of an authority than James's, both because it is written without great regard for exactness, and because all figures for the American side need to be supplied from Lieutenant, now Admiral, George E. Emmons's statistical history of the united states navy which is the third of the works in question but even after comparing these three authors many contradictions remain unexplained and the truth can only be reached in such cases by a careful examination of the navy records the london naval chronicle niles register and other similar documentary publications Almost the only good criticisms on the actions are those incidentally given in standard works on other subjects, such as Lord Howard Douglas's Naval Gunnery and Admiral Urion de la Graviere, Guerres Maritime. Much of the material in our Navy Department has never been touched at all. In short, no full, accurate, and unprejudiced history of the war has ever been written. The subject merits a closer scrutiny than it has received. At present, people are beginning to realize that it is folly for the great English-speaking republic to rely for defense upon a navy composed partly of antiquated hulks and partly of new vessels rather more worthless than the old it is worth while to study with some care that period of our history during which our navy stood at the highest pitch of its fame and to learn anything from the past it is necessary to know as near as may be the exact truth accordingly the work should be written impartially if only from the narrowest motives without abating a jot from one's devotion to his country and flag, I think a history can be made just enough to warrant its being received 
as an authority equally among Americans and Englishmen. I have endeavored to supply such a work. It is impossible that errors, both of fact and opinion, should not have crept into it. And although I have sought to make it in character as non-partisan as possible, these errors will probably be in favor of the American side. As my only object is to give an accurate narrative of events, I shall esteem it a particular favor if anyone will furnish me with the means of rectifying such mistakes, and if I have done injustice to any commander or officer of any grade, whether American or British, I shall consider myself under great obligations to those who will set me right. I have been unable to get access to the original reports of the British commanders, the logs of the British ships, or their muster rolls, and so have been obliged to take them at second hand from the Gazette or Naval Chronicle or some standard history. The American official letters, log books, original contracts, muster rolls, etc., however, being preserved in the archives at Washington, I have been able, thanks to the courtesy of the Honorable William H. Hunt, Secretary of the Navy, to look them over. The set of letters from the officers is very complete in three series, captain's letters, master's commandant letters, and officer's letters, there being several volumes for each year. The books of contracts contain valuable information as to the size and build of some of the vessels. The log books are rather exasperating, often being very incomplete. Thus, when I turned from Decatur's extremely vague official letter describing the capture of the Macedonian to the logbook of the frigate United States, not a fact about the fight could be gleaned. The last entry in the log on the day of the fight is Strange Sail Discovered to be a frigate under English colors, and the next entry on the following day relates to the removal of the prisoners. The log of the Enterprise is very full indeed for most of the time, but is a perfect blank for the period during which she was commanded by Lieutenant Burroughs and in which she fought the boxer. I have not been able to find the Peacock's log at all, though there is a very full set of letters from her commander. Probably the fire of 1837 destroyed a great deal of valuable material. Whenever it was possible, I have referred to printed matter in preference to manuscript, and my authorities can thus, in many cases, be easily consulted. In conclusion, I desire to express my sincerest thanks to Captain James D. Bullock, formerly of the United States Navy, and Commander Adolf Mensing, formerly of the German Navy, without whose advice and sympathy this work would probably never have been written or even begun. New York City, 1882 Preface to Third Edition I originally intended to write a companion volume to this, which should deal with the operations on land, but a short examination showed that these operations were hardly worth serious study. They teach nothing new. It is the old, old lesson that a miserly economy in preparation may in the end involve a lavish outlay of men and money which, after all, comes too late to more than partially offset the evils produced by the original short-sighted parsimony. This might be a lesson worth dwelling on, did it have any practical bearing on the issues of the present day. But it has none, as far as the army is concerned. It was criminal folly for Jefferson and his follower, Madison, to neglect to give us a force, either of regulars or of well-trained volunteers, during the twelve years they had in which to prepare for the struggle that anyone 
might see was inevitable but there is now far less need of an army than there was then circumstances have altered widely since eighteen twelve instead of the decaying might of spain on our southern border we have the still weaker power of mexico instead of the great indian nations of the interior able to keep civilization at bay to hold in check strong armies to ravage large stretches of territory and needing formidable military expeditions to overcome them there are now only left broken and scattered bands which are sources of annoyance merely to the north we are still hemmed in by the canadian possessions of great britain but since eighteen twelve our strength has increased so prodigiously both absolutely and relatively while england's military power has remained almost stationary that we need now be under no apprehension from her land forces for even if checked in the beginning we could not help conquering in the end by sheer weight of numbers if by nothing else so that there is now no cause for our keeping up a large army while on the contrary the necessity for an efficient navy is so evident that only our almost incredible short-sightedness prevents our at once preparing one not only do the events of the war on land teach very little to the statesman who studies history in order to avoid in the present the mistakes of the past but besides this the battles and campaigns are of little interest to the student of military matters the british regulars trained in many wars thrashed the raw troops opposed to them whenever they had anything like a fair chance but this is not to be wondered at for the same thing has always happened the world over under similar conditions our defeats were exactly such as any man might have foreseen and there is nothing to be learned from the follies committed by incompetent commanders and untrained troops when in the presence of skilled officers having under them disciplined soldiers the humiliating surrenders abortive attacks and panic routs of our armies can all be paralleled in the campaigns waged by napoleon's marshals against the spaniards and portuguese in the years immediately preceding the outbreak of our own war the peninsula troops were as little able to withstand the french veterans as were our own militia to hold their own against the british regulars but it must always be remembered to our credit that while seven years of fighting failed to make the spaniards able to face the french footnote at the closing battle of toulouse fought between the allies and the french the flight of the spaniards was so rapid and universal as to draw from the duke of wellington the bitter observation that though he had seen a good many remarkable things in the course of his life yet this was the first time he had ever seen ten thousand men running a race and a footnote two years of warfare gave us soldiers who could stand against the best men of britain on the northern frontier we never developed a great general brown's claim to the title rests only on his not having committed the phenomenal follies of his predecessors but by eighteen fourteen our soldiers had become seasoned and we had acquired some good brigade commanders notably scott so that in that year we played on even terms with the british but the battles though marked by as bloody and obstinate fighting as ever took place were waged between small bodies of men and were not distinguished by any feats of generalship so that they are not of any special interest to the historian in fact the only really noteworthy feat of arms of the war took place at new orleans and the only military genius that the struggle developed was andrew jackson his deeds are worthy of all praise 
and the battle he won was in many ways so peculiar as to make it well worth a much closer study than it has yet received it was by far the most prominent event of the war it was a victory which reflected high honor on the general and soldiers who won it and it was in its way as remarkable as any of the great battles that took place about the same time in europe such being the case i have devoted a chapter to its consideration at the conclusion of the chapters devoted to the naval operations as before said the other campaigns on land do not deserve very minute attention but for the sake of rendering the account of the battle of new orleans more intelligible i will give a hasty sketch of the principal engagements that took place elsewhere the war opened in mid-summer of eighteen twelve by the campaign of general hull on the michigan frontier with two or three thousand raw troops he invaded canada about the same time fort mackinaw was surrendered by its garrison of sixty americans to a british and indian force of six hundred hull's campaign was unfortunate from the beginning near brownstown the american colonel van horn with some two hundred men was ambushed and routed by tecumseh and his indians in revenge colonel miller with six hundred americans at maguaga attacked one hundred and fifty british and canadians under captain muir and two hundred and fifty indians under tecumseh and whipped them tecumseh's indians standing their ground longest the americans lost seventy-five their foes one hundred eighty men at chicago the small force of sixty-six americans was surprised and massacred by the indians meanwhile general brock the british commander advanced against hull with a rapidity and decision that seemed to paralyze his senile and irresolute opponent the latter retreated to detroit where without striking a blow he surrendered fourteen hundred men to brock's nearly equal force which consisted nearly one half of indians under tecumseh on the niagara frontier an estimable and honest old gentleman and worthy citizen who knew nothing of military matters general van rensselaer tried to cross over and attack the british at queenstown eleven hundred americans got across and were almost all killed or captured by a nearly equal number of british canadians and indians while on the opposite side a large number of their countrymen looked on and with abject cowardice refused to cross to their assistance the command of the army was then handed over to a ridiculous personage named smythe who issued proclamations so bombastic that they really must have come from an unsound mind and then made a ludicrously abortive effort at invasion which failed almost of its own accord a british and canadian force of less than four hundred men was foiled in an assault on ogdensburg after a slight skirmish by about one thousand americans under brown and with this trifling success the military operations of the year came to an end early in eighteen thirteen ogdensburg was again attacked this time by between five hundred and six hundred british who took it after a brisk resistance from some three hundred militia the british lost sixty and the americans twenty in killed and wounded general harrison meanwhile had begun the campaign in the northwest at frenchtown on the river raisin winchester's command of about nine hundred western troops was surprised by a force of eleven hundred men half of them indians under the british colonel proctor the right division taken by surprise gave up at once the left division 
mainly Kentucky riflemen, and strongly posted in houses and stockaded enclosures, made a stout resistance, and only surrendered after a bloody fight, in which 180 British and about half as many Indians were killed or wounded. Over 300 Americans were slain, some in battle, but most in the bloody massacre that followed. After this, General Harrison went into camp at Fort Meigs, where, with about 1,100 men, he was besieged by 1,000 British and Canadians under Proctor and 1,200 Indians under Tecumseh. A force of 1,200 Kentucky militia advanced to his relief and tried to cut its way into the fort while the garrison made a sortie. The sortie was fairly successful, but the Kentuckians were scattered like chaff by the British regulars in the open, and when broken were cut to pieces by the Indians in the woods. Nearly two-thirds of the relieving troops were killed or captured. About four hundred got into the fort. Soon afterward, Proctor abandoned the siege. Fort Stevenson, garrisoned by Major Crogan and 160 men, was attacked by a force of 391 British regulars who tried to carry it by assault and were repulsed with the loss of a fourth of their number. Some 4,000 Indians joined Proctor, but most of them left him after Perry's victory on Lake Erie. Then Harrison, having received large reinforcements, invaded Canada. At the River Thames, his army of 3,500 men encountered and routed between 600 and 700 British under Proctor and about 1,000 Indians under Tecumseh. The battle was decided at once by a charge of the Kentucky Mounted Riflemen, who broke through the regulars, took them in rear, and captured them, and then, dismounting, attacked the flank of the Indians, who were also assailed by the infantry. Proctor escaped by the skin of his teeth, and Tecumseh died fighting, like the hero that he was. This battle ended the campaign in the Northwest. In this quarter it must be remembered that the war was, on the part of the Americans, mainly won against Indians, the latter always forming over half of the British forces. Many of the remainder were French Canadians, and the others were regulars. The American armies, on the contrary, were composed of the armed settlers of Kentucky and Ohio, Native Americans of English speech and blood, who were battling for lands that were to form the heritage of their children. In the West, the war was only the closing act of the struggle that for many years had been waged by the hardy and restless pioneers of our race, as with rifle and axe they carved out the mighty empire that we their children inherit. It was but the final effort with which they wrested from the Indian lords of the soil the wide and fair domain that now forms the heart of our great republic. It was the breaking down of the last barrier that stayed the flood of our civilization. It settled once and forever that henceforth the law, the tongue, and the blood of the land should be neither Indian nor yet French, but English. The few French of the West were fighting against a race that was to leave as little trace of them as of the doomed Indian peoples with whom they made common cause. The presence of the British mercenaries did not alter the character of the contest. It merely served to show the bitter and narrow hatred with which the Mother Island regarded her greater daughter, predestined as the latter was to be queen of the lands that lay beyond the Atlantic. Meanwhile, on Lake Ontario, the Americans made successful descents on York and Fort George, scattering or capturing their comparatively small garrisons, while a counter-descent by the British on Sackett's Harbor failed, the attacking force being too small. 
after the capture of fort george the americans invaded canada but their advance guard fourteen hundred strong under generals chandler and winder was surprised in the night by eight hundred british who advancing with the bayonet broke up the camp capturing both the generals and half the artillery though the assailants who lost two hundred and twenty of their small number suffered much more than the americans yet the latter were completely demoralized and at once retreated to fort george soon afterward colonel burstler with about six hundred men surrendered with shamefully brief resistance to a somewhat smaller force of british and indians then about three hundred british crossed the niagara to attack black rock which they took but were afterward driven off by a large body of militia with the loss of forty men later in the season the american general mcclure wantonly burned the village of newark and then retreated in panic flight across the niagara in retaliation the british in turn crossed the river six hundred regulars surprised and captured in the night fort niagara with its garrison of four hundred men two thousand troops attacked black rock and after losing over a hundred men in a smart engagement with somewhat over fifteen hundred militia whom they easily dispersed captured and burned both it and buffalo before these last events took place another invasion of canada had been attempted this time under general wilkinson an unprincipled imbecile as scott very properly styled him it was mismanaged in every possible way and was a total failure it was attended with but one battle that of chrysler's farm in which one thousand british with the loss of less than two hundred men beat back double their number of americans who lost nearly five hundred men and also one piece of artillery the american army near lake champlain had done nothing its commander general wade hampton being if possible even more incompetent than wilkinson he remained stationary while a small force of british plundered plattsburg and burlington then with five thousand men he crossed into canada but returned almost immediately after a small skirmish at chadagwe between his advanced guard and some five hundred canadians in which the former lost forty-one and the latter twenty-two men this affair in which hardly a tenth of the american force was engaged has been absurdly enough designated a battle by most british and canadian historians in reality it was the incompetency of their general and not the valor of their foes that caused the retreat of the americans the same comment by the way applies to the so-called battle of plattsburg in the following year which may have been lost by sir george prevost but was certainly not won by the americans and again a similar criticism should be passed on general wilkinson's attack at la cole mill near the head of the same lake neither one of the three affairs was a stand-up fight in each a great superior force led by an utterly incapable general retreated after a slight skirmish with an enemy whose rout would have been a matter of certainty had the engagement been permitted to grow serious in the early spring of eighteen fourteen a small force of one hundred sixty american regulars under captain holmes fighting from behind felled logs routed two hundred british with a loss of sixty-five men they themselves losing but eight on lake ontario the british made a descent on oswego took it by fair assault and afterward lost one hundred eighty men who tried to cut out some american transports and were killed or captured to a man all through the spring and early summer the army on the niagara frontier was carefully drilled by brown and more especially by scott 
and the results of this drilling were seen in the immensely improved effectiveness of the soldiers in the campaign that opened in july fort erie was captured with little resistance and on the fourth of july at the river chippeway brown with two brigades of regulars each about twelve hundred strong under scott and ripley and a brigade of eight hundred militia and indians under porter making a total of about thirty two hundred men won a stand-up fight against the british general rial who had nearly twenty five hundred men eighteen hundred of them regulars porter's brigade opened by driving in the canadian militia and the indians but was itself checked by the british light troops ripley's brigade took very little part in the battle three of the regiments not being engaged at all and the fourth so slightly as to lose but five men the entire brunt of the action was borne by scott's brigade which was fiercely attacked by the bulk of the british regulars under rial the latter advanced with great bravery but were terribly cut up by the fire of scott's regulars and when they had come nearly up to him scott charged with the bayonet and drove them clean off the field the american loss was three hundred twenty two including twenty three indians the british loss was five hundred and fifteen excluding that of the indians the number of americans actually engaged did not exceed that of the british and scott's brigade in fair fight closed by a bayonet charge defeated an equal force of british regulars on july twenty fifth occurred the battle of niagara or lundy's lane fort between general brown with thirty one hundred footnote as near as can be found out most american authorities make it much less lossing for example says only twenty four hundred and a footnote americans and general drummond with thirty five hundred footnote general drummond in his official letter makes it but twenty eight hundred james who give the details makes it three thousand rank and file adding thirteen per cent for the officers sergeants and drummers brings it up to thirty four hundred and we still have to count in the artillery drivers etc and a footnote british it was brought on by accident in the evening and and was waged with obstinate courage and savage slaughter till midnight on both sides the forces straggled into action by detachments the americans formed the attacking party as before scott's brigade bore the brunt of the fight and over half of his men were killed or wounded he himself was disabled and borne from the field the struggle was of the most desperate character the combatants showing a stubborn courage that could not be surpassed footnote general drummond writes in so determined a manner were their attacks directed against our guns that our artillerymen were bayoneted while in the act of loading and the muzzle of the enemy's guns were advanced within a few yards of ours even james says upon the whole however the american troops fought bravely and the conduct of many of the officers of the artillery corps especially would have done honor to any service End of footnote. charge after charge was made with the bayonet and the artillery was taken and retaken once and again the loss was nearly equal on the side of the americans eight hundred fifty four men including generals brown and scott wounded and two guns on that of the british eight hundred seventy eight men including general rial captured and one gun each side claimed it as a victory over superior numbers the truth is beyond question that the british had the advantage in numbers and a still greater advantage in position while it is equally beyond question that it was a defeat 
and not a victory for the Americans. They left the field and retired in perfect order to Fort Erie, while the British held the field and the next day pursued their foes. Having received some reinforcements, General Drummond, now with about 3,600 men, pushed forward to besiege Fort Erie, in which was the American army, some 2,400 strong, under General Gaines. Colonel Tucker, with 500 British regulars, was sent across the Niagara to destroy the batteries at Black Rock, but was defeated by 300 American regulars under Major Morgan, fighting from behind a strong breastwork of felled trees with a creek in front. On the night of the 15th of August, the British in three columns advanced to storm the American works, but after making a most determined assault were beaten off. The assailants lost 900 men, the assailed about 80. After this nothing was done till September 17th, when General Brown, who had resumed command of the American forces, determined upon and executed a sortie. Each side had received reinforcements. The Americans numbered over 3,000, the British nearly 4,000. The fighting was severe, the Americans losing 500 men, but their opponents lost 600 men, and most of their batteries were destroyed. Each side, as usual, claimed the victory, but exactly as Lundy's Lane must be accounted an American defeat, as our forces retreated from the ground, so this must be considered an American victory, for after it the British broke up camp and drew off to chip away. Nothing more was done, and on November 5th the American army recrossed the Niagara. Though marked by some brilliant feats of arms, this four months' invasion of Canada, like those that had preceded it, thus came to nothing. But at the same time a British invasion of the United States was repulsed far more disgracefully. Sir George Prevost, with an army of 13,000 veteran troops, marched south along the shores of Lake Champlain to Plattsburgh, which was held by General Macomb with 2,000 regulars, and perhaps double that number of nearly worthless militia, a force that the British could have scattered to the winds, though, as they were strongly posted, not without severe loss. But the British fleet was captured by Commodore Macdonough in the fight on the lake, and then Sir George, after some heavy skirmishing between the outposts of the armies in which the Americans had the advantage, fled precipitately back to Canada. All through the war the seacoasts of the United States had been harried by small predatory excursions. A part of what is now the state of Maine was conquered with little resistance, and kept until the close of hostilities, and some of the towns on the shores of Chesapeake Bay had been plundered or burnt. In August 1814, a more serious invasion was planned, and some 5,000 troops, regulars, sailors, and marines were landed under the command of General Ross. So utterly helpless was the Democratic administration at Washington that during the two years of warfare hardly any steps had been taken to protect the capital or the country round about. What little was done was done entirely too late, and bungled badly in addition. History has not yet done justice to the ludicrous and painful folly and stupidity of which the government founded by Jefferson and carried on by Madison was guilty, both in its preparations for and, and its way of carrying on this war. Nor is it yet realized that the men just mentioned and their associates are primarily responsible for the loss we suffered in it, and the bitter humiliation some of its incidents caused us. The small British army marched at will through Virginia and Maryland, burned Washington, and finally retreated from before Baltimore and re-embarked to take part in the expedition against New Orleans. 
twice at Bladensburg and North Point, it came in contact with superior numbers of militia in fairly good position. In each case the result was the same. After some preliminary skirmishing, maneuvering, and volley firing, the British charged with the bayonet. The rawest elements among the American militia then broke at once. The others kept pretty steady, pouring in quite a destructive fire, until the regulars had come up close to them, when they also fled. The British regulars were too heavily loaded to pursue, and, owing to their mode of attack and the rapidity with which their opponents ran away, the loss of the latter was in each case very slight. At North Point, however, the militia, being more experienced, behaved better than at Bladensburg. In neither case were the British put to any trouble to win their victory. The above is a brief sketch of the campaigns of the war. It is not cheerful reading for an American, nor yet of interest to a military student, and its lessons have been taught so often by similar occurrences in other lands under like circumstances, and, moreover, teach such self-evident truths that they scarcely need to be brought to the notice of an historian. But the crowning event of the war was the Battle of New Orleans, remarkable in its military aspect and a source of pride to every American. It is well worth a more careful study, and to it I have devoted the last chapter of this work. Signed, New York City, 1883. Chapter 1. The view professed by Great Britain in 1812 respecting the rights of belligerents and neutrals was diametrically opposite to that held by the United States. Between England and the United States of America, writes a British author, a spirit of animosity caused chiefly by the impressment of British seamen, or of seamen asserted to be such, from on board of American merchant vessels, had unhappily subsisted for a long time prior to the war. It is, we believe, he continues, an acknowledged maxim of public law, as well that no nation but the one he belongs to can release a subject from his natural allegiance, as that provided the jurisdiction of another independent state be not infringed. Every nation has a right to enforce the services of her subjects wherever they may be found. Nor has any neutral nation such a jurisdiction over her merchant vessels upon the high seas as to exclude a belligerent nation from the right of searching them for contraband of war or for the property or persons of her enemies, and if, in the exercise of that right, the belligerent should discover on board of the neutral vessel a subject who has withdrawn himself from his lawful allegiance, the neutral can have no fair ground for refusing to deliver him up, more especially if that subject is proved to be a deserter from the sea or land service of the former. Footnote. The Naval History of Great Britain by William James, volume 4, page 324. New edition by Captain Chaumier, R.N. London, 1837. End of footnote. Great Britain's doctrine was once a subject, always a subject. On the other hand, the United States maintained that any foreigner, after five years' residence, within her territory, and, after having complied with certain forms, became one of her citizens as completely as if he was native-born. Great Britain contended that her warships possessed the right of searching all neutral vessels for the property and persons of her foes. The United States, resisting this claim, asserted that free bottoms made free goods and that consequently her ships, when on the high seas, should not be molested on any pretext whatever. Finally, Great Britain's system of impressment, footnote, the best idea of which can be gained by reading Marriott's novels, 
end of footnote, by which men could be forcibly seized and made to serve in her navy, no matter at what cost to themselves, was repugnant to every American idea. Such wide differences in the views of the two nations produced endless difficulties. To escape the press gang, or for other reasons, many British seamen took service under the American flag, and if they were demanded back, it is not likely that they or their American shipmates had much hesitation in swearing either that they were not British at all, or else that they had been naturalized as Americans. Equally probable is that the American blockade runners were guilty of a great deal of fraud and more or less thinly veiled perjury. But the wrongs done by the Americans were insignificant compared with those they received. Any innocent merchant vessel was liable to seizure at any moment, and when overhauled by a British cruiser short of men was sure to be stripped of most of a crew. The British officers were themselves the judges as to whether a seaman should be pronounced a native of America or of Britain, and there was no appeal from their judgment. If a captain lacked his full complement, there was little doubt as to the view he would take of any man's nationality. The wrongs inflicted on our seafaring countrymen by their impressment into foreign ships formed the main cause of the war. There were still other grievances which are thus presented by the British Admiral Cochrane. Our treatment of its America's citizens was scarcely in accordance with the national privileges to which the young republic had become entitled. There were no doubt many individuals among the American people who, caring little for the federal government, considered it more profitable to break than to keep the laws of nations by aiding and supporting our enemy, France. And it was against such that the efforts of the squadron had chiefly been directed. But the way the object was carried out was scarcely less an infraction of those national laws which we were professedly enforcing. The practice of taking English and American seamen out of American ships without regard to the safety of navigating them, when thus deprived of their hands, has been already mentioned. To this may be added the detention of vessels against which nothing contrary to international neutrality could be established, whereby their cargoes became damaged, the compelling them on suspicion only to proceed to ports other than those to which they were destined, and generally treating them as though they were engaged in contraband trade. American ships were not permitted to quit English ports without giving security for the discharge of their cargoes in some other British or neutral port. On the same subject, James writes, when by the maritime supremacy of England, France could no longer trade for herself, America proffered her services as a neutral to trade for her, and American merchants and their agents in the gains that flowed in soon found a compensation for all the perjury and fraud necessary to cheat the former out of her belligerent rights. The high commercial importance of the United States thus obtained, coupled with a similarity of language and to a superficial observer, a resemblance in person between the natives of America and Great Britain, had caused the former to be the chief, if not the only, sufferers by the exercise of the right of search. Chiefly indebted for their growth and prosperity to emigration from Europe, the United States hold out every allurement to foreigners, particularly to British seamen, whom, by a process peculiarly their own, they can naturalize as quickly as a dollar can exchange masters and a blank form. Ready signed and sworn to can be filled up. Footnote. This is an exaggeration. End of footnote. It is the knowledge of this fact 
that makes British naval officers, when searching for deserters from their service, so harsh in their scrutiny and so sceptical of American oaths and asservations. The last sentence of the foregoing from James is an euphemistic way of saying that whenever a British commander short of men came across an American vessel, he impressed all of her crew that he wanted, whether they were citizens of the United States or not. It must be remembered, however, that the only reason why Great Britain did us more injury than any other power was because she was able to do so. None of her acts were more offensive than Napoleon's Milan decree, by which it was declared that any neutral vessel which permitted itself to be searched by a British cruiser should be considered as British, and as the lawful prize of any French vessel. French frigates and privateers were very apt to snap up any American vessel they came across, and were only withheld at all by the memory of the sharp addressing they had received in the West Indies during the Quasi War of 1799-1800. to What we undoubtedly ought to have done was to have adopted the measure actually proposed in Congress, and declared war on both France and England. As it was, we chose as a foe the one that had done and could still do us the greatest injury. The principles for which the United States contended in 1812 are now universally accepted, and those so tenaciously maintained by Great Britain find no advocates in the civilized world. That England herself was afterward completely reconciled to our views was amply shown by her intense indignation when Commodore Wilkes, in the exercise of the right of search for the persons of the foes of his country, stopped the neutral British ship Trent, while the applause with which the act was greeted in America proves pretty clearly another fact, that we have warred for the right, not because it was the right, but because it agreed with our self-interest to do so. We were contending for free trade and sailors' rights, meaning by the former expression freedom to trade whenever we chose without hindrance from the power with which we were trading, and by the latter that a man who happened to be on the sea should have the same protection accorded to a man who remained on land. Nominally, neither of these questions was settled by or even alluded to in the treaty of peace but the immense increase of reputation that the navy acquired during the war practically decided both points in our favor our sailors had gained too great a name for any one to molest them with impunity again holding views on these maritime subjects so radically different from each other the two nations could not but be continually dealing with causes of quarrel not only did the British cruisers molest our merchantmen, but at length one of them, the fifty-gun ship Leopard, attacked an American frigate, the Chesapeake, when the latter was so lumbered up that she could not return a shot, killed or disabled some twenty of her men, and took away four others, one Briton and three Americans, who were claimed as deserters. For this act an apology was offered, but it failed to restore harmony between the two nations. Soon afterward, another action was fought. The American frigate President Commodore Rogers attacked the British sloop Little Belt, Captain Brigham, and exchanged one or two broadsides with her, the frigate escaping scot-free while the sloop was nearly knocked to pieces. Mutual recriminations followed, each side insisting that the other was the assailant. One Great Britain issued her orders in council forbidding our trading with France. We retaliated by passing an embargo act, which prevented us from trading at all. There could be but one result to such a succession of incidents, and that was war. Accordingly, in June 1812, war was declared, and as a contest for the rights of seamen, it was largely waged 
on the ocean. We also had not a little fighting to do on land, in which, as a rule, we came out second best. Few or no preparations for the war had been made, and the result was such as might have been anticipated. After dragging on through three dreary and uneventful years, it came to an end in 1815 by a peace which left matters in almost precisely the state in which the war had found them. On land and water, the contest took the form of a succession of petty actions, in which the glory acquired by the victor seldom eclipsed the disgrace incurred by the vanquished. Neither side succeeded in doing what it intended. Americans declared that Canada must and should be conquered, but the conquering came quite as near being the other way. British writers insisted that the American navy should be swept from the sea, and during the sweeping process it increased fourfold. When the United States declared war, Great Britain was straining every nerve and muscle in a death struggle with the most formidable military despotism of modern times, and was obliged to entrust the defense of her Canadian colonies to a mere handful of regulars, aided by the local fencibles. But the Congress had provided even fewer trained soldiers and relied on militia. The latter chiefly exercised their fighting abilities upon one another in dueling, and as a rule were afflicted with conscientious scruples whenever it was necessary to cross the frontier and attack the enemy. Accordingly, the campaign opened with the bloodless surrender of an American general to a much inferior British force, and the war continued much as it had begun. We suffered disgrace after disgrace, while the losses we inflicted in turn on Great Britain were so slight as hardly to attract her attention. At last, having crushed her greater foe, she turned to crush the lesser, and in her turn suffered ignominious defeat. By this time events had gradually developed a small number of soldiers on our northern frontier who, commanded by Scott and Brown, were able to contend on equal terms with the veteran troops to whom they were opposed, though these formed part of what was then undoubtedly the most formidable fighting infantry any European nation possessed. The battles at this period of the struggle were remarkable for the skill and stubborn courage with which they were waged, as well as for the heavy loss involved but the number of combatants was so small that, in Europe, they would have been regarded as mere outpost skirmishes, and they wholly failed to attract any attention abroad in that period of colossal armies. When Great Britain seriously turned her attention to her transatlantic foe, and assembled in Canada an army of 14,000 men at the head of Lake Champlain, Congressional forethought enabled it to be opposed by soldiers who, it is true, were as well disciplined, as hardy, and as well commanded as any in the world, but who were only a few hundred strong, backed by more or less incompetent militia. Only Macdonough's skill and Sir George Prevost's incapacity saved us from a serious disaster. The sea fight reflected high honor on our seamen, but the retreat of British land forces was due to their commander and not their antagonists. Meanwhile, a large British fleet in the Chesapeake had not achieved much glory by the destruction of the local oyster boats and the burning of a few farmers' houses, so an army was landed to strike a decisive blow. At Bladensburg, footnote, see the capture of Washington, by Edward D. Ingram, Philadelphia, 1849, end of footnote. The 5,000 British regulars, utterly worn out by heat and fatigue, by their mere appearance, frightened into a panic, double their number of American militia well posted. But the only success attained was burning the public buildings of Washington, 
and that result was of dubious value. Baltimore was attacked next, and the attack repulsed after the forts and ships had shelled one another with the slight results that usually attend that spectacular and harmless species of war. The close of the contest was marked by the extraordinary battle of New Orleans. It was a perfectly useless shedding of blood, since peace had already been declared. There is hardly another contest of modern times where the defeated side suffered such frightful carnage, while the victors came off almost scatheless. It is quite in accordance with the rest of the war that the militia, hitherto worse than useless, should on this occasion win against great odds in point of numbers, and moreover that their splendid victory should have been of little consequence in its effects upon the result. On the whole the contest by land, where we certainly ought to have been successful, reflected greater credit on our antagonists than upon us, in spite of the services of Scott, Brown, and Jackson. Our small force of regulars and volunteers did excellently. As for the militia, New Orleans proved that they could fight superbly, and the other battles that they generally would not fight at all. At sea, as will appear, the circumstances were widely different. Here we possessed a small but highly effective force, the ships well built, manned by thoroughly trained men, and commanded by able and experienced officers. The deeds of our navy form a part of history over which any American can be pardoned for lingering. Such was the origin, issue, and general character of the war. It may now be well to proceed to a comparison of the authorities on the subject. Allusion has already been made to them in the preface, but a fuller reference seems to be necessary in this connection. At the close of the contest, the large majority of historians who wrote of it were so bitterly rancorous that their statements must be received with caution. For the main facts, I have relied, wherever it was practicable, upon the official letters of the commanding officers, taking each as authority for his own force and loss. Footnote. As where Broke states his own force at 330, his antagonists at 440, and the American Court of Inquiry makes the numbers 396 and 379. I have taken them as being 330 and 379, respectively. This is the only just method. I take it for granted that each commander meant to tell the truth, and of course knew his own force, while he might very naturally, and in perfect good faith, exaggerate his antagonists. End of footnote. For all the British victories we have British official letters, which tally almost exactly, as regards matters of fact and not of opinion, with the corresponding American accounts. For the first year the British also published official accounts of their defeats, which in the cases of Gourier, Macedonian, and Frolic I have followed as closely as the accounts of the American victors. The last British official letter published announcing a defeat was that in the case of the Java, and it is the only letter that I have not strictly accepted. The fact that no more were published thereafter is of itself unfortunate, and from the various contradictions it contains, it would appear to have been tampered with. The surgeon's report accompanying it is certainly false. Subsequent to 1812, no letter of a defeated British commander was published, footnote, except about the battles on the lake, where I have accordingly given the same credit to the accounts both of the British and of the Americans, end of footnote. And I have to depend upon the various British historians, especially James, of whom more anon. End of part one.
Part two of The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. The American and British historians, from whom we are thus at times forced to draw our material, regard the war from very different standpoints, and their accounts generally differ. Each writer naturally so colored the affair as to have it appear favorable to his own side. Sometimes this was done intentionally, and sometimes not. Not unfrequently, errors are made against the historian's own side, as when the British author Brenton says that the British brig Peacock mounted thirty-twos instead of twenty-fours, while Lossing in his field book of the War of 1812 makes the same mistake about the armament of the American brig Argus. Errors of this description are, of course, as carefully to be guarded against as any others. Mere hearsay reports such as, it has been said, a prisoner on board the opposing fleet has observed, an American or British newspaper of such and such a date has remarked, are, of course, to be rejected. There is a curious parallelism in the errors on both sides. For example, the American Mr. Lowe, writing in 1813, tells how the Constitution, 44, captured the Guerre of 49 guns, while the British Lieutenant Lowe, writing in 1880, tells how the Pelican, 18, captured the Argus of 20 guns. Each records the truth, but not the whole truth, for although rating 44 and 18, the victors carried respectively 54 and 21, of heavier metal than those of their antagonists. Such errors are generally intentional. Similarly, most American writers mention the actions in which the privateers were victorious, but do not mention those in which they were defeated while the British in turn record every successful cutting-out expedition, but ignore entirely those which terminated unfavorably. Other errors arise from honest ignorance. Thus, James, in speaking of the repulse of the Endymion's boats by the Neufchatel, gives the latter a crew of 120 men. She had more than this number originally, but only 40 were in her at the time of the attack. So also when the captain of the Pelican writes that the officers of the Argus report her loss at forty, when they really reported it at twenty-four, or when Captain Dacres thought the Constitution had lost about twenty men instead of fourteen. The American gunboat captains, in recounting their engagements with the British frigates, invariably greatly overestimated the loss of the latter, so that on both sides there were some intentional misstatements or garblings, and a much more numerous class of simple blunders arising largely from an incapacity for seeing more than one side of the question. Among the early British writers upon this war, the ablest was James. He devoted one work, his naval occurrences, entirely to it, and it occupies the largest part of the sixth volume of his more extensive History of the British Navy. Footnote. A new edition, London, 1826. End of footnote. Two other British writers, Lieutenant Marshall, footnote, Royal Naval Biography by John Marshall, London, 1823 to 1835. End of footnote. And Captain Brenton, footnote, Naval History of Great Britain, by Edward Pelham Brenton, New Edition, London, 1837, end of footnote, wrote histories of the same events about the same time, but neither of these naval officers produced half as valuable a work as did the civilian James. Marshall wrote a dozen volumes, each filled with several scores of dreary panegyrics or memoirs of as many different officers. There is no attempt at order, hardly anything about the ships, guns, or composition of the crews, 
and not even the pretense of giving both sides the object being to make every englishman appear in his best light the work is analogous to the numerous lives of decatur brainbridge porter etc that appeared in the united states about the same time and is quite as untrustworthy brenton made a far better and very interesting book written on a good and well-connected plan and apparently with a sincere desire to tell the truth he accepts the british official accounts as needing nothing whatever to supplement them precisely as cooper accepts the american officials a more serious fault is his inability to be accurate that this inaccuracy is not intentional is proved by the fact that it tells as often against his own side as against his opponent he says for example that the guns of perry's and barclay's squadrons were about equal in number and weight that the peacock british was armed with thirty twos instead of twenty fours and underestimates the force of the second wasp but the blunders are quite as bad when distributed as when confined to one side in addition brenton's disregard of all details makes him of but little use james as already said is by far the most valuable authority on the war as regards purely british affairs he enters minutely into details and has evidently laboriously hunted up his authorities he has examined the ship's logs the admiralty reports various treatises all the gazette reports gives very well chosen extracts has arranged his work in chronological order discriminates between the officers that deserve praise and those that deserve blame and in fact writes a book which ought to be consulted by every student of naval affairs but he is unfortunately afflicted with a hatred toward the americans that amounts to a monomania he wishes to make out as strong a case as possible against them the animus of his work may be gathered from the not over complimentary account of the education of the youthful seafaring americans which can be found in volume six page one thirteen of his history on page one fifty three he asserts that he is an impartial historian and about three lines before mentions that it may suit the americans to invent any falsehood no matter how barefaced to foist a valiant character on themselves on page four nineteen he says that captain porter is to be believed so far as is borne out by proof the only safe way where an american is concerned which somewhat sweeping denunciation of the veracity of all of captain porter's compatriots would seem to indicate that james was not perhaps in that dispassionate frame of mind best suited for writing history that he should be biased against individual captains can be understood but when he makes rabid onslaughts upon the american people as a whole he renders it difficult for an american at any rate to put implicit credence in him his statements are all the harder to confute when they are erroneous because they are intentionally so it is not as with brenton and marshall because he really thinks a british captain cannot be beaten except by some kind of distorted special providence for no man says worse things than he does about certain officers and crews a writer of james's undoubted ability must have known perfectly well that his statements were untrue in many instances as where he garbles hilaire's account of porter's loss or misstates the comparative force of the fleets on lake champlain when he says page one ninety four that captain bainbridge wished to run away from the java and would have done so if he had not been withheld by the advice of his first lieutenant who was a renegade englishman footnote who by the way was mr parker born in virginia and never in england in his life 
it is not of much consequence whether his making the statement was due to excessive credulity or petty meanness for in either case whether the defect was in his mind or his morals it is enough to greatly impair the value of his other facts again when james page one sixty five states that decatur ran away from the macedonian until by some marvellous optical delusion he mistook her for a thirty two he merely detracts a good deal from the worth of his own account when the americans adopt boarding helmets he considered it as proving conclusively that they are suffering from an acute attack of cowardice on page one twenty two he says that had the president when she fell in with the belvedera been cruising alone commodore rogers would have magnified the british frigate into a line of battleship and had done his utmost to avoid her which gives an excellent idea of the weight to be attached to the various other anecdotes he relates of the much abused commodore rogers but it must always be remembered that untrustworthy as james is in anything referring purely to the americans he is no worse than his compeers of both nationalities the misstatements of niles in his weekly register about the british are quite as flagrant and his information about his own side even more valuable footnote in niles by the way can be found excellent examples of the traditional american spread eagle style in one place i remember his describing the immortal rogers balked of his natural prey the british as soaring about like the bold bald eagle of his native land seeking whom he might devour the accounts he gives of british line of battleships fleeing from american forty fours quite match james's anecdotes of the latter's avoidance of british thirty eights and thirty sixes for fear they might mount twenty four pounders the two works taken together give a very good idea of the war separately either is utterly unreliable especially in matters of opinion End of footnote. every little american author crowed about perry's nelsonic victory over a greatly superior force the constitution was declared to have been at a disadvantage when she fought the guerriere and so on ad infinitum but these writers have all faded into oblivion and their writings are not even referred to much less believed james on the contrary has passed through edition after edition is considered an unquestionable authority in his own country and largely throughout europe and has furnished the basis for every subsequent account by british authors from allison to lieutenant low almost every english work whether of popular character or not is in so far as it touches on the war simply a rehash of the works written by james the consequence is that the british and american accounts have astonishingly little resemblance one ascribes the capture of british frigates simply to the fact that their opponents were cut down line of battleships the other gives all the glory to the undaunted heroism etc of the yankee sailors one not very creditable trait of the early american naval historians gave their rivals a great advantage the object of the former was to make out that the constitution for example won her victories against an equal foe and an exact statement of the forces showed the contrary so they always avoided figures and thus left the ground clear for james's careful misstatements even when they criticized him they never went into details confining themselves to some remark about hurling his figures in his face with loathing even cooper interesting though his work is has gone far less into figures than he should and seems to have paid little if any attention to the british official statements which of course should be received as of equal weight with the american his comments on the action are generally very fair 
the book never being disfigured by bitterness toward the British. But he is certainly wrong, for example, in ascribing the loss of the Chesapeake solely to accident, that of the Argus solely to her inferiority in force, and so on. His disposition to praise all the American commanders may be generous, but is nevertheless unjust. If Decatur's surrender of the President is at least impliedly praised, then Porter's defense of the Essex can hardly receive its just award. There is no weight in the commendation bestowed upon Hull, if commendation, the same in kind though less in degree, is bestowed upon Rogers. It is a great pity that Cooper did not write a criticism on James, for no one could have done it more thoroughly. But he never mentions him, except once in speaking of Barclay's fleet. In all probability this silence arose from sheer contempt, and the certainty that most of James's remarks were false. But the effect was that very many foreigners believe him to have shirked the subject. He rarely gives any data by which the statements of James can be disproved, and it is for this reason that I have been obliged to criticize the latter's work very fully. Many of James's remarks, however, defy criticism from their random nature, as when he states that American midshipmen were chiefly masters and mates of merchantmen, and does not give a single proof to support the assertion. It would be nearly as true to assert that the British midshipmen were, for the most part, ex-members of the prize ring, and as much labor would be needed to disprove it. In other instances, it is quite enough to let his words speak for themselves, as where he says, page 155, that of the American sailors, one-third in number and one-half in point of effectiveness, were in reality British that is, of the 450 men the Constitution had when she fought the Java, 150 were British, and the remaining 300 could have been as effectively replaced by 150 more British. So, a very little logic works out a result that James certainly did not intend to arrive at, namely that 300 British led by American officers could beat with ease and comparative impunity four hundred British led by their own officers. He also forgets that the whole consists of the sum of the parts. He accounts for the victories of the Americans by stating, page 280, that they were lucky enough to meet with frigates and brigs who had unskillful gunners or worthless crews. He also carefully shows that the Macedonian was incompetently handled the peacock commanded by a mere martinet the avon's crew unpractised weak and unskilful the java's exceedingly poor and more to the same effect now the americans took in single fight three frigates and seven sloops and when as many as ten vessels are met it is exceedingly probable that they represent the fair average so that James's strictures, so far as true, simply show that the average British ship was very apt to possess, comparatively speaking, an incompetent captain or unskilful crew. These disadvantages were not felt when opposed to navies in which they existed to an even greater extent, but became very apparent when brought into contact with a power whose few officers knew how to play their own parts very nearly to perfection and something equally important, knew how to make first-rate crews out of what was already good raw material. Finally, a large proportion of James's abuse of the Americans sufficiently refutes itself, and perhaps Cooper's method of contemptuously disregarding him was the best. But no harm can follow from devoting a little space to commenting upon him. Much the best American work is Lieutenant George E. Emmons's Statistical History of the United States Navy. Unfortunately, it is merely a mass of excellently arranged and classified statistics, and while of invaluable importance to the student, is not interesting to the average reader. 
almost all the statements i have made of the force tonnage and armament of the american vessels though i have whenever practicable taken them from the navy records etc yet could be just as well quoted from emmons copies of most of the american official letters which i have quoted can be found in niles register volumes one to ten and all of the british ones in the london naval chronicle for the same years it is to these two authorities that i am most indebted and nearly as much to the american state papers volume fourteen next in order comes emmons cooper and the invaluable albeit somewhat scurrilous james and a great many others whose names i have quoted in their proper places in commenting upon actions i have whenever possible drawn from some standard work such as urien de la grevier's guerre maritime lord howard douglas's naval gunnery or better still from the lives and memoirs of admirals farragut codrington broke or durham the titles of the various works will be found given in full as they are referred to footnote to get an idea of the american seamen at that time cooper's novels miles wallingford home as found and the pilot are far better than any history in the two admirals the description of the fleet manoeuvring is unrivalled his view of jack's life is rather rose-coloured however tom cringe's log ought to be read for the information it gives mariotte's novels will show some of the darker aspects of sailor life and a footnote in a few cases where extreme accuracy was necessary or where as in the case of the president's capture it was desirable that there should be no room for dispute as to the facts i have given the authority for each sentence but in general this would be too cumbersome and so i have confined myself to referring at or near the beginning of the account of each action to the authorities from whom i have taken it for the less important facts on which every one is agreed i have often given no references chapter two during the early years of this century england's naval power stood at a height never reached before or since by that of any other nation on every sea her navies rode not only triumphant but with none to dispute their sway the island folk had long claimed the mastery of the ocean and they had certainly succeeded in making their claim completely good during the time of bloody warfare that followed the breaking out of the french revolution since the year seventeen ninety two each european nation in turn had learned to feel bitter dread of the weight of england's hand in the baltic sir samuel hood had taught the russians that they must needs keep in port when the english cruisers were in the offing the descendants of the vikings had seen their whole navy destroyed at copenhagen no dutch fleet ever put out after the day when off camperdown lord duncan took possession of de winter's shattered ships but a few years before eighteen twelve the greatest sea-fighter of all time had died in trafalgar bay and in dying had crumbled to pieces the navies of france and of spain from that day england's task was but to keep in port such of her foes vessels as she had not destroyed france alone still possessed fleets that could be rendered formidable and so from the schelkt to toulon her harbors were watched and her coasts harried by the blockading squadrons of the english elsewhere the latter had no fear of their power being seriously assailed but their vast commerce and numerous colonies needed ceaseless protection accordingly in every sea their cruisers could be found of all sizes from the stately ship of the line their tiers of heavy cannon and her many hundreds of men down to the little cutter carrying but a score of souls and a couple of light guns 
all these cruisers but especially those of the lesser rates were continually brought into contact with such of the hostile vessels as had run through the blockade or were too small to be affected by it french and italian frigates were often fought and captured when they were skirting their own coasts or had started off on a plundering cruise through the atlantic or to the indian ocean and though the danes had lost their larger ships they kept up a spirited warfare with brigs and gunboats so the english marine was in constant exercise attended with almost invariable success such was great britain's naval power when the congress of the united states declared war upon her while she could number her thousand sail the american navy included but half a dozen frigates and six or eight sloops and brigs and it is small matter for the surprise that the british officers should have regarded their new foe with contemptuous indifference hitherto the american seamen had never been heard of except in connection with two or three engagements with french frigates and some obscure skirmishes against the moors of tripoli none of which could possibly attract attention in the years that saw Abukur, copenhagen and trafalgar and yet these same petty wars were the schools which raised our marine to the highest standard of excellence a continuous course of victory won mainly by seamanship had made the english sailor overweeningly self-confident and caused him to pay but little regard to manoeuvring or even to gunnery meanwhile the american learned by receiving hard knocks how to give them and belonged to a service too young to feel an overconfidence in itself one side had let its training relax while the other had carried it to the highest possible point hence our ships proved on the whole victorious in the apparently unequal struggle and the men who had conquered the best seamen of europe were now in turn obliged to succumb compared with the great naval battles of the preceding few years our bloodiest conflicts were mere skirmishes but they were skirmishes between the hitherto acknowledged kings of the ocean and new men who yet proved to be more than their equals for over a hundred years or since the time when they had contended on equal terms with the great dutch admirals the british had shown a decided superiority to their various foes and during the latter quarter of the time this superiority as already said was very marked indeed in consequence the victories of the new enemy attracted an amount of attention altogether disproportionate to their material effects and it is a curious fact that our little navy in which the art of handling and fighting the old broadside sailing frigate in single conflict was brought to the highest point of perfection ever reached that this same navy should have contained the first representative of the modern war steamer and also the torpedo the two terrible engines which were to drive from the ocean the very white-winged craft that had first won honor for the starry flag the tactical skill of hull or decatur is now of merely archaic interest and has but little more bearing on the manoeuvring of a modern fleet than have the tactics of the athenian galleys but the, the war still conveys some most practical lessons as to the value of efficient ships and above all of efficient men in them had we only possessed the miserable gunboats our men could have done nothing had we not possessed good men the heavy frigates would have availed as little poor ships and impotent artillery had lost the dutch almost their entire navy fine ships and heavy cannon had not saved the french and spanish from the like fate 
we owed our success to putting sailors even better than the dutch on ships even finer than those built by the two latin seaboard powers the first point to be remembered in order to write a fair account of this war is that the difference in fighting skill which certainly existed between the two parties was due mainly to training and not to the nature of the men it seems certain that the american had in the beginning somewhat the advantage because his surroundings partly physical and partly social and political had forced him into habits of greater self-reliance therefore on the average he offered rather the best material to start with but the difference was very slight and totally disappeared under good training the combatants were men of the same race differing but little from one another on the new england coast the english blood was as pure as in any part of britain in new york and new jersey it was mixed with that of the dutch settlers and the dutch are by race nearer to the true old english of alfred and harold than are for example the thoroughly anglicized welsh of cornwall otherwise the infusion of new blood into the english race on this side of the atlantic has been chiefly from three sources german irish and norse and these three sources represent the elemental parts of the composite english stock in about the same proportion in which they were originally combined mainly teutonic largely celtic and with a scandinavian admixture the descendant of the german becomes as much an anglo-american as the descendant of the strathclyde celt has already become an anglo-briton looking through names of the combatants it would be difficult to find any of one navy that could not be matched in the other hull or lawrence allen perry or stuart and among all the english names on both sides will be found many scotch irish or welsh macdonough o'brien or jones still stranger ones appear the huguenot tatnall is one among the american defenders of the constellation and another huguenot tatnall is among the british assailants at lake bourne it must always be kept in mind that the americans and the british are two substantially similar branches of the greater english race which both before and after their separation have assimilated and made englishmen of many other peoples Footnote. the inhabitants of great britain are best designated as british english being either too narrow or too broad a term in one case meaning the inhabitants of but a part of britain and in the other the whole anglo-saxon people and a footnote the lessons taught by the war can hardly be learned unless this identity is kept in mind footnote it was practically a civil war and was waged with much harshness and bitterness on both sides i have already spoken of the numerous grievances of the americans the british in turn looked upon our blockade runners which entered the french ports exactly as we regarded at a later date the british steamers that ran into wilmington and charleston it is curious to see how illogical writers are the careers of the argus and alabama for example were strikingly similar in many ways yet the same writer who speaks of one as an heroic little brig will call the other a black pirate of course there can be no possible comparison as to the causes for which the two vessels were fighting but the cruises themselves were very much alike both in character and history End of footnote. to understand right the efficiency of our navy it is necessary to take a brief look at the character and antecedents of the officers and men who served in it when war broke out the united states navy was but a few years old yet it had already had a far from dishonorable history the captains and lieutenants of eighteen twelve had been taught their duties in a very practical school and the flag under which they fought was endeared to them already by not a few glorious traditions 
though these, perhaps like others of their kind, had lost none of their glory in the telling. A few of the older men had served in the War of the Revolution, and all still kept fresh in mind the doughty deeds of the old-time privateering warcraft. Men still talked of Biddle's daring cruises and Barney's stubborn fights, or told of Scotch Paul and the grim work they had who followed his fortunes. Besides these memories of an older generation, most of the officers had themselves taken part, when younger in years and rank, in deeds not a whit less glorious. Almost every man had had a share in some gallant feat to which he, in part at least, owed his present position. The captain had perhaps been a midshipman aboard Truxton when he took the vengeance, and had been sent aboard the captured French frigate with the prize-master. The lieutenant had borne a part in the various attacks on Tripoli, and had led his men in the desperate hand-to-hand -hand fights in which the Yankee cutlass proved an overmatch for the Turkish and Moorish scimitars. Nearly every senior officer had extricated himself by his own prowess or skill from the dangers of battle or storm. Yoda's rank to the fact that he had proved worthy of it. Thrown upon his own resources, he had learned self-reliance. He was a first-rate practical seaman, and prided himself on the way his vessel was handled. Having reached his rank by hard work and knowing what real fighting meant, he was careful to see that his men were trained in the essentials of discipline, and that they knew how to handle the guns in battle as well as polish them in peace. Beyond almost any of his countrymen, he worshipped the gridiron flag, and having been brought up in the navy, regarded its honour as his own. It was perhaps the navy alone that thought itself a match ship against ship for Great Britain. The remainder of the nation pinned its faith to the army, or rather to that weakest of weak reeds, the militia. The officers of the navy, with their strong esprit de corps, their jealousy of their own name and record, and the knowledge by actual experience that the British ships sailed no faster and were no better handled than their own, had no desire to shirk a conflict with any foe, and having tried their bravery in actual service, they made it doubly formidable by cool, wary skill. Even the younger men, who had never been in action, had been so well trained by the tried veterans over them that the lack of experience was not sensibly felt. The sailors comprising the crews of our ships were well worthy of their leaders. There were no better seamen in the world than American Jack. He had been bred to his own work from infancy, and had been off in a fishing dory almost as soon as he could walk. When he grew older he shipped on a merchantman or whaler, and in those warlike times when our large merchant marine was compelled to rely pretty much on itself for protection, each craft had to be well handled. All who were not were soon weeded out by a process of natural selection, of which the agents were French picaroons, Spanish buccaneers, and Malay pirates. It was a rough school, but it taught Jack to be both skilful and self-reliant, and he was all the better fitted to become a man-of-war's man, because he knew more about firearms than most of his kind in foreign lands. At home he had used his ponderous ducking-gun with good effect on the flocks of canvas-backs in the reedy flats of the Chesapeake, or among the sea-coots in the rough water off the New England cliffs and when he went on a sailing voyage the chances were even that there would be some use of the long guns before he returned for the american merchant sailor could trust to no armed escort the wonderful effectiveness of our seamen at the date of which i am writing as well as long subsequently to it was largely due to the curious condition of things in europe 
for thirty years all the european nations had been in a state of continuous and very complicated warfare during the course of which each nation in turn fought almost every other england being usually at loggerheads with all one effect of this was to force an enormous proportion of the carrying trade of the world into american bottoms the old massachusetts town of salem was then one of the main depots of the east india trade the baltimore clippers carried goods into the french and german ports with small regard to the blockade new bedford and sag harbor fitted out whalers for the arctic sea as well as for the south pacific the rich merchants of philadelphia and new york sent their ships to all parts of the world and every small port had some craft in the coasting trade on the new england seaboard but few of the boys would reach manhood without having made at least one voyage to the newfoundland banks after codfish and in the whaling towns of long island it used to be an old saying that no man could marry till he struck his whale the wealthy merchants of the large cities would often send their sons on a voyage or two before they let them enter their counting houses thus it came about that a large portion of our population was engaged in seafaring pursuits of a nature strongly tending to develop a resolute and hardy character in the men that followed them the british merchantmen sailed in huge convoys guarded by men of war while as said before our vessels went alone and relied for protection on themselves if a fishing smack went to the banks it knew that it ran a chance of falling in with some not over scrupulous nova scotian privateer the barks that sailed from salem to the spice islands kept their men well trained both at great guns and musketry so as to be able to beat off either malay proas or chinese junks the new york ships loaded for the west indies were prepared to do battle with the picaroons that swarmed in the spanish main while the fast craft from baltimore could fight as well as they could run wherever an american seaman went he not only had to contend with all the legitimate perils of the sea but he had also to regard almost every stranger as a foe whether this foe called himself pirate or privateer mattered but little french spaniards algerines malays from all alike our commerce suffered and against all our merchants were forced to defend themselves the effect of such a state of things which made commerce so remunerative that the bolder spirits could hardly keep out of it and so hazardous that only the most skilful and daring could succeed in it was to raise up as fine a set of seamen as ever manned a navy the stern school in which the american was brought up forced him into habits of independent thought and action which it was impossible that the more protective britain could possess he worked more intelligently and less from routine and while perfectly obedient and amenable to discipline was yet able to judge for himself in an emergency he was more easily managed than most of his kind being shrewd quiet and in fact comparatively speaking rather moral than otherwise if he was a new englander when he retired from a sea life he was not unapt to end his days as a deacon although there could not have been better material for a fighting grew than cool gritty american jack moreover there was a good nucleus of veterans to begin with who were well fitted to fill the more responsible positions such as captains of guns etc these were men who had cruised in the little enterprise after french privateers who had been in the constellation in her two victorious fights or who perhaps had followed decatur when with only eighty men he cut out the philadelphia manned by fivefold his force 
and surrounded by hostile batteries and war vessels one of the boldest expeditions of the kind on record it is to be noted furthermore in this connection that by a singular turn of fortune great britain whose system of impressing american sailors had been one of the chief causes of the war herself became in consequence of that very system in some sort a nursery for the seamen of the young republican navy the american sailor feared nothing more than being impressed on a british ship dreading beyond measure the hard life and cruel discipline aboard of her but once there he usually did well enough and in course of time often rose to be of some little consequence for years before eighteen twelve the number of these impressed sailors was in reality greater than the entire number serving in the american navy from which it will readily be seen that they formed a good stock to draw upon very much to their credit they never lost their devotion to the home of their birth more than two thousand of them being imprisoned at the beginning of the war because they refused to serve against their country when commodore decatur captured the macedonian that officer as we learned from marshall's naval biography volume two page ten nineteen stated that most of the seamen of his own frigate the united states had served in british war vessels and that some had been with lord nelson in the victory and had even been bargemen to the great admiral a pretty sure proof that the american sailors did not show a disadvantage when compared with others footnote with perfect gravity james and his followers assume decatur's statement to be equivalent to saying that he had chiefly british seamen on board whereas even as quoted by marshall decatur merely said that his seamen had served on board a british man-of-war and that some had served under lord nelson like the constitution the united states had rid herself of most of the british subjects on board before sailing decatur's remark simply referred to the number of his american seamen who had been impressed on board british ships whenever james says that an american ship had a large proportion of british sailors aboard the explanation is that a large number of the crew were americans who had been impressed on british ships it would be no more absurd to claim trafalgar as an american victory because there was a certain number of americans in nelson's fleet than it is to assert that the americans were victorious in eighteen twelve because there were a few renegade british on board their ships good seamen as the impressed american proved to be yet he seldom missed an opportunity to escape from the british service by desertion or otherwise in the first place the life was very hard and in the second the american seaman was very patriotic he had an honest and deep affection for his own flag while on the contrary he felt a curiously strong hatred for england as distinguished from englishmen this hatred was partly an abstract feeling cherished through a vague traditional respect for bunker hill and partly something very real and vivid owing to the injuries he and others like him had received whether he lived in maryland or massachusetts he certainly knew men whose ships had been seized by british cruisers their goods confiscated and the vessels condemned some of his friends had fallen victims to the odious right of search and had never been heard of afterward he had suffered many an injury to friend fortune or person and some day he hoped to repay them all and when the war did come he fought all the better because he knew it was in his own quarrel but as i have said this hatred was against england not against englishmen then as now sailors were scattered about over the world without any great regard for nationality and the resulting intermingling of natives and foreigners 
in every mercantile marine was especially great in those of britain and america whose people spoke the same tongue and wore the same aspect when chance drifted the american into liverpool or london he was ready enough to ship in an indiaman or whaler caring little for the fact that he served under the british flag and the briton in turn who found himself in new york or philadelphia willingly sailed in one of the clipper-built barks whether it floated the stars and stripes or not when captain porter wrought such havoc among the british whalers in the south seas he found that no inconsiderable portion of their crews consisted of americans some of whom enlisted on board his own vessel and among the crews of the american whalers were many british in fact though the skipper of each ship might brag loudly of his nationality yet in practical life he knew well enough that there was very little to choose between a yankee and a briton footnote what choice was there was in favour of the american in point of courage there was no difference whatever the essex and the lawrence as well as the frolic and the reindeer were defended with the same stubborn desperate cool bravery that marks the english race on both sides of the atlantic but the american was a free citizen any one's equal a voter with a personal interest in his country's welfare and above all without having perpetually before his eyes the degrading fear of the press gang in consequence he was more tractable than the englishman more self-reliant and possessed greater judgment in the fight between the wasp and the frolic the latter's crew had apparently been well trained at the guns for they aimed well but they fired at the wrong time and never corrected the error while their antagonists delivering their broadsides far more slowly by intelligently waiting until the proper moment worked frightful havoc but though there was a certain slight difference between the seamen of the two nations it must never be forgotten that it was very much less than that between the various individuals of the same nation and when the british had been trained for a few years by such commanders as broke and manners it was impossible to surpass them and it needed our best men to equal them End of footnote. both were bold and hardy cool and intelligent quick with their hands and showing at their best in an emergency they looked alike and spoke alike when they took the trouble to think they thought alike and when they got drunk which was not an infrequent occurrence they quarrelled alike mingled with them were a few seamen of other nationalities the irishman if he came from the old dano-irish towns of waterford dublin and wexford or from the ulster coast was very much like the two chief combatants the celto turanian kern of the west did not often appear on shipboard the french danes and dutch were hemmed in at home they had enough to do on their own seaboard and could not send men into foreign fleets a few noors however did come in and excellent sailors and fighters they made with the portuguese and italians of whom some were to be found serving under the union jack and others under the stars and stripes it was different although there were many excellent exceptions they did not as a rule make the best of seamen they were treacherous fond of the knife less ready with their hands and likely to lose either their wits or their courage when in a tight place in the american navy unlike the british there was no impressment the sailor was a volunteer and he shipped in whatever craft his fancy selected throughout the war there were no picked crews on the american side footnote james's statements to the contrary being in every case utterly without foundation he is also wrong in his assertion that the american ships had no boys they had nearly as many in proportion as the british the constitution had thirty-one the adams fifteen etc 
so when he states that our midshipmen were generally masters and mates of merchantmen they were generally from eleven to seventeen years old at the beginning of the war and besides had rarely or never been in the merchant marine End of footnote. excepting on the last two cruises of the constitution in fact as seen by the letter of captain stewart and bainbridge to secretary hamilton there was often much difficulty in getting enough men footnote reading through the volumes of official letters about this war which are preserved in the office of the secretary of the navy one of the most noticeable things is the continual complaints about the difficulty of getting men the adams at one time had a crew of but nineteen men fourteen of whom are marines adds the aggrieved commander a log-book of one of the gunboats records the fact that after much difficulty two men were enlisted from the jail with a parenthetical memorandum to the effect that they were both very drunk british ships were much more easily manned as they could always have recourse to impressment the constitution on starting out her last cruises had an extraordinary number of able seamen aboard that is two hundred eighteen with but ninety-two ordinary seamen twelve boys and forty-four marines making with the officers a total of four hundred forty men parenthesis see letter of captain bainbridge october sixteenth eighteen fourteen it is letter number fifty one in the fortieth volume of captain's letters in the clerk's office of the secretary of the navy close parenthesis and footnote many sailors preferred to serve in the innumerable privateers and the two above mentioned officers in urging the necessity of building line of battleships state that it was hard work to recruit men for vessels of an inferior grade so long as the enemy had ships of the line one of the standard statements made by the british historians about this war is that our ships were mainly or largely manned by british sailors this if true would not interfere with the lessons which it teaches and besides that it is not true in this as in everything else all the modern writers have merely followed james or brenton and i shall accordingly confine myself to examining their assertions the former begins volume four page four hundred seventy by diffidently stating that there is a similarity of language between the inhabitants of the two countries an interesting philological discovery that but few will attempt to convert in volume six page one fifty four he mentions that a number of blanks occur in the american navy list in the column where born and in proof of the fact that these blanks are there because the men were not americans he says that their names are all english and irish footnote for example james writes out of the thirty-two captains one only thomas tingey had england marked as his birthplace three blanks occur and we consider it rather creditable to captains john shaw daniel s patterson and john ord creighton that they were ashamed to tell where they were born End of quotation. i have not been able to find out the latter's birthplace but but captain shaw was born in new york and i have seen captain patterson incidentally alluded to as born and bred in america generally whenever i have been able to fill up the vacancies in the column where born i have found that it was in america from these facts it would appear that james was somewhat hasty in concluding that the omission of the birthplace proved the owner of the name to be a native of great britain and of footnote they certainly were and so are all the other names in the list it could not well be otherwise as the united states navy was not officered by indians in looking over this same navy list of eighteen sixteen it will be seen that 
but a little over five per cent of the officers were born abroad a smaller proportion by far than would exist in the population of the country at large and most of these had come to america when under ten years of age on page one fifty five james adds that the british sailors composed one-third in number and one-half in point of effectiveness of the american crews brenton in his naval history writes it was said and i have no reason to doubt the fact that there were two hundred british seamen aboard the constitution footnote new edition london eighteen thirty seven volume two page four fifty six end of footnote end of part two part three of the naval war of eighteen twelve by theodore roosevelt this librivox recording is in the public domain part three these statements are mere assertions unsupported by proof and of such a loose character as to be difficult to refute as our navy was small it may be best to take each ship in turn the only ones of which the british could write authoritatively were of course those which they captured the first one taken was the wasp james says many british were discovered among her crew instancing especially one sailor named jack lang now jack lang was born in the town of brunswick new jersey but had been impressed and forced to serve in the british navy the same was doubtless true of the rest of the many british seamen of her crew at any rate as the only instance james mentions jack lang was an american he can hardly be trusted for those whom he does not name of the ninety-five men composing the crew of the nautilus when she was captured six were detained and sent to england to await examination as being suspected of being british subjects footnote quoted from letter of commodore rogers of september twelfth eighteen twelve in naval archives captain's letters volume twenty five number forty three enclosing a list of american prisoners of war discharged out of custody of lieutenant william miller agent at the port of halifax in exchange for some of the british captured by porter this list by the way shows the crew of the nautilus counting the six men detained as british to have been ninety-five in number instead of one hundred six as stated by james commodore rogers adds that he has detained twelve men of the guerriere's crew as an offset to the six men belonging to the nautilus End of footnote of the other small brigs the viper vixen rattlesnake and siren james does not mention the composition of the crew and i do not know that any were claimed as british of the crew of the argus about ten or twelve were believed to be british subjects the american officers swore the crew contained none parenthesis james naval occurrences page two seventy eight close parenthesis from zero to ten per cent can be allowed when the frolic was captured her crew consisted of native americans parenthesis from the previous source page three forty close parenthesis james speaks parenthesis history page four eighteen close parenthesis of a portion of the british subjects on board the essex but without giving a word of proof or stating his grounds of belief one man was claimed as a deserter by the british but he turned out to be a new yorker there were certainly a certain number of british aboard but the number probably did not exceed thirty of the president's crew he says parenthesis naval occurrences page four forty eight close parenthesis in the opinion of several 
British officers. There were among them many British seamen. But Commodore Decatur, Lieutenant Gallagher, and the other officers swore that there were none. Of the crew of the Chesapeake, he says, about thirty-two were British subjects, or about ten percent. One or two of these were afterwards shot, and some twenty-five, together with a Portuguese boatswain mate, entered into the British service. So that of the vessels captured by the British, the Chesapeake had the largest number of British, about ten percent of her crew, on board, the others ranging from that number down to none at all, as in the case of the Wasp. As these eleven ships would probably represent a fair average, this proportion of zero to ten percent should be taken as the proper one. James, however, is of the opinion that those ships manned by Americans were more apt to be captured than those manned by the braver British, which calls for an examination of the crews of the remaining vessels. Of the American sloop Peacock, James says, parenthesis, Naval Occurrences, page 348, close parenthesis, that several of her men were recognized as British seamen. Even if this were true, several could not probably mean more than sixteen or ten percent. Of the second wasp, he says, Captain Blakely was a native of Dublin and along with some English and Scotch, did not, it may be certain, neglect to have in his crew a great many Irish. Now Captain Blakely left Ireland when he was but sixteen months old, and the rest of James's statement is avowedly mere conjecture. It was asserted positively in the American newspapers that the Wasp, which sailed from Portsmouth, was manned exclusively by New Englanders, except a small draft of men from a Baltimore privateer, and that there was not a foreigner in her crew. Of the Hornet, James states that some of her men were natives of the United Kingdom, but he gives no authority, and the men he refers to were in all probability those spoken of in the journal of one of the Hornet's officers, which says that many of our men, Americans, had been impressed in the British service. As regards the gunboats, James asserts that they were commanded by Commodore Joshua Barney, a native of Ireland. This officer, however, was born at Baltimore on July 6, 1759. As to the Constitution, Brenton, as already mentioned, supposes the number of British sailors in her crew to have been 200. James makes it less, or about 150. Respecting this, the only definite statements I can find in British works are the following in the Naval Chronicle, volume 29, page 452, an officer of the Java states that most of the Constitution's men were British, many being from the Guerriere, which should be read in connection with James's statement, volume 6, page 156, that but eight of the Guerriere's crew deserted, and but two shipped on board the Constitution. Moreover, as a matter of fact, these eight men were all impressed Americans. In the Naval Chronicle, it is also said that the Chesapeake's surgeon was an Irishman, formerly of the British Navy. He was born in Baltimore and was never in the British Navy in his life. The third lieutenant was supposed to be an Irishman. Brenton, Volume 2, 456. The first lieutenant was a native of Great Britain, we have been informed. Parenthesis James, volume 6, page 194, close parenthesis. He was Mr. George Parker, born and bred in Virginia. The remaining three citations, if true, prove nothing. One man had served under Mr. Kent of the Guerriere. 
Parenthesis James, Volume 6, page 153. One had been in the Achille, and one in the Eurydice. Parenthesis, Volume 2, page 456. These three men were most probably American seamen who had been impressed on British ships. From Cooper, parenthesis, in Putnam's Magazine, volume 1, page 593, as well as from several places in the Constitution's log. Footnote, see her log book, parenthesis, volume 2, February 1st, 1812 to December 13th, 1813, close parenthesis, especially on July 12th, when 12 men were discharged. In some of Hull's letters he alludes to the desire of the British part of the crew to serve on the gunboats or in the ports, and then writes that, in accordance with the instructions sent him by the Secretary of the Navy, he had allowed the British-born portion to leave the ship. The logbooks are in the Bureau of Navigation. End of footnote. We learn that several of the crew who were British deserters were discharged from the Constitution before she left port, as they were afraid to serve in a war against Great Britain. That this fear was justifiable may be seen by reading James, volume 4, page 483. Of the four men taken by the leopard from the Chesapeake as deserters, one was hung and three scourged. In reality, the crew of the Constitution probably did not contain a dozen British sailors. In her last cruises, she was manned almost exclusively by New Englanders. The only remainder vessel is the United States, respecting whose crew some remarkable statements have been made. Marshall, volume 2, page 1019, writes that Commodore Decatur declared there was not a seaman in his ship who had not served from five to twelve years in a British man-of-war, from which he concludes that they were British themselves. It may be questioned whether Decatur ever made such an assertion, or if he did, it is safe to assume again that his men were long-impressed Americans. Footnote. At the beginning of the war there were on record in the American State Department, 6,257 cases of impressed American seamen. These could represent but a small part of the whole, which must have amounted to 20,000 men, or more than sufficient to man our entire navy five times over. According to the British Admiralty Report to the House of Commons, February 1st, 1815, 2,548 impressed American seamen who refused to serve against their country were imprisoned in 1812. According to Lord Castlereagh's speech in the House, February 18th, 1813, 3,300 men claiming to be American subjects were serving in the British Navy in January 1811 and he certainly did not give anything like the whole number. In the American service, the term of enlistment extended for two years, and the frigate, United States referred to, had not had her crew for any very great length of time as yet. If such a crew were selected at random from American sailors, among them there would be, owing to the small number serving in our own navy, and the enormous number impressed into the British Navy, probably but one of the former to two of the latter. As already mentioned, the Americans always left a British man of war as soon as he could, by desertion or discharge. But he had no unwillingness to serve in the home navy, where the pay was larger and the discipline far more humane, not to speak of motives of patriotism. Even if the ex-British man-of-war man kept out of service for some time, he would be very apt to enlist when a war broke out, which his country undertook largely to avenge his own wrongs. End of footnote. 
of the carolina's crew of seventy men five were british this fact was not found out till three deserted when an investigation was made and the two other british discharged captain henley in reporting these facts made no concealment of his surprise that there should be any british at all in his crew footnote see his letters in letters of master's commandant eighteen fourteen volume one number one sixteen end of footnote from these facts and citations we may accordingly conclude that the proportion of british seamen serving on american ships after the war broke out varied between none as on the wasp and constitution to ten per cent as on the chesapeake and essex on the average nine-tenths of each of our crews were american seamen and about one-twentieth british the remainder being a mixture of various nationalities on the other hand it is to be said that the british frigate guerriere had ten americans among her crew who were permitted to go below during action and the macedonian eight who were not allowed that privilege three of them being killed three of the british sloop peacock's men were americans who were forced to fight against the hornet one of them was killed two of the esperviers men were americans who were also forced to fight when the crew of the nautilus was exchanged a number of other american prisoners were sent with them among these were a number of american seamen who had been serving in the shannon acasta africa and various other vessels so there was also a certain proportion of americans among the british crews although forming a smaller percentage of them than the british did on board the american ships in neither case was the number sufficient to at all affect the result the crews of our ships being thus mainly native americans it may be interesting to try to find out the proportions that were furnished by the different sections of the country there is not much difficulty about the officers the captains masters commandant lieutenants marine officers whose birthplaces are given in the navy lists of eighteen sixteen two hundred forty in all came from the various states as follows new hampshire five massachusetts twenty rhode island eleven connecticut six for a total in new england of forty two new york seventeen new jersey twenty two pennsylvania thirty five delaware four for a total middle states of seventy eight the district of columbia four maryland forty six virginia forty two north carolina four south carolina sixteen georgia two louisiana four kentucky two for a total from the southern states of one hundred sixteen total of given birthplaces two hundred forty thus maryland furnished both absolutely and proportionately the greatest number of officers virginia then the most populous of all the states coming next four-fifths of the remainder came from the northern states it is more difficult to get at the birthplaces of the sailors something can be inferred from the number of privateers and letters of mark fitted out here baltimore again headed the list following closely came new york philadelphia and the new england coast towns with alone among the southern ports charleston south carolina a more accurate idea of the quotas of sailors furnished by the different sections can be arrived at by comparing the total amount of tonnage the country possessed at the outbreak of the war speaking roughly forty four per cent of it belonged to new england thirty two per cent to the middle states and eleven per cent to maryland this makes it probable but of course not certain that three-fourths of the common sailors hailed from the northern states half the remainder from maryland and the rest chiefly from virginia and south carolina 
having thus discussed somewhat at length the character of our officers and crews it will now be necessary to present some statistical tables to give a more accurate idea of the composition of the navy the tonnage complements and armaments of the ships etc at the beginning of the war the government possessed six navy yards parenthesis, all but the last established in eighteen o one close parenthesis as follows footnote report of navy secretary jones november thirtieth eighteen fourteen end of footnote number one portsmouth new hampshire original cost five thousand five hundred dollars number of men employed ten number two charleston massachusetts thirty nine thousand two hundred and fourteen dollars number of men employed twenty new york forty thousand dollars one hundred and two men employed number four philadelphia thirty seven thousand dollars thirteen men employed number five washington four thousand dollars thirty six men employed number six gosport twelve thousand dollars sixteen men employed in eighteen twelve the following was the number of officers in the navy footnote list of vessels etc by general h preble u s navy eighteen seventy four end of footnote twelve captains ten masters commandant seventy three lieutenants fifty three masters three hundred ten midshipmen forty two marine officers for a grand total of five hundred at the opening of the year the number of seamen ordinary seamen and boys in service was four thousand ten and enough more were recruited to increase it to five thousand two hundred thirty of whom only two thousand three hundred forty six were destined for the cruising war vessels the remainder being detailed for forts gunboats navy yards the lakes etc footnote report of secretary paul hamilton february twenty first eighteen twelve end of footnote the marine corps was already ample consisting of one thousand five hundred twenty three men footnote ivid end of footnote no regular navy lists were published till eighteen sixteen and i have been able to get very little information respecting the increase in officers and men during eighteen thirteen and eighteen fourteen but we have full returns for eighteen fifteen which may be summarized as follows footnote siebert's statistical annals page six seventy six philadelphia eighteen eighteen and a footnote thirty captains twenty five masters commandant one hundred forty one lieutenants twenty four commanders five hundred ten midshipmen two hundred thirty sailing masters fifty surgeons twelve chaplains fifty pursers ten coast pilots forty five captains clerks eighty surgeons mates five hundred thirty boatswains gunners carpenters and sailmakers two hundred sixty eight boatswains mates gunners mates etc eleven hundred six quarter gunners etc five thousand able seamen six thousand eight hundred forty nine ordinary seamen and boys making a total of fourteen thousand nine hundred sixty with two thousand seven hundred fifteen marines footnote report of secretary b w croninshield april eighteenth eighteen sixteen end of footnote comparing this list with the figures given before it can be seen that during the course of the war our navy grew enormously increasing to between three and four times its original size at the beginning of the year eighteen twelve the navy of the united states on the ocean consisted of the following vessels which either were or could have been made available during the war footnote letter of secretary benjamin stoddart to fifth congress december twenty fourth seventeen ninety eight letter of secretary paul hamilton february twenty first eighteen twelve american state papers volume nineteen page one forty nine see also the history of the navy of the united states by lieutenant g e emmons 
U.S. Navy, parenthesis published in Washington, 1853, under the authority of the Navy Department. Close parenthesis. 44 guns. The United States. Built Philadelphia, 1797. Tonnage, 1,576. Cost, 299000 three hundred and thirty six dollars forty four guns the constitution built in boston seventeen ninety seven tonnage one thousand five hundred seventy six cost three hundred two thousand seven hundred eighteen dollars forty four guns the president built in new york eighteen hundred tonnage one thousand five hundred seventy six cost two hundred twenty thousand nine hundred ten dollars 38 guns the constellation built in baltimore 1797 1265 tons cost 314212 dollars 38 guns the congress portsmouth built in 1799 tonnage 1268 cost 197246 dollars 38 guns the Chesapeake Norfolk built in 1799 tonnage 1244 cost 220,677 dollars 32 guns the Essex and Salem built in 1799 860 tons cost 139,362 dollars 28 guns the Adams New York Built in 1799, tonnage 560, cost of $76,622. 18 guns, the Hornet, Baltimore, built in 1805, tonnage 480, cost $52,603. 18 guns, the Wasp, Washington, built in 1806. 450 tons cost forty thousand dollars 16 guns the argus boston built in 1803 298 tons cost thirty seven thousand four hundred twenty eight dollars 16 guns the siren philadelphia 1803 250 tons cost thirty two thousand five hundred twenty one dollars fourteen guns the nautilus baltimore built eighteen o three one hundred eighty five tons cost eighteen thousand seven hundred and sixty three dollars fourteen guns the vixen baltimore built eighteen o three one hundred eighty five tons cost twenty thousand eight hundred seventy two dollars 12 guns the enterprise baltimore built 1799 165 tons cost 16240 dollars 12 guns the viper was purchased 1810 148 tons there also appeared on the lists the new york 36 guns boston 28 guns and john adams twenty eight guns the two former were condemned hulks the latter was entirely rebuilt after the war the hornet was originally a brig of four hundred forty tons and eighteen guns having been transformed into a ship she was pierced for twenty guns and in size was of an intermediate grade between the wasp and the heavy sloops built somewhat later of 509 tons her armament consisted of 32 pound carronades with the exception of the two bow guns which were long twelves the whole broadside was in nominal weight just 300 pounds in actual weight about 277 pounds her complement of men was 140 but during the war she generally left port with 150 footnote in the hornet's log of october twenty fifth eighteen twelve while in port it is mentioned that she had one hundred fifty eight men four men who were sick were 
left behind before she started. Parenthesis. See, in the Navy Archives, the logbook, Hornet, Wasp, and Argus, July 20th, 1809 to October 6th, 1813. Close parenthesis. End of footnote. The Wasp had been a ship from the beginning, mounted the number of guns she rated, parenthesis, of the same calibers as the Hornets, close parenthesis, and carried some ten men less. She was about the same length as the British eighteen-gun brig sloop, but being narrower, measured nearly thirty tons less. The Argus and Siren were similar and very fine brigs, the former being the longer each carried two more guns than she rated and the argus in addition had a couple thrust through the bridle ports the guns were twenty-four pound carronades with two long twelves for bow chasers the proper complement of men was one hundred but each sailed usually with about one hundred twenty-five the four smaller craft were originally schooners armed with the same number of light long guns as they rated and carrying some seventy men apiece but they had been very effectually ruined by being changed into brigs with crews increased to a hundred men each was armed with eighteen pound carronades carrying two more than she rated the Enterprise, in fact, mounted sixteen guns, having two long nines thrust through the bridle ports. These little brigs were slow, but very seaworthy, and overcrowded with men and guns. They all fell into the enemy's hands without doing any good whatever, with the exception of the Enterprise, which escaped capture by sheer good luck and in her only battle happened to be pitted against one of the corresponding and equally bad class of british gun brigs the atoms after several changes of form finally became a flush-decked corvette the essex had originally mounted twenty-six long twelves on her main deck and sixteen twenty-four pound carronades on her spar deck but official wisdom changed this giving her forty-six guns, twenty-four thirty-two-pound carronades, and two long twelves on the main deck, and sixteen thirty-two-pound carronades, with four long twelves on the spar deck. When Captain Porter had command of her, he was deeply sensible of the disadvantages of an armament, which put him at the mercy of any ordinary antagonist who could choose his distance accordingly he petitioned several times but always without success to have his long twelves returned to him the american thirty-eights were about the size of the british frigates of the same rate and armed almost exactly in the same way each having twenty-eight long eighteens on the main deck and twenty thirty-two pound carronades on the spar deck the proper complement was three hundred men, but each carried from thirty to eighty more. Footnote. The Chesapeake, by some curious mistake, was frequently rated as a forty-four, and this drew in its train a number of attendant errors. When she was captured, James says that in one of her lockers was found a letter dated in February 1811 from Robert Smith, the secretary of war to captain evans at boston directing him to open houses of rendezvous for manning the chesapeake and enumerating her crew at a total of four hundred forty three naturally this gave british historians the idea that such was the ordinary complement of our thirty-eight gun frigates but the ordering so large a crew was merely a mistake as may be seen by a letter from captain bainbridge to the secretary of the navy which is given in full in the captain's letters volume twenty five number nineteen parenthesis navy archives close parenthesis in it he mentions the extraordinary number of men ordered for the chesapeake saying 
there is a mistake in the crew ordered for the chesapeake as it equals in number the crews of our forty four gun frigates whereas the chesapeake is of the class of the congress and constellation and a footnote our three forty four gun ships were the finest frigates then afloat although the british possessed some as heavy such as the egyptienne forty four they were beautifully modelled with very thick scantling extremely stout masts and heavy cannon each carried on her main deck thirty long twenty fours and on her spar deck two long bow chasers and twenty or twenty two carronades forty two pounders on the president and the united states thirty two pounders on the constitution each sailed with a crew of about four hundred fifty men fifty in excess of the regular complement footnote the president when in action with the endymion had four hundred fifty men aboard as sworn by decatur the muster roll of the constitution a few days before her action with the guerrier contains four hundred sixty four names parenthesis including fifty one marines close parenthesis eight men were absent in a prize so she had aboard in the action four hundred fifty six her muster roll just before the action with the cayenne and levant shows four hundred sixty one names End of footnote. it may be as well to mention here the only other class of vessels that we employed during the war this was composed of the ship sloops built in eighteen thirteen which got to sea in eighteen fourteen they were very fine vessels measuring five hundred nine tons apiece footnote the dimensions were one hundred seventeen feet eleven inches upon the gun deck ninety seven feet six inches keel for tonnage measuring from one foot before the forward perpendicular and along the base line to the front of the rabat of the port deducting three-fifths of the moulded breadth of the beam which is thirty-one feet six inches making five hundred nine and twenty-one ninety-fifth tons see in naval archives contracts volume two page one hundred thirty seven and a footnote with very thick scantling and stout masts and spars each carried thirty two pound carronades and two long twelves with a crew nominally of one hundred sixty men but with usually a few supernumeraries footnote the peacock had one hundred sixty six men as we learn from her commander warrington's letter of june first parenthesis letter number one forty in masters commandant letters eighteen fourteen volume one close parenthesis the frolic took aboard ten or twelve men beyond her regular complement parenthesis see letter of joseph bainbridge number fifty one in the same volume close parenthesis accordingly when she was captured by the orpheus the commander of the latter captain hugh pigott reported the number of men aboard to be one hundred seventy one the wasp left port with one hundred seventy three men with which she fought her first action she had a much smaller number aboard in her second End of footnote. the british vessels encountered were similar but generally inferior to our own the only twenty four pounder frigate we encountered was the endymion of about a fifth less force than the president their thirty eight gun frigates were almost exactly like ours but with fewer men in crew as a rule they were three times matched against our forty four gun frigates to which they were inferior about as three is to four their thirty six gun frigates were larger than the essex with a more numerous crew but the same number of guns carrying on the lower deck however long eighteens instead of thirty two pound carronades a much more effective armament the thirty two gun frigates were smaller with long twelves on the main deck 
the largest sloops were also frigate built carrying twenty two thirty two pound carronades on the main deck and twelve lighter guns on the quarter deck and forecastle with a crew of one hundred eighty the large flush deck ship sloops carried twenty one or twenty three guns with a crew of one hundred forty men but our vessels most often came in contact with the british eighteen gun brig sloop this was a tubby craft heavier than any of our brigs being about the size of the hornet the crew consisted of from one hundred ten to one hundred thirty five men ordinarily each was armed with sixteen thirty two pound carronades two long sixes and a shifting twelve pound carronade often with a light long gun as a stern chaser making twenty in all the reindeer and peacock had only twenty four pound carronades the epervier had but eighteen guns all carronades footnote the epervier was taken into our service under the same name and rate both preble and emmons describe her as four hundred seventy seven tons warrington her captor however says the surveyor of the port has just measured the epervier and reports her four hundred sixty seven tons parenthesis in the navy archives master's commandant letters eighteen fourteen volume one number one twenty five close parenthesis for a full discussion of tonnage see appendix a and a footnote among the stock accusations against our navy of eighteen twelve were and are statements that our vessels were rated at less than their real force and in particular that our large frigates were disguised line of battle ships as regards the ratings most vessels of that time carried more guns than they rated the disparity was less in the french than in either the british or american navies our thirty-eight gun frigates carried forty-eight guns the exact number the british thirty-eighths possessed the worst case of underrating in our navy was the essex which rated thirty-two and carried forty-six guns so that her reel was forty-four per cent in excess of her nominal force but this was not as bad as the british sloop cayenne which was rated at twenty or twenty-two and carried thirty-four guns so that she had either fifty-five or seventy per cent greater reel than nominal force at the beginning of the war we owned two eighteen-gun ship sloops one mounting eighteen and the other twenty guns the eighteen-gun brig sloops they captured mounted each nineteen guns so the average was the same later we built sloops that rated eighteen and mounted twenty-two guns but when one was captured it was also put down in the british navy list as an eighteen-gun ship sloop during all the combats of the war there were but four vessels that carried as few guns as they rated two were british the the epervier and the levant and two american the wasp and adams one navy was certainly as deceptive as another as far as underrating went the force of the statement that our large frigates were disguised line of battle ships of course depends entirely upon what the words frigate and line of battleship mean when on the tenth of august sixteen fifty three de reuter saved a great convoy by beating off sir george icecoff's fleet of thirty-eight sail the largest of the dutch admiral's thirty-three sail of the line carried but thirty guns and one hundred fifty men and his own flagship but twenty-eight guns and one hundred thirty-four men footnote la vie et la action memorable du sieur michel de reuter à amsterdam chez henri et theodore boom sixteen seventy seven the work is by bartholomew pilot a surgeon in de reuter's fleet and 
personally present during many of his battles. It is written in French, but it is in tone more strongly anti-French than anti-English. End of footnote. The Dutch book from which this statement is taken speaks indifferently of frigates of 18, 40, and 58 guns. Toward the end of the 18th century, the terms that crystallize frigate then meant a so-called single-decked ship. It in reality possessed two decks, the main or gun deck and the upper one, which had no name at all until our sailors christened it spar deck. The gun deck possessed a complete battery, and the spar deck an interrupted one, mounting guns on the forecastle and quarter deck. At that time all two decked or three decked, in reality three and four decked, ships were liners, but in 1812 this had changed somewhat. As the various nations built more and more powerful vessels, the lower rates of the different divisions were dropped. Thus the British ship Cayenne, captured by the Constitution, was in reality a small frigate with a main deck battery of 22 guns and 12 decks on the spar deck. A few years before, she would have been called a 24-gun frigate, but she then ranked merely as a 22-gun sloop. Similarly, the 50- and 64-gun ships that had fought in the line at the Doggerbank, Camperdown, and even at Abacour were now no longer deemed fit for the purpose, and the 74 was the lowest line of battleship. The Constitution, President, and States must then be compared with the existing European vessels that were classed as frigates. The French in 1812 had no 24-pounder frigates for the very good reason that they had all fallen victims to the English 18-pounders. But in July of that year a Danish frigate, the Nyaden, which carried long 24s, was destroyed by the English ship Dictator 64. The British frigates were of several rates, the lowest rated 32, carrying in all 40 guns, 26 long 12s on the main deck, and 14 24-pound carronades on the spar deck, a broadside of 324 pounds. Footnote. In all these vessels there were generally two long 6s or 9s substituted for the bow chase carronades. End of footnote. The 36-gun frigates, like the Phoebe, carried 46 guns, 26 long 18s on the gun deck and 32-pound carronades above. The 38-gun frigates, like the Macedonian, carried 48 or 49 guns, long 18s below and 32-pound carronades above. The 32-gun frigates then presented in broadside 13 long 12s below and 7 24-pound carronades above. The 38-gun frigates, 14 long 18s below and 10 32-pound carronades above, so that a 44-gun frigate would naturally present 15 long 24s and 12 42-pound carronades above, as the United States did at first. The rate was perfectly proper, for French, British, and Danes already possessed 24-pounder frigates, and there was really less disparity between the force and rate of a 44 that carried 54 guns than there was in a 38 that carried 49, or like the Shannon 52. Nor was this all. Two of our three victories were won by the Constitution, which only carried 32-pound carronades, and once 54 and once 52 guns. And as two-thirds of the work was thus done by this vessel, I shall now compare her with the largest British frigates. Her broadside force consisted of 15 long 24s on the main deck, and on the spar deck one long 24, and in one case ten, in the other eleven thirty-two pound carronades, a broadside of seven hundred and four to seven hundred thirty-six pounds. Footnote. 
nominally in reality about seven per cent less on account of the short weight in the metal and of footnote there was then in the british navy the acosta forty carrying in broadside fifteen long eighteens and eleven thirty-two pound carronades when the spar deck batteries are equal the addition of ninety pounds to the main deck broadside parenthesis which is all the superiority of the constitution over the acosta close parenthesis is certainly not enough to make the distinction between a frigate and a disguised seventy four but not considering the acosta there were in the british navy three twenty four pound frigates indefatigable the cornwallis and endymion we only came in contact with the latter in eighteen fifteen when the constitution had but fifty two guns the endymion then had an armament of twenty eight long twenty fours two long eighteens and twenty thirty two pound carronades making a broadside of six hundred seventy four pounds footnote according to james six hundred sixty four pounds he omits the chase guns for no reason End of footnote. or including a shifting twenty four pound carronade of six hundred ninety eight pounds just six pounds or one per cent less than the force of that disguised line of battleship the constitution as the endymion only rated as a forty and the constitution as a forty four it was in reality the former and not the latter which was under rated i have taken the constitution because the british had more to do with her than they did with our other two forty fours taken together the latter were both of heavier metal than the constitution carrying forty two pound carronades in eighteen twelve the united states carried her full fifty four guns throwing a broadside of eight hundred forty six pounds when captured the president carried fifty three having substituted a twenty four pound carronade for two of her forty twos and her broadside amounted to eight hundred twenty eight pounds or sixteen per cent nominal and on account of the short weight of her shot nine per cent real excess over the endymion if this difference made her a line of battle ship then the endymion was doubly a line of battle ship compared to the congress or constellation moreover the american commanders found their forty two pound carronades too heavy as i have said the constitution only mounted thirty twos and the united states landed six of her guns when in eighteen thirteen she attempted to break the blockade she carried but forty eight guns throwing a broadside of seven hundred twenty pounds just three per cent more than the endymion footnote it was on account of this difference of three per cent that captain hardy refused to allow the endymion to meet the states parenthesis james volume six page four seventy close parenthesis this was during the course of some challenges and counter challenges which ended in nothing decatur in his turn being unwilling to have the macedonian meet the statira unless the latter should agree not to take on a picked crew he was perfectly right in this but he ought never to have sent the challenge at all as two ships but an hour or two out of port would be at a frightful disadvantage in a fight End of footnote. if our frigates were line of battle ships the disguise was certainly marvellously complete and they had a number of companions equally disguised in the british ranks the forty fours were thus true frigates with one complete battery of long guns and one interrupted one of carronades that they were better than any other frigates was highly creditable to our ingenuity and national skill we cannot perhaps lay claim to the invention and first use of the heavy frigate for twenty-four pounder frigates were already in the service of at least 
three nations and the french thirty six pound carronade in use on their spar decks threw a heavier ball than our forty two pounder but we had enlarged and perfected the heavy frigate and were the first nation that ever used it effectively the french forte and the danish nyaden shared the fate of ships carrying guns of lighter caliber and the british twenty-four pounders like the endymion had never accomplished anything hitherto there had been a strong feeling especially in england that an eighteen-pound gun was as effective as a twenty-four in arming a frigate we made a complete revolution in this respect england had been building only eighteen-pounder vessels when she ought to have been building twenty-four pounders it was greatly to our credit that our average frigate was superior to the average british frigate exactly as it was to our discredit that the essex was so ineffectively armed captain porter owed his defeat chiefly to his ineffective guns but also to having lost his topmast to the weather being unfavorable and still more to the admirable skill with which hilliar used his superior armament the java macedonian and guerriere owed their defeat partly to their lighter guns but much more to the fact that their captains and seamen did not display either as good seamanship or as good gunnery as their foes inferiority in armament was a factor to be taken into account in all the four cases but it was more marked in that of the essex than in the other three it would have been fairer for porter to say that he had been captured by a line of battleship than for the captain of the java to make that assertion in this last case the forces of the two ships compared almost exactly as their rates a forty four was matched against a thirty eight it was not surprising that she would win but it was surprising that she should win with ease and impunity the long twenty fours on the constitution gun deck no more made her a line of battleship than the thirty two pound carronades mounted on an english frigate's quarter-deck and forecastle made her a line of battleship when opposed to a frenchman with only eights and sixes on her spar deck when a few years before the english phoebe had captured the french neride their broadsides were respectively four hundred seven and two hundred fifty eight pounds a greater disparity than in any of our successful fights yet no author thought of claiming that the phoebe was anything but a frigate so with the clyde throwing four hundred twenty five pounds which took the vastale throwing but two hundred forty six the facts were that eighteen pounder frigates had captured twelve pounders exactly as our twenty four pounders in turn captured the eighteen pounders shortly before great britain declared war on us one of our eighteen pounder frigates the san florenzo throwing four hundred seventy six pounds in a broadside captured the twelve pounder french frigate psyche whose broadside was only two hundred forty six pounds the force of the former was thus almost double that of the latter yet the battle was long and desperate the english losing forty eight and the french one hundred twenty four men this conflict then reflected as much credit on the skill and seamanship of the defeated as of the victorious side the difference in loss could fairly be ascribed to the difference in weight of metal but where as in the famous ship duels of eighteen twelve the difference in force is only a fifth instead of a half and yet the slaughter instead of being as five is to two is as six to one then the victory is certainly to be ascribed as much to superiority in skill as to superiority in force but on the other hand 
it should always be remembered that there was a very decided superiority in force it is a very discreditable feature of many of our naval histories that they utterly ignore this superiority seeming ashamed to confess that it existed in reality it was something to be proud of it was highly to the credit of the united states that her frigates were of better make and armament than any others it always speaks well for a nation's energy and capacity that any of her implements of warfare are of a superior kind this is a perfectly legitimate reason for pride it spoke well for the prussians in eighteen sixty six that they opposed breech loaders to the muzzle loaders of the austrians but it would be folly to give all the credit of the victory to the breech loaders and none to mulkey and his lieutenants thus it must be remembered that two things contributed to our victories one was the excellent make and armament of our ships the other was the skilful seamanship excellent discipline and superb gunnery of the men who were in them british writers are apt only to speak of the first and americans only of the last whereas both should be taken into consideration end of part three Part four of the Naval Battle of eighteen twelve by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. To sum up, the American forty four gun frigate was a true frigate in build and armament, properly rated, stronger than a thirty eight gun frigate, just about in proportion of forty four to thirty eight, and not exceeding in strength an eighteen-pounder frigate as much as the latter exceeded one carrying twelve-pounders they were in no way whatever line of battle ships but they were superior to any other frigates afloat and what is still more important they were better manned and commanded than the average frigate of any other navy lord codrington says Parenthesis Memoirs, Volume 1, page 310, close parenthesis. But I well know the system of favoritism and borough corruption prevails so very much that many people are promoted and kept in command that should be dismissed the service, and while such is the case, the few Americans chosen for their merit may be expected to follow up their successes except where they meet with our best officers on even terms. Footnote to show that i am not quoting an authority biased in our favour i will give sir edward codrington's opinion of our rural better class volume one page three hundred eighteen it is curious to observe the animosity which prevails here among what is called the better order of people which i think is more a misnomer here than in any other country i have ever been their Whig and Tory are Democrat and Federalist, and it would seem, for the sake of giving vent to that bitterness of hatred which marks the Yankee character, every gentleman, God save the term, who takes possession of a property adopts the opposite political creed to that of his nearest neighbor. End of footnote. The small size of our navy was probably to a certain extent effective in keeping it up to a high standard but this is not the only explanation as can be seen by portugal's small and poor navy on the other hand the champions or pick of a large navy ought to be better than the champions of a small one footnote in speaking of tonnage I wish I could have got better authority than James for the British side of the question. He is so bitter that it involuntarily gives one a distrust of his judgment. 
thus in speaking of the penguin's capture he in endeavouring to show that the hornet's loss was greater than she acknowledged says several of the dangerously wounded were thrown overboard because the surgeon was afraid to amputate owing to his want of experience parenthesis naval occurrences page four ninety two close parenthesis now what could persuade a writer to make such a foolish accusation no matter how utterly depraved and brutal captain biddle might be he would certainly not throw his wounded over alive because he feared they might die again in volume six page five forty six he says captain stewart had caused the cayenne to be painted to resemble a thirty six gun frigate the object of this was to aggrandize his exploit in the eyes of the gaping citizens of Boston. No matter how skillful an artist Captain Stewart was, and no matter how great the gaping capacities of the Bostonians, the Cayenne, which, by the way, went to New York and not Boston, could no more be painted to look like a 36-gun frigate than a schooner could be painted to look like a brig instances of rancor like these to occur constantly in his work and make it very difficult to separate what is matter of fact from what is matter of opinion i always rely on the british official accounts when they can be reached except in the case of the java which seem garbled that such was sometimes the case with british officials is testified to by both james volume four page seventeen and brenton volume two page four fifty four note from the memoir of admiral brooke we learn that his public letter was wrong in a number of particulars see also any one of the numerous biographies of lord dundonall the hero of the little speedy's fight it is very unfortunate that the british stopped publishing official accounts of their defeats it could not well help giving rise to unpleasant suspicions it may be as well to mention here again that james's accusations do not really detract from the interest attaching to the war and its value for purposes of study if as he says the american commanders were cowards and their crews renegades it is well worth while to learn the lesson that good training will make such men able to beat brave officers with loyal crews and why did the british have such bad average crews as he makes out he says for instance that the javas was unusually bad yet brenton says volume two page four sixty one it was like the generality of our crews it is worth while explaining the reason that such a crew was generally better than a french and worse than an american one End of footnote. again the armaments of the american as well as of the british ships were composed of three very different styles of guns the first or long gun was enormously long and thick-barreled in comparison to its bore and in consequence very heavy it possessed a very long range and varied in caliber from two to forty-two pounds the ordinary calibers in our navy were six nine twelve eighteen and twenty-four the second style was the carronade a short light gun of large bore compared to a long gun of the same weight it carried a much heavier ball for a much shorter distance the chief calibers were nine twelve eighteen twenty four thirty two forty two and sixty eight pounders the first and the last being hardly in use in our navy the third style was the columbiade of an intermediate grade between the first two thus it is seen that a gun of one style by no means corresponds to a gun of another style of the same caliber as a rough example a long twelve a columbiad eighteen and a thirty-two pound carronade 
would be about equivalent to one another. These guns were mounted on two different types of vessels. The first was flush-decked, that is, it had a single straight open deck on which all the guns were mounted. This class included one heavy corvette, the Adams, the ship sloops, and the brig sloops. Through the bow chase port on each side, each of these mounted a long gun. The rest of their guns were carronades, except in the case of the Adams, which had all long guns. Above these came the frigates, whose gun deck was covered above by another deck. On the fore and aft parts, forecastle and quarter deck of this upper open deck were also mounted guns. The main deck guns were all long, except on the Essex, which had carronades. On the quarter deck were mounted carronades, and on the forecastle also carronades with two long bow chasers. Where two ships of similar armament fought one another, it is easy to get the comparative force by simply comparing the weight in broadsides, each side presenting very nearly the same proportion of long guns to carronades. For such a broadside, we take half the guns mounted in the ordinary way, and all guns mounted on pivots or shifting. Thus Perry's force in guns was 54 to Barclay's 63. Yet each presented 34 in broadside. Again, each of the British brig sloops mounted 19 guns, presenting 10 in broadside. Besides these, some ships mounted bow chasers, run through the bridle ports, or stern chasers, either of which could be used in broadsides. Nevertheless, I include them both because it works in about an equal number of cases against each navy, and because they were sometimes terribly effective. James excludes the Guerrier's bow chaser. In reality, he ought to have included both it and its fellow, as they worked more damage than all the broadside guns put together. Again, he excludes the Endymion's bow chasers, though in her action they proved invaluable. Yet he includes those of the Enterprise and Argus, though the former's were probably not fired. So I shall take the half of the fixed, plus all the movable guns aboard, in comparing broadside force. But the chief difficulty appears when guns of one style are matched against those of another. If a ship armed with long twelves meets one armed with thirty-two pound carronades, which is superior in force? At long range the first, and at short range the second. And of course each captain is pretty sure to insist that circumstances forced him to fight at a disadvantage. The result would depend largely on the skill or luck of each commander in choosing position. One thing is certain. Long guns are more formidable than carronades of the same caliber. There are exemplifications of this rule on both sides. Of course the American writers, as a rule, only pay attention to one set of cases, and British to the others. The Cayenne and Levant threw a heavier broadside than the Constitution, but were certainly less formidably armed and the Essex threw a heavier broadside than the Phoebe, yet was also less formidable. On Lake Ontario the American ship General Pike threw less metal at a broadside than either of her two chief antagonists, but neither could be called her equal. While on Lake Champlain a parallel case is afforded by the British ship Confiance, Supposing that two ships throw the same broadside weight of metal, one from long guns, the other from carronades, at short range they are equal. At long, one has it all her own way. Her captain thus certainly has a great superiority of force, and if he does not take advantage of it, it is owing to his adversary's skill or his own mismanagement. As a mere approximation, it may be assumed, in comparing the broadsides of 
two vessels or squadrons that long guns count for at least twice as much as carronades of the same caliber thus on lake champlain captain downey possessed an immense advantage in his long guns which commodore mcdonough's exceedingly good arrangements nullified sometimes part of the advantage may be willingly foregone so as to acquire some other had the constitution kept at her long bowls with cayenne and levant she should have probably captured one without any loss to herself while the other would have escaped she preferred to run down close so as to ensure the capture of both knowing that even at close quarters long guns are somewhat better than short ones not to mention her other advantages in thick scantling speed etc the british carronades often upset in action this was either owing to their having been insufficiently secured and to this remaining undiscovered because the men were not exercised at guns or else it was because the unpractised sailors would greatly overcharge them our better trained sailors on the ocean rarely committed these blunders but the less skilled crews on the lakes did so as often as their antagonists but while the americans thus as a rule had heavier and better fitted guns they labored under one or two disadvantages our foundries were generally not as good as those of the british and our guns in consequence more likely to burst it was an accident of this nature which saved the british belvedere and the general pike under commodore chauncey and the new american frigate guerriere suffered in the same way while often the muzzles of the guns would crack a more universal disadvantage was in the short weight of our shot when captain blakely sunk the avon he officially reported that her four shot which came aboard weighed just thirty two pounds apiece a pound and three quarters more than his heaviest this would make his average shot about two and a half pounds less or rather over seven per cent exactly similar statements were made by the officers of the constitution in her three engagements thus when she fought the java she threw at a broadside as already stated seven hundred four pounds the java mounted twenty-eight long eighteens eighteen thirty-two pound carronades two long twelves and one shifting twenty-four pound carronade a broadside of five hundred seventy-six pounds yet by the actual weighing of all the different shot on both sides it was found that the difference in broadside force was only about seventy-seven pounds or the constitution's shot were about seven per cent short weight the long twenty-fours of the united states each threw a shot but four and a half pounds heavier than the long eighteens of the macedonian here again the difference was about seven per cent the same difference existed in favor of the penguin and pervier compared with the wasp and hornet mr fenimore cooper footnote see naval history volume one page three hundred eighty End of footnote, weighed a great number of shot some time after the war the later castings even weighed nearly five per cent less than the british shot and some of the older ones about nine per cent the average is safe to take at seven per cent less and i shall throughout make this allowance for ocean cruisers the deficit was something owing to windage but more often the shot was of full size but defective in density the effect of this can be gathered from the following quotation from the work of a british artillerist the greater the density of shot of like calibers projected with equal velocity and elevation the greater the range accuracy and penetration footnote heavy ordnance captain t f simmons r a london eighteen thirty seven james supposes that the yankee captains have in each case 
hunted round till they could get particularly small American shot to weigh, and also denies that short weight is a disadvantage. The last proposition carried out logically would lead to some rather astonishing results. End of footnote. This defectiveness in density might be a serious injury in a contest at a long distance, but would make but little difference at close quarters, although it may have been partly owing to their short weight that so many of the Chesapeake's shot failed to penetrate the Shannon's hull. Thus, in the actions with the Macedonian and Java, the American frigates showed excellent practice when the contest was carried down within fair distance, while their first broadsides at long range went very wild. But in the case of the Guerriere, the Constitution reserved her fire for close quarters, and was probably not at all affected by the short weight of her shot. As to the officers and crew of a 44-gun frigate, the following was the regular complement established by law. Footnote. See State Papers, Volume 14, page 159, parenthesis, Washington, 1834, close parenthesis, end of footnote. One captain, four lieutenants, two lieutenants of marines, two sailing masters, two masters' mates, seven midshipmen, one purser, one surgeon, two surgeon's mates, one clerk, one carpenter, two carpenter's mates, one boatswain, two boatswain's mates, one yeoman of gun-room, one gunner, eleven quarter-gunners, one coxswain, one sailmaker, one cooper, one steward, one armourer, one master of arms, one cook, one chaplain, for a total of fifty, one hundred twenty able seamen, one hundred fifty ordinary seamen, thirty boys, fifty marines, four hundred in all. An eighteen-gun ship had thirty-two officers and petty officers, thirty able seamen, forty-six ordinary seamen, twelve boys, and twenty marines, one hundred forty in all. Sometimes ships put to sea without their full complements, as in the case of the first wasp, but more often with supernumeraries aboard. The weapons for close quarters were pikes, cutlasses, and a few oxes, while the marines and some of the topmen had muskets and occasionally rifles. In comparing the forces of the contestants, I have always given the number of men in crew, but this in most cases was unnecessary. When there were plenty of men to handle the guns, trim the sails, make repairs, act as marines, etc., any additional number simply served to increase the slaughter on board. The guerriere undoubtedly suffered from being short-handed, but neither the Macedonian nor Java would have been benefited by the presence of a hundred additional men. Barclay possessed about as many men as Perry, but this did not give him an equality of force. The Penguin and Frolic would have been taken just as surely had the Hornet and Wasp had a dozen men less apiece than they did. The principal case where numbers would help would be in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Thus the Chesapeake, having fifty more men than the Shannon, ought to have been successful, but she was not, because the superiority of her crew in numbers was more than counterbalanced by the superiority of the Shannon's crew in other respects. The result of the Battle of Lake Champlain, which was fought at anchor, with the fleets too far apart for musketry to reach, was not in the slightest degree affected by the number of men on either side, as both combatants had amply enough to manage the guns and perform every other service. In all these conflicts, the courage of both parties is taken for granted. It was not so much a factor in gaining the victory as one which, if lacking, was fatal to all chances of success. 
in the engagements between regular cruisers not a single one was gained by superiority in courage the crews of both the argus and Epervier certainly flinched but had they fought never so bravely they were too unskilful to win the chesapeake's crew could hardly be said to lack courage it was more than they were inferior to their opponents in discipline as well as in skill there was but one conflict during the war where the victory could be said to be owing to superiority in pluck this was when the newfchatel privateer beat off the boats of the endymion the privateersmen suffered a heavier proportional loss than their assailants and they gained the victory by sheer ability to stand punishment for convenience in comparing them i give in tabulated form the force of the three british thirty eights taken by american forty fours allowing for short weight of metal of the latter constitution thirty long twenty fours two long twenty fours twenty two short thirty twos total broadside nominal seven hundred thirty six pounds real six hundred eighty four pounds the guerriere thirty long eighteens two long twelves sixteen short thirty twos one short eighteen total broadside five hundred fifty six pounds the united states thirty long twenty fours two long twenty fours twenty two short forty twos broadside nominal eight hundred forty six pounds real seven hundred eighty six pounds the macedonian twenty eight long eighteens two long twelves two long nines sixteen short thirty twos one short eighteen broadside five hundred forty seven pounds constitution thirty long twenty fours two long twenty fours twenty short thirty twos and the broadside nominal seven hundred four pounds real six hundred fifty four pounds the java twenty eight long eighteens two long twelves eighteen short thirty twos one short twenty four broadside five hundred seventy six pounds the smallest line of battleship the seventy four with only long eighteens on the second deck was armed as follows twenty eight long thirty twos twenty eight eighteens six twelves fourteen short thirty twos seven eighteens or a broadside of one thousand thirty two pounds seven hundred thirty six from long guns two hundred ninety six from carronades while the constitution threw in reality six hundred eighty four pounds three hundred and fifty six from long guns and three hundred twenty eight from her carronades and the united states one hundred two pounds more from her carronades remembering the difference between long guns and carronades and considering sixteen of the seventy fours long eighteens as being replaced by forty two pound carronades footnote that this change would leave the force about as it was can be gathered from the fact that the adams and john adams both of which had been armed with forty two pound carronades which were sent to sackett's harbor had them replaced by long and medium eighteen pounders these being considered to be formidable so that the substitution of forty two pound carronades would if anything reduce the force of the seventy four end of footnote parenthesis so as to get the metal on the ships distributed in similar proportions between the two styles of cannon close parenthesis we get as the seventy fours broadside five hundred ninety two pounds from long guns and six hundred thirty two from carronades the united states threw nominally three hundred sixty and four hundred eighty six and the constitution nominally three hundred sixty and three hundred fifty two so the seventy four was superior even to the former nominally about as three is to two while the constitution if a line of battleship 
was disguised to such a degree that she was in reality of but little more than one half the force of one of the smallest true liners England possessed. Chapter 3 1812 On the Ocean At the time of the declaration of war, June 18, 1812, the American Navy was but partially prepared for effective service. The Wasp 18 was still at sea on her return voyage from France. The Constellation 38 was lying in the Chesapeake River, unable to receive a crew for several months to come. The Chesapeake, 38, was lying in a similar condition in Boston Harbor. The Adams, 28, was at Washington, being cut down and lengthened from a frigate into a corvette. These three cruisers were none of them fit to go to sea until after the end of the year. The Essex, 32 was in New York Harbor, but having some repairs to make was not yet ready to put out. The Constitution, 44, was at Annapolis, without all of her stores, and engaged in shipping a new crew, the time of the old one being up. The Nautilus, 14, was cruising off New Jersey, and the other small brigs were also off the coast. The only vessels immediately available were those under the command of Commodore Rogers at New York, consisting of his own ship, the President, 44, and of the United States, 44. Commodore Decatur, Congress, 38, Captain Smith, Hornet, 18, Captain Lawrence and Argus, 16, Lieutenant Sinclair. It seems marvelous that any nation should have permitted its ships to be so scattered, and many of them in such an unfit condition at the beginning of hostilities. The British vessels cruising off the coast were not at that time very numerous or formidable, consisting of the Africa, 64, Acosta, 40, Shannon, 38, Guerrier, 38, Belvedere, 36, Aeolus, 32, Southampton, 32, and Minerva, 32, with a number of corvettes and sloops. Their force was, however, strong enough to render it impossible for Commodore Rogers to make any attempt on the coast towns of Canada or the West Indies. But the homeward-bound plate fleet had sailed from Jamaica on May 20th, and was only protected by the Thalia, 36, Captain Vachon, and Reindeer, 18, Captain Manners. Its capture or destruction would have been a serious blow, and one which there seemed a good chance of striking, as the fleet would have to pass along the American coast, running with the Gulf Stream. Commodore Rogers had made every preparation, in expectation of war being declared, and an hour after official intelligence of it, together with his instructions, had been received, his squadron put to sea on June 21st, and ran off toward the southeast. Footnote, letter of Commodore John Rogers to the Secretary of the Navy, September 1st, 1812. End of footnote. To get at the Jamaica ships. Having learned from an American brig that she had passed the plate fleet four days before at latitude 36 degrees north, longitude 67 degrees west, the Commodore made all sail in that direction. At 6 a.m. on June 23rd, a sail was made out in the northeast, which proved to be the British frigate Belvedere 36, Captain Richard Byron. Footnote. Brenton, volume 5, page 46, end of footnote. The latter had sighted some of Commodore Rogers' squadron some time before and stood toward them. Still, at 6.30, she made out the three largest ships to be frigates. Having been informed of the likelihood of war by a New York pilot boat, the Belvedere now stood away, going northeast by east, the wind being fresh from the west. The Americans made all sail 
in chase, the President a very fast ship off the wind leading, and the Congress coming next. At noon the President bore southwest, distant two and three-quarter miles from the Belvedere, Nantucket shoals bearing one hundred miles north and forty-eight miles east. Footnote Log of Belvedere, June twenty-third, eighteen twelve. End of footnote. The wind grew lighter, shifting more toward the southwest, while the ships continued steadily in their course, going northeast by east. As the president kept gaining, Captain Byron cleared his ship for action and shifted to the stern ports two long eighteen pounders on the main deck and two thirty two pound carronades on the quarter deck. At four thirty, footnote Cooper, volume two, page one fifty one. According to James, volume six, page one hundred seventeen, the president was then six hundred yards distant from the Belvedere, half a point on her weather or port quarter. End of footnote. The president's starboard forecastle bow gun was fired by Commodore Rogers himself. The corresponding main deck gun was next discharged, and then Commodore Rogers fired again. These three shots all struck the stern of the Belvedere, killing and wounding nine men. One of them went through the rudder coat into the after gun room, the other two into the captain's cabin. A few more such shots would have rendered the Belvedere's capture certain, but when the president's main deck gun was discharged for the second time it burst, blowing up the forecastle deck and killing and wounding sixteen men, among them the commodore himself, whose leg was broken. This saved the British frigate. Such an explosion always causes a half-panic, every gun being at once suspected. In the midst of the confusion, Captain Byron's stern chasers opened with spirit and effect, killing or wounding six men more. Had the President still pushed steadily on, only using her bow chasers until she closed abreast, which she could probably have done, the Belvedere could still have been taken, but instead the former now bore up and fired her port broadside cutting her antagonist's rigging slightly, but doing no other damage, while the Belvedere kept up a brisk and galling fire, although the long bolts, breaching hooks, and breachings of the guns now broke continually, wounding several of the men, including Captain Byron. The President had lost ground by yawing, but she soon regained it, and coming up closer than before, again opened from her bow chasers a well-directed fire which severely wounded her opponent's main topmast cross jack yard and one or two other spars footnote james volume six page one nineteen he says the president was within four hundred yards end of footnote but shortly afterward she repeated her former tactics and again lost ground by yawing to discharge another broadside even more ineffectual than the first once more she came up closer than ever and once more yawed the single shots from her bow chasers doing considerable damage but her raking broadsides none footnote lord howard douglas naval gunnery page four nineteen third edition End of footnote. Meanwhile, the active crew of the Belvedere repaired everything as fast as it was damaged, while under the superintendence of Lieutenants Sykes, Bruce, and Campbell, no less than three hundred shot were fired from her stern guns. Footnote. James, volume six, page one eighteen. End of footnote. Finding that if the president ceased yawing, she could easily run alongside Captain. Byron cut away one bower, one stream, and two sheet anchors, the barge, yawl, gig, and jolly boat, and started fourteen tons of water. 
the effect of this was at once apparent and she began to gain meanwhile the damage the sails of the combatants had received had enabled the congress to close and when abreast of his consort captain smith opened with his bow chasers but the shot fell short the belvedere soon altered her course to east by south set her starboard studding sail and by midnight was out of danger and three days afterward reached halifax harbor lord howard douglas's criticisms on this encounter seem very just he says that the president opened very well with her bow chasers parenthesis in fact the americans seem to have aimed better and to have done more execution with these guns than the british with their stern chasers close parenthesis but that she lost so much ground by yawing and delivering harmless broadsides as to enable her antagonist to escape certainly if it had not been for the time thus lost to no purpose the commodore would have run alongside his opponent and the fate of the little thirty-six would have been sealed on the other hand it must be remembered that it was only the bursting of the gun on board of the president causing such direful confusion and loss and especially harmful in disabling her commander that gave the belvedere any chance of escape at all at any rate whether the american frigate does or does not deserve blame captain byron and his crew do most emphatically deserve praise for the skill with which their guns were served and repairs made the coolness with which measures to escape were adopted and the courage with which they resisted so superior a force on this occasion captain byron showed himself as good a seaman and as brave a man as he subsequently proved a humane and generous enemy when engaged in the blockade of the chesapeake footnote even niles unscrupulously bitter as he is toward the british does justice to the humanity of captains byron and hardy which certainly shone in comparison to some of the rather buccaneering exploits of cockburn's followers in chesapeake bay End of footnote this was not a very auspicious opening of hostilities for america the loss of the belvedere was not the only thing to be regretted for the distance the chase took the pursuers out of their course probably saved the plate fleet when the belvedere was first made out commodore rogers was in latitude thirty nine degrees twenty six minutes north and longitude seventy one degrees ten minutes west at noon the same day the thalia and her convoy were in the latitude thirty nine degrees north longitude sixty two degrees west had they not chased the belvedere the americans would probably have run across the plate fleet the american squadron reached the western edge of the newfoundland banks on june twenty ninth footnote letter of commodore rogers september first and a footnote and on july first a little to the east of the banks fell in with large quantities of cocoa-nut shells orange peels etc which filled every one with great hopes of overtaking the quarry on july ninth the hornet captured a british privateer in latitude forty five degrees thirty minutes north and in longitude twenty three degrees west and her master reported that he had seen the jamaica men the previous evening but nothing further was heard or seen of them and on july thirteenth being within twenty hours sail of the english channel commodore rogers reluctantly turned southward reaching madeira july twenty first thence he cruised toward the azores and by the grand banks home there being considerable sickness on the ships on august thirty first he reached boston after a very unfortunate cruise in which he had made but seven prizes all merchantmen and had recaptured one american vessel on july third the essex thirty two captain david porter put out of new york 
as has been already explained she was most inefficiently armed almost entirely with carronades this placed her at the mercy of any frigate with long guns which could keep at a distance of a few hundred yards but in spite of captain porter's petitions and remonstrances he was not allowed to change his armament on the eleventh of july at two a m latitude thirty three degrees north longitude sixty six degrees west the essex fell in with the minerva thirty two captain richard hawkins convoying seven transports each containing about two hundred troops bound from barbados to quebec the convoy was sailing in open order and there being a dull moon the essex ran in and cut out transport number two ninety nine with one hundred ninety seven soldiers aboard having taken out the soldiers captain porter stood back to the convoy expecting captain hawkins to come out and fight him but this the latter would not do keeping the convoy in close order around him the transports were all armed and still contained in the aggregate twelve hundred soldiers as the essex could only fight at close quarters these heavy odds rendered it hopeless for her to try to cut out the minerva her carronades would have to be used at short range to be effective and it would of course have been folly to run in among the convoy and expose herself to the certainty of being boarded by five times as many men as she possessed the minerva had three less guns aside and on her spar deck carried twenty four pound carronades instead of thirty twos and moreover had fifty men less than the essex which had about two hundred seventy men this cruise on the other hand her main deck was armed with long twelves so that it is hard to say whether she did right or not in refusing to fight she was of the same force as the southampton whose captain sir james lucas yeo subsequently challenged porter but never appointed a meeting place in the event of a meeting the advantage in ships of such radically different armaments would have been with that captain who succeeded in outmanoeuvring the other and in making the fight come off at the distance best suited to himself at long range either the minerva or southampton would possess an immense superiority but if porter could have contrived to run up within a couple of hundred yards or still better to board his superiority in weight of metal and number of men would have enabled him to carry either of them porter's crew was better trained for boarding than almost any other american commanders and probably none of the british frigates on the american station except the shannon and the tenedos would have stood a chance with the essex in a hand-to-hand struggle among her youngest midshipmen was one by the name david glasgow farragut then but thirteen years old who afterward became the first and greatest admiral of the united states his own words on this point will be read with interest every day he says footnote life of farragut embodying his journal and letters page thirty one by his son loyal farragut new york eighteen seventy nine end of footnote the crew were exercised at the great guns small arms and single stick and i may here mention the fact that i have never been on a ship where the crew of the old essex was represented but that i found them to be the best swordmen on board they had been so thoroughly trained as boarders that every man was prepared for such an emergency with his cutlass as sharp as a razor a dirk made by the ship's armourer out of a file and a pistol footnote james says had captain porter really endeavoured to bring the minerva to action 
we do not see what could have prevented the Essex, with her superiority of sailing, from coming alongside of her. But no such thought, we are sure, entered into Captain Porter's head. What prevented the Essex was the Minerva's not venturing out of the convoy. Farragut, in his journal, writes, The captured British officers were very anxious for us to have a fight with the Minerva as they considered her a good match for the Essex, and Captain Porter replied that he should gratify them with pleasure if His Majesty's commander was of their taste. So we stood toward the convoy, and when within gunshot hove to and awaited the Minerva, but she tacked and stood in among the convoy, to the utter amazement of our prisoners, who denounced the commander as a base coward and expressed their determination to report him to the admiralty an incident of reported flinching like this is not worth mentioning i allude to it only to show the value of james's sneers End of footnote. on august thirteenth the sail was made out to windward which proved to be the British ship Sloop Alert 16, Captain T. L. O. Langhorn, carrying twenty eighteen pound carronade and one hundred men. Footnote James History, volume six, page one twenty eight, says eighty six men. In the naval archives at Washington, in the Captain's Letters for eighteen twelve, volume N number 182 can be found enclosed in porter's letter the parole of the officers and crew of the alert signed by captain langhorn it contains either one hundred or one hundred one names of the crew of the alert besides those of a number of other prisoners sent back in the same cartel as soon as the essex discovered the alert she put out drags astern and led the enemy to believe she was trying to escape by sending a few men aloft to shake out the reefs and make sail concluding the frigate to be a merchantman the alert bore down on her while the americans went to quarters and cleared for action although the tompions were left in the guns and the ports kept closed footnote life of farragut page sixteen end of footnote the alert fired a gun and the essex hove to when the former passed under her stern and when on her lee quarter poured in a broadside of grape and canister but the sloop was so far abaft the frigate's beam that her shot did not enter the ports and caused no damage Thereupon Porter put up his helm and opened as soon as his guns would bear, tompions and all. The alert now discovered her error and made off, but too late, for in eight minutes the Essex was alongside, and the alert fired a musket and struck, three men being wounded and several feet of water in the hold she was disarmed and sent as a cartel into st john's it has been the fashion among american writers to speak of her as if she were unworthily given up but such an accusation is entirely groundless the essex was four times her force and all that could possibly be expected of her was to do as she did exchange broadsides and strike having suffered some loss and damage the essex returned to new york on september seventh having made ten prizes containing four hundred twenty three men footnote before entering new york the essex fell in with a british force which in both porter's and farragut's works is said to have been composed of the acasta and shannon each of fifty guns and ringed of of twenty james says it was the shannon accompanied by a merchant vessel it is not a point of much importance as nothing came of the meeting and the shannon alone with her immensely superior armament ought to have been a match twice over for the essex 
although if James is right, as seems probable, it gives rather a comical turn to Porter's account of his extraordinary escape. End of footnote. The Belvedere, as has been stated, carried the news of the war to Halifax. On July 5th, Vice Admiral Sawyer dispatched a squadron to cruise against the United States, commanded by Philip Verbroek of the Shannon 38, having under him the Belvedere 36, Captain Richard Byron, Africa 64, Captain John Bastard, and Aeolus 32, Captain Lord James Townsend. On the ninth, while off Nantucket, they were joined by the Guerrier 38, Captain James Richard Dacre. On the 16th, the squadron fell in with and captured the American brig Nautilus 14, Lieutenant Crane, which, like all the little brigs, was overloaded with guns and men. She threw her lee guns overboard and made use of every expedient to escape, but to no purpose. At 3 p.m. of the following day, when the British ships were abreast of Barnegat, about four leagues offshore, a strange sail was seen and immediately chased in the south by east or windward quarter, standing to the northeast. This was the United States frigate Constitution 44, Captain Isaac Hull. Footnote. For the ensuing chase, I have relied mainly on Cooper. See also Memoir of Admiral Broke, page 240. James, volume 6, page 133, and Marshall's Naval Biography, London, 1825, volume 2, page 625, end of footnote. When the war broke out, he was in the Chesapeake River, getting a new crew aboard. Having shipped over 450 men, counting officers, he put out of harbor on the 12th of July. His crew was entirely new drafts of men coming on board up to the last moment. Footnote. In a letter to the Secretary of the Navy, Captain's Letters, 1812, Volume 2, Number 85, Hull, after speaking of the way his men were arriving, says, The crew are as yet unacquainted with a ship of war, as many have but lately joined, and have never been on an armed ship before. We are doing all that we can to make them acquainted with their duty, and in a few days we shall have nothing to fear from any single-decked ship. End of footnote. On the 17th at 2 p.m., Hull discovered four sail in the northern board, heading to the westward. At three, the wind being very light, the Constitution made sail and tacked in eighteen and a half fathoms. At four, in the northeast, a fifth sail appeared, which afterward proved to be the Guerriere. The first four ships bore north-northwest and were all on the starboard tack, while at six o'clock the fifth bore east-northeast. At six-fifteen the wind shifted and blew lightly from the south bringing the American ship to windward. She then wore round with her head to the eastward, set her light studding sails and stay sails, and at 7.30 beat to action, intending to speak the nearest vessel, the Guerriere. The two frigates neared one another gradually, and at 10 the Constitution began making signals, which she continued for over an hour. At 3.30 a.m. on the 18th, the Guerriere, going gradually toward the Constitution on the port tack, and but one half mile distant, discovered on her lee beam the Belvedere and the other British vessels, and signaled to them. They did not answer the signals, thinking she must know who they were, a circumstance which afterward gave rise to sharp recriminations among the captains, and Dacre, 
concluding them to be commodore rogers squadron tacked and then wore round and stood away from the constitution for some time before discovering his mistake at five a m hull had just enough steerage way on to keep his head to the east on the starboard tack on his lee quarter bearing northeast by north were the belvedere and the guerriere and astern the shannon aeolus and africa at five thirty it fell entirely calm and hull put out his boats to tow the ship always going southward at the same time he whipped up a twenty four from the main deck and got the forecastle chaser aft cutting away the taffrail to give the two guns more freedom to work in and also running out through the cabin windows two of the long main decks twenty fours the british boats were towing also at six a m a light breeze sprang up and the constitution set studding sails and staysails the shannon opened at her with her bow guns but ceased when she found she could not reach her at six thirty the wind having died away the shannon began to gain almost all the boats of the squadron towing her having sounded in twenty six fathoms lieutenant charles morris suggested to hull to try kedging all the spare rope was bent on to the cables paid out into the cutters and a kedge run out half a mile ahead and let go then the crew clapped on and walked away with the ship overrunning and tripping the kedge as she came up with the end of the line meanwhile fresh lines and another kedge were carried ahead and the frigate glided away from her pursuers at seven thirty a m a little breeze sprang up when the constitution set her ensign and fired a shot at the shannon it soon fell calm again and the shannon neared at nine ten a light air from southward struck the ship bringing her to windward as the breeze was seen coming her sails were trimmed and as soon as she obeyed her helm she was brought close up on the port tack the boats dropped in alongside those that belonged to the davits were run up while the others were just lifted clear of water by purchases on the spare spars stowed outboard where they could be used again at a minute's notice meanwhile on her lee beam the guerriere opened fire but her shot fell short and the americans paid not the slightest heed to it soon it again fell calm when hull had two thousand gallons of water started and again put out his boats to tow the shannon with some of the other boats of the squadron helping her gained on the constitution but by severe exertion was again left behind shortly afterward a slight wind springing up the belvedere gained on the other british ships and when it fell calm she was nearer to the constitution than any of her consorts their boats being put on to her footnote cooper speaks as if this was the shannon but from marshall's naval biography we learn that it was the belvedere at other times he confuses the belvedere with the guerriere captain hull of course could not accurately distinguish the names of his pursuers my account is drawn from a careful comparison of marshall cooper and james End of footnote. at ten thirty observing the benefit that the constitution had derived from warping captain byron did the same bending all his hawsers to one another and working two kedge anchors at the same time by paying the warp out through one hawse hole as it was run in through the other opposite having men from the other frigates aboard and a lighter ship to work captain byron at 
2 p.m. was near enough to exchange bow and stern chasers with the Constitution, out of range, however. Hull expected to be overtaken, and made every arrangement to try in such case to disable the first frigate before her consorts could close. But neither the Belvedere nor the Shannon dared to tow very near for fear of having her boats sunk by the Americans' stern chasers. The Constitution's crew showed the most excellent spirit. Officers and men relieved each other regularly, the former snatching their rest anywhere on deck, the latter sleeping at the guns. Gradually the Constitution drew ahead, but the situation continued most critical. All through the afternoon the British frigates kept towing and kedging, being barely out of gunshot. At 3 p.m. a light breeze sprung up and blew fitfully at intervals. Every puff was watched closely and taken advantage of to the utmost. At 7 in the evening the wind almost died out, and for four more weary hours the worn-out sailors towed and kedged. At 10.45 a little breeze struck the frigate when the boats dropped alongside and were hoisted up, accepting the first cutter. Throughout the night the wind continued very light, the Belvedere forging ahead till she was off the Constitution's lee beam, and at 4 a.m. on the morning of the 19th she tacked to the eastward, the breeze being light from the south by east. At 4.20 the Constitution tacked also, and at 5.15 the Aeolus, which had drawn ahead, passed on the contrary tack. Soon afterward the wind freshened so that Captain Hull took in his cutter. The Africa was now so far to leeward as to be almost out of the race. While the five frigates were all running on the starboard tack, with every stitch of canvas set. At 9 a.m. an American merchantman hove in sight and bore down upon the squadron. The Belvedere, by way of decoy, hoisted American colors. When the Constitution hoisted the British flag, the merchant vessel hauled off. The breeze continued light till noon, when Hull found he had dropped the British frigates well behind. The nearest was the Belvedere, exactly in his wake, bearing west-northwest, two and a half miles distant. The Shannon was on his lee, bearing north by west, one-half west, distant three and a half miles. The other two frigates were five miles off on the lee quarter. Soon afterward the breeze freshened, and old Ironsides drew slowly ahead from her foes her sails being watched and tended with the most consummate skill. At 4 p.m. the breeze again lightened, but even the Belvedere was now four miles astern and to leeward. At 6.45 there were indications of a heavy rain squall, which once more permitted Hull to show that in seamanship he excelled even the able captains against whom he was pitted. The crew was stationed, and everything kept fast till the last minute, when all was clued up just before the squall struck the ship. The light canvas was furled, a second reef taken in the mizzen topsail, and the ship almost instantly brought under short sail. The British vessels, seeing this, begun to let go and haul down without waiting for the wind and were steering on different tacks when the first gust struck them. But Hull, as soon as he got the weight of the wind sheeted home, hoisted his fore and main top gallant sails, and went off on an easy bowline at the rate of eleven knots. At seven forty sight was again obtained of the enemy, the squall having passed to leeward. The Belvedere, the nearest vessel, had altered her bearings two points to leeward, and was a long way astern. Next came the Shannon, the Guerriere and Aeolus were hull down, and the Africa, 
barely visible. The wind now kept light, shifting occasionally in a very baffling manner, but the Constitution gained steadily, wetting her sails from the sky sails to the courses. At six a.m. on the morning of the twentieth, the pursuers were almost out of sight, and at eight fifteen they abandoned the chase. Hull at once stopped to investigate the character of two strange vessels, but found them to be only Americans. Then, at midday, he stood toward the east and went into Boston on July 26th. End of Part 4Part 5 of The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5 In this case, Captain Isaac Hull was matched against five British captains, two of whom, Broke and Byron, were fully equal to any in their navy, and while the latter showed great perseverance, good seamanship, and ready imitation, there can be no doubt that the palm in every way belongs to the cool old Yankee. Every daring expedient known to the most perfect seamanship was tried and tried with success, and no victorious fight could reflect more credit on the conqueror than this three days' chase did on Hull. Later, on two occasions, the Constitution proved herself far superior in gunnery to the average British frigate. This time her officers and men showed that they could handle the sails as well as they could the guns. Hull outmaneuvered Broke and Byron as cleverly as a month later he outfought Dacre. His successful escape and a victorious fight were both performed in a way that place him above any single ship captain of war. End of footnote. On August 2nd, the Constitution made sail from Boston. Footnote. Letter of Captain Isaac Hull, August 28th, 1812. And stood to the eastward in hopes of falling in with some of the British cruisers. She was unsuccessful, however, and met nothing. Then she ran down to the Bay of Fundy, steered along the coast of Nova Scotia, and thence toward Newfoundland, and finally took her station off Cape Race in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where she took and burned two brigs of little value. On the 15th, she recaptured an American brig from the British ship sloop Avenger, though the latter escaped. Captain Hull manned his prize and sent her in. He then sailed southward, and on the night of the 18th spoke a Salem privateer, which gave him news of a British frigate to the south. Thither he stood, and at 2 p.m. on the 19th, in latitude 41 degrees 30 minutes north and 55 degrees west, made out a large sail bearing east-southeast and to leeward. Footnote, letter of Captain Isaac Hull, August 30th, 1812, end of footnote, which proved to be his old acquaintance, the frigate Guerriere, Captain Dacre. It was a cloudy day, and the wind was blowing fresh from the northwest. The Guerriere was standing by the wind on the starboard tack under easy canvas. Footnote, letter of Captain James R. Dacre, September 7th, 1812, end of footnote. She hauled up her courses, took in her top gallant sails, and at 4.30 backed her main topsail. Hull then very deliberately began to shorten sail, taking in top gallant sails, stay sails, and a flying jib, sending down the royal yards, and putting another reef in the topsails. Soon the Englishman hoisted three ensigns, when the American also set her colors, one at each masthead and one at the mizzen peak. 
the constitution ran down with the wind nearly aft the guerriere was on the starboard tack and at five o'clock opened with her weather guns footnote log of guerriere end of footnote the shot falling short then wore round and fired her port broadside of which two shot struck her opponent the rest passing over and through her rigging footnote see in the naval archives bureau of navigation the constitution's log book volume two from february first eighteen twelve to december thirteenth eighteen thirteen the point is of some little importance because hall in his letter speaks as if both the first broadsides fell short whereas the log distinctly says that the second went over the ship except two shot which came home the hypothesis of the guerriere having damaged powder was founded purely on this supposed falling short of the first two broadsides End of footnote as the british frigate again wore to open with her starboard battery the constitution yawed a little and fired two or three of her port bow guns three or four times the guerriere repeated this manoeuvre wearing and firing alternate broadsides but with little or no effect while the constitution yawed as often to avoid being raked and occasionally fired one of her bow guns this continued nearly an hour as the vessels were very far apart when the action began hardly any loss or damage being inflicted by either party at six o'clock the guerriere bore up and ran off under her topsails and jib with the wind almost astern a little on her port quarter when the constitution set her main top gallant sails and foresail and at six o five closed within half pistol shot distance on her adversary's port beam footnote autobiography of commodore morris annapolis eighteen eighteen page one sixty four and a footnote immediately a furious cannonade opened each ship firing as the guns bore by the time the ships were fairly abreast at six twenty the constitution shot away the guerriere's mizzenmast which fell over the starboard quarter knocking a large hole in the counter and bringing the ship round against her helm hitherto she had suffered very greatly and the constitution hardly at all the latter finding that she was ranging ahead put her helm aport and then luffed short round her enemy's bows footnote log of constitution and a footnote delivering a heavy raking fire with the starboard guns and shooting away the guerriere's main yard then she wore and again passed her adversary's bows raking with her port guns the mizzenmast of the guerriere dragging in the water had by this time pulled her bow round till the wind came on her starboard quarter and so near were the ships that the englishman's bowsprit passed diagonally over the constitution's quarter-deck and as the latter ship fell off it got foul of her mizzen rigging and the vessels then lay with the guerriere's starboard bow against the constitution's port or lee quarter gallery footnote cooper in putnam's magazine volume one page four seventy five and of footnote the englishman's bow guns played havoc with captain hull's cabin setting fire to it but the flames were soon extinguished by lieutenant hoffman on both sides the boarders were called away the british ran forward but captain dacre relinquished the idea of attacking footnote address of captain dacre to the court-martial at halifax and a footnote when he saw the crowds of men on the american's deck meanwhile on the constitution the boarders and marines gathered aft but such a heavy sea was running that they could not get on the guerriere 
both sides suffered heavily from the closeness of the musketry fire indeed almost the entire loss on the constitution occurred at this juncture as lieutenant bush of the marines sprang upon the taffrail to leap on the enemy's deck a british marine shot him dead mr morris the first lieutenant and mr alwyn the master had also both leaped on the taffrail and both were at the same moment wounded by the musketry fire on the guerriere the loss was far heavier almost all the men on the forecastle being picked off captain dacre himself was shot at the back and severely wounded by one of the american mizzen topmen while he was standing on the starboard forecastle hammocks cheering on his crew footnote james volume six page one forty four end of footnote two of the lieutenants and the master were also shot down the ships gradually worked round till the wind was again on the port quarter when they separated and the guerriere's foremast and mainmast at once went by the board and fell over on the starboard side leaving her a defenceless hulk rolling her main deck guns into the water footnote brenton volume five page fifty one end of footnote at six thirty the constitution hauled aboard her tacks ran off a little distance to the eastward and lay to her braces and standing and running rigging were much cut up and some of the spars wounded but a few minutes sufficed to repair damages when captain hull stood under his adversary's lee and the latter at once struck at seven p m footnote log of the constitution end of footnote just two hours after she had fired the first shot on the part of the constitution however the actual fighting exclusive of six or eight guns fired during the first hour while closing occupied less than thirty minutes comparative force the constitution one thousand five hundred seventy six tons twenty seven guns six hundred eighty four pound broadside four hundred fifty six men fourteen loss comparative force one point zero zero comparative loss inflicted one point zero zero the guerriere thirteen hundred thirty eight tons twenty five guns five hundred fifty six weight broadside two hundred seventy two men seventy nine loss comparative force point seven zero comparative loss inflicted point eighteen the loss of the constitution included lieutenant william s bush of the marines and six seamen killed and her first lieutenant charles morris master john c alwyn four seamen and one marine wounded total seven killed and seven wounded almost all this loss occurred when the ships came afoul and was due to the guerriere's musketry and the two guns in her bridle ports the guerriere lost twenty-three killed and mortally wounded including her second lieutenant henry reddy and fifty-six wounded severely and slightly including captain dacre himself the first lieutenant bartholomew kent master robert scott two masters mates and one midshipman the third lieutenant of the constitution mr george campbell reed was sent on board the prize and the constitution remained by her during the night but at daylight it was found that she was in danger of sinking captain hull at once began removing the prisoners and at three o'clock in the afternoon set the guerriere on fire and in a quarter of an hour she blew up he then set sail for boston where he arrived on august thirtieth captain hull and his officers writes captain dacre in his official letter have treated us like brave and generous enemies the greatest care has been taken that we should not lose the smallest trifle the british laid a very great stress on the rotten and decayed condition of the guerriere 
mentioning in particular that the mainmast fell solely because of the weight of the falling foremast but it must be remembered that until the action occurred she was considered a very fine ship thus in brighton's memoir of admiral broke it is declared that dacre freely expressed the opinion that she could take a ship in half the time the shannon could the fall of the mainmast occurred when the fight was practically over it had no influence whatever on the conflict it was also asserted that her powder was bad but on no authority her first broadside fell short but so under similar circumstances did the first broadside of the united states none of these causes account for the fact that her shot did not hit her opponent was of such superior force nearly in the proportion of three to two that success would have been very difficult in any event and no one can doubt the gallantry and pluck with which the british ship was fought but the execution was very greatly disproportioned to the force the gunnery of the guerriere was very poor and that of the constitution excellent during the few minutes the ships were yard-arm and yard-arm the latter was not hulled once while no less than thirty shot took effect on the former's engaged side footnote captain dacre's address to the court-martial and a footnote five sheets of copper beneath the bends the guerriere moreover was out manoeuvred in wearing several times and exchanging broadsides in such rapid and continual changes of position her fire was much more harmless than it would have been if she had kept more steady footnote lord howard douglas treatise on naval gunnery london eighteen fifty one page four fifty four and a footnote the constitution was handled faultlessly captain hull displayed the coolness and the skill of a veteran in the way in which he managed first to avoid being raked and then to improve the advantage which the precision and rapidity of his fire had gained after making every allowance claimed by the enemy the character of this victory is not essentially altered its peculiarities were a fine display of seamanship in the approach extraordinary efficiency in the attack and great readiness in repairing damages all of which denote cool and capable officers with an expert and trained crew in a word a disciplined man-of-war footnote cooper volume two page one seventy three and a footnote the disparity of force ten to seven is not enough to account for the disparity of execution ten to two of course something must be allowed for the decayed state of the englishman's masts although i really do not think it had any influence on the battle for he was beaten when the main mast fell and it must be remembered on the other hand that the american crew was absolutely new while the guerriere was manned by old hands so that while admitting and admiring the gallantry and on the whole the seamanship of captain dacre and his crew and acknowledging that he fought at a great disadvantage especially in being short-handed yet all must acknowledge that the combat showed a marked superiority particularly in gunnery on the part of the americans had the ships not come foul captain hull would probably not have lost more than three or four men as it was he suffered but slightly that the guerriere was not so weak as she was represented to be can be gathered from the fact that she mounted two more main deck guns than the rest of her class thus carrying on her main deck thirty long eighteen pounders in battery to oppose to the thirty long twenty fours or rather allowing for the short weight of shot long twenty-twos of the constitution 
characteristically enough james though he carefully reckons in the low bow chases in the bridle ports of the argus and enterprise yet refuses to count the two long eighteens mounted through the bridle ports on the guerrier's main deck now as it turned out these two bow guns were used very effectively when the ships got foul and caused more damage and loss than all of the other main deck guns put together captain dacre very much to his credit allowed the ten americans on board to go below so as not to fight against their flag and in his address to the court-martial mentions among the reasons for his defeat that he was very much weakened by permitting the americans on board to quit their quarters coupling this with the assertion made by james and most other british writers that the constitution was largely manned by englishmen we reach the somewhat remarkable conclusion that the british ship was defeated because the americans on board would not fight against their country and that the american was victorious because the british on board would however as i have shown in reality there were probably not a score of british on board the constitution in this as well as the two succeeding frigate actions every one must admit that there was a great superiority in force on the side of the victors and british historians have insisted that this superiority was so great as to preclude any hopes of a successful resistance that this was not true and that the disparity between the combatants was not as great as had been the case in a number of encounters in which english frigates had taken french ones can be best shown by a few accounts taken from the french historian trude who would certainly not exaggerate the difference thus on march first seventeen ninety nine the english thirty eight gun eighteen pound frigate sibylle captured the french forty four gun twenty four pounder frigate forte after an action of two hours and ten minutes footnote batille navale de la france o trude paris eighteen sixty eight volume four page one seventy one end of footnote in actual weight the shot thrown by one of the main deck guns of the defeated forte was over six pounds heavier than the shot thrown by one of the main deck guns of the victorious constitution or united states footnote c appendix b for actual weight of french shot end of footnote there are later examples than this but a very few years before the declaration of war by the united states and in the same struggle that was then still raging there had been at least two victories gained by english frigates over french foes as superior to themselves as the american forty fours were to the british ships they captured on august tenth eighteen o five the phoenix thirty six captured the didon forty after three and a half hours fighting the comparative broadside force being phoenix thirteen eighteen pounders two nine pounders six thirty two pounders twenty one total guns total pounds four hundred and forty four didon fourteen eighteen pounders two eight pounders seven thirty six pounders twenty three guns total five hundred and twenty two pounds total on march eighth eighteen o eight the san florenzo thirty six captured the piedmontese forty the force being exactly what it was in the case of the phoenix and didon footnote ibid page four ninety nine comparing the real not the nominal weight of metal we find that the didon and the piedmontese were proportionally of greater force compared to the phoenix and san florenzo than the constitution was compared to the guerriere or java the french eighteens threw each a shot weighing but about two pounds less than that thrown by an american twenty four of eighteen twelve while their thirty six pound carronades each threw a shot 
over ten pounds heavier than that thrown by one of the Constitution's spar deck thirty twos. That a twenty four pounder cannot always whip an eighteen pounder frigate is shown by the action of the British frigate Eurotus with the French frigate Florinde on february twenty fifth, eighteen fourteen. Footnote James, volume six, page three ninety one, end of footnote. The first with a crew of three hundred twenty nine men threw six hundred twenty five pounds of shot at a broadside, the latter carrying three hundred forty four men and throwing four hundred sixty three pounds. Yet the result was indecisive. The French lost ninety and the British sixty men. The action showed that heavy metal was not of much use unless used well. To appreciate rightly the exultation Hull's victory caused in the United States and the intense annoyance it created in England, it must be remembered that during the past twenty years the island power had been at war with almost every state in Europe at one time or another and in the course of about two hundred single conflicts between ships of approximately equal force that is where the difference was less than one half waged against french spanish italian turkish algerine russian danish and dutch antagonists her ships had been beaten and captured in but five instances then war broke out with america and in eight months five single-ship actions occurred, in every one of which the British vessel was captured. Even had the victories been due solely to superior force, this would have been no mean triumph for the United States. On October 13, 1812, the American 18-gun ship sloop Wasp, Captain Jacob Jones, with 137 men aboard, sailed from the Delaware and ran off southeast to get into the track of the West India vessels. On the 16th, a heavy gale began to blow, causing the loss of the jib boom and two men who were on it. The next day the weather moderated somewhat, and at 11.30 p.m., in latitude 37 degrees north, longitude 65 degrees west, several sail were descried. Footnote, Captain Jones, official letter, November 24th, 1812, end of footnote. These were part of a convoy of 14 merchantmen, which had quitted the Bay of Honduras on September 12th, bound for England. Footnote, James's History, Volume 6, page 158, end of footnote. Under the convoy of the British 18-gun brig sloop Frolic of 19 guns and 110 men, Captain Thomas Winyates. They had been dispersed by the gale of the 16th, during which the Frolic's main yard was carried away and both her topsails torn to pieces. Footnote, Captain Winyates, official letter October 18, 1812, and a footnote. Next day she spent in repairing damages, and by dark six of the missing ships had joined her. The day broke almost cloudless on the 18th, Sunday, showing the convoy ahead and to leeward of the American ship, still some distance off, as Captain Jones had not thought it prudent to close during the night while he was ignorant of the force of his antagonists. The wasp now sent down to her topgallant yards, close reefed her topsails and bore down under short fighting canvas. While the frolic removed her main yard from the casks, lashed it on deck, and then hauled to the wind under her boom mainsail and close reefed fore topsail, hoisting Spanish colors to decoy the stranger under her guns and permit the convoy to escape. At 11.32 the action began, the two ships running parallel on the starboard tack, not sixty yards apart, the wasp firing her port and the frolic her starboard guns. The latter fired very rapidly, delivering three broadsides, 
to the wasps too. Footnote Cooper, page 182, end of footnote. Both crews cheering loudly as the ships wallowed through the water. There was a very heavy sea running, which caused the vessels to pitch and roll heavily. The Americans fired as the engaged side of her ship was going down, aiming at their opponent's hull. Footnote. Miles Register. Page 324. End of footnote. While the British delivered their broadsides, while on the crests of the seas, the shot going high. The water dashed in clouds of spray over both crews, and the vessels rolled so that the muzzles of the guns went under. But in spite of the rough weather, the firing was not only spirited, but well directed. At 11.36 the wasp's main top mast was shot away and fell, with its yard across the port fore and foretop sail braces, rendering the head yards unmanageable. At 11.46 the gaff and mizzen top gallant mast came down, and by 11.52 Every brace and most of the rigging was shot away. Footnote, Captain Jones's letter. End of footnote. It would now have been very difficult to brace any of the yards. But meanwhile the frolic suffered it dreadfully in her hull and lower masts, and had her gaff and head braces shot away. Footnote, Captain Winniate's letter. End of footnote. The slaughter among her crew was very great, but the survivors kept at their work with the dogged courage of their race. At first the two vessels ran side by side, but the American gradually forged ahead, throwing in her fire from a position in which she herself received little injury. By degrees the vessels got so close that the Americans struck the frolic's side with their rammers in loading. Footnote captain jones's letter end of footnote and the british brig was raked with dreadful effect the frolic then fell aboard her antagonist her jib boom coming in between the main and mizzen rigging of the wasp and passing over the heads of captain jones and lieutenant biddle who were standing near the capstan this forced the wasp up in the wind and she again raked her antagonist Captain Jones trying to restrain his men from boarding till he could put in another broadside, but they could no longer be held back, and Jack Lang, a New Jersey seaman, leaped on the frolic's bowsprit. Lieutenant Biddle then mounted on the hammock cloth to board, but his feet got entangled in the rigging, and one of the midshipmen seizing his coat-tails to help himself up, the lieutenant stumbled back on the deck. At the next swell he succeeded in getting on the bow spirit, on which there were already two seamen whom he passed on the forecastle. But there was no one to oppose him. Not twenty Englishmen were left unhurt. Footnote. Captain Winniate's letter. End of footnote. The man at the wheel was still at his post, grim and undaunted, and two or three more were on deck including Captain Winniates and Lieutenant Wintle, both so severely wounded that they could not stand without support. Footnote, James, volume 6, page 161. There could be no more resistance, and Lieutenant Biddle lowered the flag at 12.15, just 43 minutes after the beginning of the fight. Footnote, Captain Jones's letter, end of footnote. A minute or two afterward, both of the frolic's masts went by the board, the foremast about fifteen feet above the deck, the other short off. Of her crew, as already said, not twenty men had escaped unhurt. Every officer was wounded, two of them, the first lieutenant, Charles Mackay, and Master John Stevens, soon died. Her total loss was thus over ninety footnote captain winniate's official letter thus states it and is of course to be taken as authority the bermuda account makes it sixty nine and james only sixty two and a footnote about thirty of whom were killed outright or died later 
the wasp suffered very severely in her rigging and aloft generally but only two or three shots struck her hull five of her men were killed two in her mizzen top and one in her main top mast rigging and five wounded footnote captain jones's letter and footnote chiefly while aloft the two vessels were practically of equal force the loss of the frolic's main yard had merely converted her into a brigantine and as the roughness of the sea made it necessary to fight under very short canvas her inferiority in men was fully compensated for by her superiority in metal she had been desperately defended no men could have fought more bravely than captain winniates and his crew on the other hand the americans had done their work with a coolness and skill that could not be surpassed the contest had been mainly one of gunnery and had been decided by the greatly superior judgment and accuracy with which they fired both officers and crew had behaved well captain jones particularly mentions lieutenant claxton who though too ill to be of any service persisted in remaining on deck throughout the engagement the wasp was armed with two long twelves and sixteen thirty-two pound carronades the frolic with two long sixes sixteen thirty-two pound carronades and one shifting twelve pound carronade comparative force the wasp four hundred and fifty tons nine guns two hundred and fifty pounds total weight one hundred and thirty five crew ten loss the frolic four hundred and sixty seven tons ten guns two hundred and seventy four total metal weight crew one hundred and ten loss ninety vice admiral urien de la gravier comments on this action as follows footnote guerres maritime volume two page two eighty seven septem edition paris eighteen eighty one end of footnote the american fire showed itself to be as accurate as it was rapid on occasions when the roughness of the sea would seem to render all aim excessively uncertain the effects of their artillery were not less murderous than under more advantageous conditions the corvette wasp fought the brig frolic in an enormous sea under very short canvas and yet forty minutes after the beginning of the action when the two vessels came together the americans who leaped aboard the brig found on the deck covered with dead and dying but one brave man who had not left the wheel and three officers all wounded who threw down their swords at the feet of the victors admiral de la gravier's criticisms are especially valuable because they are those of an expert who only refers to the war of eighteen twelve in order to apply to the french navy the lessons which it teaches and who is perfectly unprejudiced he cares for the lesson taught not the teacher and is quite as willing to learn from the defeat of the chesapeake as from the victories of the constitution while most american critics only pay heed to the latter the characteristics of the action are the practical equality of the contestants in point of force and the enormous disparity in the damage each suffered numerically the wasp was superior by five per cent and inflicted a ninefold greater loss captain jones was not destined to bring his prize into port for a few hours afterwards the poictier a british seventy four captain john power beresford hove in sight now appeared the value of the frolic's desperate defence if she could not prevent herself from being captured she had at least ensured her own recapture and also the capture of the foe when the wasp shook out her sails they were found to be cut into ribbons aloft and she could not make off with sufficient speed as the poictier passed the frolic 
rolling like a log in the water. She threw a shot over her and soon overtook the wasp. Both vessels were carried into Bermuda. Captain Winniates was again put in command of the frolic. Captain Jones and his men were soon exchanged. Twenty-five thousand dollars prize money was voted to them by Congress, and Captain and Lieutenant Biddle were both promoted, the former receiving the captured ship Macedonian. Unluckily, the blockade was too close for him to succeed in getting out during the remainder of the war. On October 8th, Commodore Rogers left Boston on his second cruise with the President, United States, Congress, and Argus. Footnote letter of Commodore Rogers, January 1st, 1813, end of footnote, leaving the Hornet in port. Four days out, the United States and Argus separated, while the remaining two frigates continued their cruise together. The Argus, footnote, letter of Captain Arthur Sinclair, January 4th, 1813, end of footnote. Captain Sinclair cruised to the eastward, making prizes of six valuable merchantmen, and returned to port on January 3rd. During the cruise she was chased for three days and three nights, the latter being moonlight, by a British squadron, and was obliged to cut away her boats and anchors and start some of her water. But she saved her guns, and was so cleverly handled, during the chase she actually succeeded in taking and manning a prize, though the enemy got near enough to open fire as the vessels separated. Before relating what befell the United States, we shall bring Commodore Rogers' cruise to an end. On October 10th, the Commodore chased, but failed to overtake the British frigate Nymph 38, Captain Epworth. On the 18th, off the great bank of Newfoundland, he captured the Jamaica packet Swallow, homeward bound with $200,000 in specie aboard. On the 31st, at 9 a.m., latitude 33 degrees north, longitude 32 degrees west, his two frigates fell in with the British frigate Galatia 36, Captain Woodley Losack convoying two South Sea ships to windward. The Galatea ran down to reconnoitre and at 10 a.m., recognizing her foes, hauled up on the starboard tack to escape. The American frigates made all sail in chase and continued beating to windward, tacking several times for about three hours. Seeing that she was being overhauled, the Galatea now edged away to get on her best point of sailing. At the same moment, one of her convoy, the Argo, bore up to cross the hawse of her foes, but was intercepted by the Congress, who lay to to secure her. Meanwhile, the President kept after the Galatea. She set her topmast, topgallant mast, and lower studding sails, and when it was dusk had gained greatly upon her but the night was very dark. The President lost sight of the chase, and toward midnight hauled to the wind to rejoin her consort. The two frigates cruised to the east as far as 22 degrees west, and then ran down to 17 degrees north. But during the month of November they did not see a sail. They had but slightly better luck on their return toward home passing 120 miles north of Bermuda and cruising a little while toward the Virginia Capes, they re-entered Boston on December 31st, having made nine prizes, most of them of little value. When four days out on October 12th, Commodore Decatur had separated from the rest of Rogers' squadron and cruised east. On the 25th, in latitude 29 degrees north and longitude 29 degrees 30 minutes west, while going close hauled on the port tack, with the wind fresh from the south-southeast. 
a sail was descried on the weather beam about twelve miles distant footnote official letter of commodore decatur october thirtieth eighteen twelve end of footnote this was the british thirty eight gun frigate macedonian captain john surnam carden she was not like the guerriere an old ship captured from the french but newly built of oak and larger than any american eighteen pounder frigate she was reputed very wrongfully to be a crack ship according to lieutenant david hope the state of discipline on board was excellent in no british ship was more attention paid to gunnery before this cruise the ship had been engaged almost every day with the enemy and in time of peace the crew was constantly exercised at the great guns footnote marshall's naval biography volume four page one thousand eighteen end of footnote how they could have practised so much and learned so little is certainly marvellous the macedonian set her foretop mast and tap gallant studding sails and bore away in chase footnote captain carden to mr croker october twenty eighth eighteen twelve end of footnote edging down with the wind a little aft the starboard beam her first lieutenant wished to continue on this course and pass down ahead of the united states footnote james volume six page one sixty five but captain carden's over anxiety to keep the weather gauge lost him this opportunity of closing footnote sentence of court-martial held on the san domingo seventy four at the bermudas may twenty seventh eighteen twelve and a footnote accordingly he hauled by the wind and passed way to windward of the american as commodore decatur got within range he eased off and fired a broadside most of which fell short footnote marshal volume four page one thousand eighty and a footnote he then kept his luff and the next time he fired his long twenty-fours told heavily while he received very little injury himself footnote cooper eleven page one seventy eight and a footnote the friar from his main deck for he did not use his carronades at all for the first half hour footnote letter of commodore decatur and a footnote was so very rapid that it seemed as if the ship was on fire his broadsides were delivered with almost twice the rapidity of those of the englishmen footnote james volume six page one sixty nine and a footnote the latter soon found he could not play at long bowls with any chance of success and having already erred either from timidity or bad judgment captain carden decided to add rashness to the catalogue of his virtues accordingly he bore up and came down end on toward his adversary with the wind on his port quarter the states now ten fifteen laid her main topsail aback and made heavy play with her long guns and as her adversary came nearer with her cannonades also the british ship would reply with her starboard guns hauling up to do so as she came down the american would ease off run a little way and again come to keeping up a terrific fire as the macedonian bore down to close the chocks of all her forecastle guns which were mounted on the outside were cut away footnote letter of captain carden and of footnote her fire caused some damage to the american's rigging but hardly touched her hull while she herself suffered so heavily both alow and aloft that she gradually dropped to leeward while the american forereached on her finding herself ahead and to windward the states tacked and ranged up under her adversary's lee 
when the latter struck her colors at eleven fifteen just an hour and a half after the beginning of the action footnote letter of commodore decatur End of footnote. the united states had suffered surprisingly little what damage had been done was aloft her mizzen top gallant mast was cut away some of the spars were wounded and the rigging a good deal cut the hull was only struck two or three times the ships were never close enough to be within fair range of grape and musketry footnote letter of commodore decatur and a footnote and the wounds were mostly inflicted by round shot and were thus apt to be fatal hence the loss of the americans amounted to lieutenant john messer funk fifth of the ship and six seamen killed or mortally wounded and only five severely and slightly wounded the macedonian on the other hand had received over a hundred shot in her hull several between wind and water her mizzenmast had gone by the board her fore and maintop masts had been shot away by the caps and her main yard in the slings almost all her rigging was cut away only the foresail being left on the engaged side all of her carronades but two and two of her main deck guns were dismounted of her crew forty three were killed and mortally wounded and sixty one including her first and third lieutenants severely and slightly wounded footnote letter of captain carden and a footnote among her crew were eight americans as shown by her muster roll these asked permission to go below before the battle but it was refused by captain carden and three were killed during the action james says that they were allowed to go below but this is untrue for if they had the three would not have been slain the others testified that they had been forced to fight and they afterward entered the american service the only ones of the macedonian crew who did or who were asked to the macedonian had her full complement of three hundred one men the states had by her muster roll of october twentieth four hundred twenty eight officers petty officers seamen and boys and fifty officers and privates of marines a total of four hundred seventy eight instead of five hundred nine as marshall in his naval biography makes it comparative force the united states one thousand five hundred seventy six tons twenty seven guns seven hundred eighty six pounds of metal four hundred seventy eight men twelve lost macedonian thirteen hundred twenty five tons twenty five guns five hundred forty seven pounds of metal three hundred one men one hundred and four lost comparative loss inflicted states one hundred one hundred macedonian sixty six eleven that is the relative force being about as three is to two footnote i have considered the united states as mounting her full allowance of fifty four guns but it is possible that she had no more than forty nine in decatur's letter of challenge of january seventeenth eighteen fourteen which challenge by the way was a most blustering affair reflecting credit neither on decatur nor his opponent captain hope nor on any one else excepting captain stockpole of h m s statira she is said to have had that number her broadside would then be fifteen long twenty fours below one long twenty four one twelve pounder and eight forty two pound carronades above a real broadside weight of metal would thus be about six hundred eighty pounds and she would be superior to the macedonian in the proportion of five to four but it is possible that decatur had landed some of his guns in eighteen thirteen 
as James asserts, and though I am not at all sure of this, I have thought it best to be on the safe side in describing his force. End of footnote. The damage done was as nine to one. Of course, it would have been almost impossible for the Macedonian to conquer with one-third less force, but the disparity was by no means sufficient to account for the ninefold greater loss suffered, and the ease and impunity with which the victory was won. The British sailors fought with their accustomed courage, but their gunnery was exceedingly poor, and it must be remembered that though the ship was bravely fought, still the defence was by no means so desperate as that made by the Essex or even the Chesapeake, as witnessed by their respective losses. The Macedonian, moreover, was surrendered when she had suffered less damage than either the Guerriere or the Java. The chief cause of her loss lay in the fact that Captain Carden was a poor commander. The gunnery of the Java, Guerriere, and Macedonian was equally bad, but while Captain Lambert proved himself to be as able as he was gallant, and Captain Dacre did nearly as well, Captain Carden, on the other hand, was first too timid and then too rash, and showed a bad judgment at all times. By continuing his original course he could have closed at once, but he lost his chance by over-anxiety to keep the weather gauge, and was censured by the court-martial accordingly. Then he tried to remedy one error by another, and made a foolishly rash approach. A very able and fair-minded English writer says of this action, As a display of courage the character of the service was nobly upheld, but we would be deceiving ourselves were we to admit that the comparative expertness of the crews in gunnery was equally satisfactory. Now, taking the difference of effect as given by Captain Carden, we must draw this conclusion, that the comparative loss in killed and wounded, 104 to 12, together with the dreadful account he gives of the condition of his own ship, while he admits that the enemy's vessel was in comparatively good order, must have arisen from inferiority in gunnery as well as in force. Footnote. Lord Howard Douglas, Naval Gunnery, page 525. End of part 5part 6 of the naval war of 1812 by theodore roosevelt this librivox recording is in the public domain part 6 on the other hand the american crew even according to james were as fine a set of men as ever were seen on shipboard though not one fourth were british by birth yet many of them had served on board british ships of war in some cases voluntarily but much more often because they were impressed. They had been trained at the guns with the greatest of care by Lieutenant Allen, and finally Commodore Decatur handled his ship with absolute faultlessness. To sum up, a brave and skilful crew, ably commanded, was matched against an equally brave but unskilful one, with an incompetent leader and this accounts for the disparity of loss being so much greater than the disparity in force. At the outset of this battle the position of the parties was just the reverse of that in the case of the Constitution and Guerriere. The Englishman had the advantage of the wind, but he used it in a very different manner from that in which Captain Hull had done. The latter at once ran down to close, but manoeuvred so cautiously that no damage could be done him till he was within pistol shot. Captain Carden did not try to close till after fatal indecision, and then made the attempt so heedlessly that he was cut to pieces before he got to close quarters. Commodore Decatur also manoeuvred more skilfully than Captain 
d'Acre, although the difference was less marked between these two. The combat was a plain cannonade. The states derived no advantage from the superior number of her men, for they were not needed. The marines in particular had nothing whatever to do, while they had been of the greatest service against the guerrière. The advantage was simply in metal, as ten is to seven. Lord Howard Douglas's criticisms on these actions seem to me only applicable in part. He says, page 524, The Americans would neither approach nor permit us to join in close battle until they had gained some extraordinary advantage from the superior faculties of their long guns in distant cannonade and from the intrepid uncircumspect and often very exposed approach of assailants who had long been accustomed to contemn all manoeuvring our vessels were crippled in distant cannonade from encountering rashly the serious disadvantage of making direct attacks the uncircumspect gallantry of our commanders led our ships unguardedly into the snares which wary caution had spread these criticisms are very just as regards the macedonian and i fully agree with them possibly reserving the right to doubt captain cardin's gallantry though readily admitting his uncircumspection but the case of the guerriere differed widely there the american ship made the attack while the british at first avoided close combat and so far from trying to cripple her adversary by a distant cannonade the constitution hardly fired a dozen times until within pistol shot this last point is worth mentioning because in a work on heavy ordnance by captain t f simmons r a london 1837 it is stated that the guerriere received her injuries before the closing mentioning especially the thirty shot below the water line whereas by the official accounts of both commanders the reverse was the case captain hull in his letter and lieutenant morris in his autobiography say they only fired a few guns before closing and captain dacre in his letter and captain brenton in his history say that not much injury was received by the guerriere until about the time the mizzenmast fell which was three or four minutes after close action began lieutenant allen was put aboard the macedonian as prize master he secured the fore and main masts and rigged a jury mizzenmast converted the vessel into a bark commodore decatur discontinued his cruise to convoy his prize back to america he reached new london december fourth had it not been for the necessity of convoying the macedonian the states would have continued her cruise for the damage she suffered was of the most trifling character captain garden stated in marshall's naval biography that the states measured sixteen hundred seventy tons was manned by five hundred nine men suffered so from shot under the water that she had to be pumped out every watch and that two eighteen-pound shot passed in a horizontal line through her main masts all of which statements were highly creditable to the vividness of his imagination the states measured but fifteen hundred seventy six tons and by english measurement very much less had four hundred seventy eight men aboard had not been touched by a shot under water line and her lower masts were unwounded james states that most of her crew were british which assertion i have already discussed and that she had but one boy aboard and that he was seventeen years old in which case twenty-nine others some of whom as we learned from the life of decatur were only twelve must have grown with truly startling rapidity during the hour and a half that the combat lasted during the twenty years preceding eighteen twelve there had been almost incessant warfare on the ocean 
and although there had been innumerable single conflicts between French and English frigates, there had been but one case in which the French frigate, single-handed, was victorious. This was in the year 1805 when the Milan captured the Cleopatra. According to Trude, the former threw at a broadside 574 pounds actual, the latter but 334 and the former lost thirty-five men out of a crew of three hundred fifty, the latter fifty-eight out of two hundred. Or, the forces being as one hundred to fifty-eight, the loss inflicted was as one hundred to sixty, while the state's force, compared to the Macedonian, being as one hundred to sixty-six, the loss she inflicted was as one hundred to eleven. British ships, moreover, had often conquered against odds as great, as, for instance, when the seahorse captured the great Turkish frigate Bader Safer, when the Astria captured the French frigate Glois, which threw at a broadside 286 pounds of shot, while she threw but 174, and when, most glorious of all, Lord Dondonal, in the gallant little Speedy, actually captured a Spanish Zebec, the Gamo, of over five times her own force. Similarly, the corvette Camus captured the Danish frigate Frederick Scorn, the brig Onyx captured the Dutch sloop Manly, the little cutter Thorn captured the French courier national, and the Paisley the Spanish Virgin, while there has been many instances of drawn battles between English twelve-pound frigates and French or Spanish eighteen-pounders. Captain Hull having resigned the command of the Constitution, she was given to Captain Bainbridge of the Constellation, who was also entrusted with the command of the Essex and Hornet. The latter ship was in the port of Boston with the Constitution under the command of Captain Lawrence. The Essex was in the Delaware, and accordingly orders were sent to Captain Porter to rendezvous at the island of San Iago. If that failed, several other places were appointed, and if, after a certain time, he did not fall in with his commodore, he was to act at his own discretion. On October 26th the Constitution and Hornet sailed touched at the different rendezvous and on december thirteenth arrived off san salvador where captain lawrence found the bon citoyen eighteen captain pitt barnaby green the bon citoyen was armed with eighteen thirty two pound carronades and two long nines and her crew of one hundred fifty men was exactly equal in number to that of the hornet the latter's short weight in metal made her antagonist superior to her in about the same proportion that she herself was subsequently superior to the penguin, or, in other words, the ships were practically equal. Captain Lawrence now challenged Captain Green to single fight, giving the usual pledges that the Constitution should not interfere. The challenge was not accepted for a variety of reasons. Among others, the Bon Citoyen was carrying home half a million pounds in specie. Footnote. Brenton and James both deny that Captain Green was blockaded by the Hornet and claim that he feared the Constitution. James says, page 275, that the occurrence was one which the characteristic cunning of Americans turned greatly to their advantage and adds that Lawrence only sent the challenge because it could not be accepted, and so he would suffer no personal risk. He states that the reason it was sent, as well as the reason it was refused, was because the Constitution was going to remain in the offing and capture the British ship if she proved conqueror. It is somewhat surprising that even James should have had the temerity to advance such arguments. 
according to his own account page 277 the constitution left for boston on january 6th and the hornet remained blockading the mont citoyen till the 24th when the montague 74 arrived during these eighteen days there could have been no possible chance of the constitution or any other ship interfering and it is ridiculous to suppose that any such fear kept captain green from sailing out to attack his foe no doubt captain green's course was perfectly justifiable but it is curious that with all the assertions made by james as to the cowardice of the americans this is the only instance throughout the war in which a ship of either party declined a contest with an antagonist of equal force the cases of commodore rogers and sir george collier being evidently due simply to an overestimate of the opposing ships and a footnote leaving the hornet to blockade her commodore bainbridge ran off to the southward keeping the land in view at nine a m december twenty ninth eighteen twelve while the constitution was running along the coast of brazil about thirty miles off shore in latitude thirteen degrees six minutes south and longitude thirty one degrees west two strange sail were made footnote official letter of commodore bainbridge january third eighteen thirteen and a footnote in shore and to windward these were h b m frigate java captain lambert forty eight days out of spithead england with the captured ship william in company directing the latter to make for san salvador the java bore down in chase of the constitution footnote official letter of lieutenant chads december thirty first eighteen twelve and a footnote the wind was blowing light from the north northeast and there was very little sea on at ten the java made the private signals english spanish and portuguese in succession none being answered meanwhile the constitution was standing up toward the java on the starboard tack a little after eleven she hoisted her private signal and then being satisfied that the strange sail was an enemy she wore and stood off toward the southeast to draw her antagonist away from the land footnote log of the constitution end of footnote which was plainly visible the java hauled up and made sail on a parallel course the constitution bearing about three points on her lee bow the java gained rapidly being much the swifter at one thirty the constitution luffed up shortened her canvas to topsails topgallant sails jib and spanker and ran easily on the port tack heading toward the southeast she carried her commodore's pendant at the main national ensigns at the mizzen peak and main top gallant masthead and a jack at the fore the java also had taken in the mainsail and royals and came down an alaskan course on her adversary's weather quarter footnote lieutenant chad's address to the court-martial april twenty third eighteen thirteen and a footnote hoisting her ensign at the mizzen peak a union jack at the mizzen tap gallant masthead and another lashed to the main rigging at two p m the constitution fired a shot ahead of her following it quickly by a broadside footnote commodore bainbridge's letter and a footnote and the two ships began at long bowls the english firing the lee or starboard battery while the americans replied with their port guns the cannonade was very spirited on both sides the ships suffering about equally the first broadside of the java was very destructive killing and wounding several of the constitution crew the java kept edging down and the action continued with grape and musketry in addition the swifter british ship soon forereached and kept away intending to wear across her slower antagonist's bow and rake her 
but the latter wore in the smoke and the two combatants ran off to the westward the englishman still a weather and steering freer than the constitution which had luffed to close footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the action went on at pistol shot distance in a few minutes however the java again forged ahead out of the weight of her adversary's fire and then kept off as before to cross her bows and as before the constitution avoided this by wearing both ships again coming round with their heads to the east the american still to leeward the java kept the weather gauge tenaciously for reaching a little and whenever the constitution luffed up to close footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the former tried to rake her but her gunnery was now poor little damage being done by it most of the loss the americans suffered was early in the action by setting her foresail and mainsail the constitution got up close on the enemy's lee beam her fire being very heavy and carrying away the end of the jobber's bowsprit and her jib boom footnote lieutenant chad's letter and footnote the constitution forged ahead and repeated her former manoeuvre wearing in the smoke the java at once hove in stays but owing to the loss of headsail fell off very slowly and the american frigate poured a heavy raking broadside into her stern at about two cables length distance the java replied with her port guns as she fell off footnote lieutenant chad's letter and a footnote both vessels then bore up and ran off free with the wind on the port quarter the java being abreast and to windward of her antagonist both with their heads a little east of south the ships were less than a cable's length apart and the constitution inflicted great damage while suffering very little herself the british lost many men by the musketry of the american topmen and suffered still more from the round and grape especially on the forecastle footnote testimony of christopher speedy in minutes of the court-martial on board h m s gladiator at portsmouth april twenty third eighteen thirteen end of footnote many marked instances of valour being shown on both sides the java's masts were wounded and her rigging cut to pieces and captain lambert then ordered her to be laid aboard the enemy who was on her lee beam the helm was put aweather and the java came down for the constitution's main chains the boarders and marines gathered in the gangways and on the forecastle the boatswain having been ordered to cheer them up with his pipe that they might make a clean spring footnote testimony of james humble and a footnote the americans however raked the british with terrible effect cutting off their main topmast above the cap and their foremast near the cat harpings footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the stump of the java's bowsprit got caught in the constitution's mizzen rigging and before it got clear the british suffered still more finally the ships separated the java's bowsprit passing over the taffrail of the constitution the latter at once kept away to avoid being raked the ships again got nearly abreast but the constitution in her turn forereached whereupon commodore bainbridge war passed his antagonist luffed up under his quarter raked him with the starboard guns then war and recommenced the action with his port broadside at about three ten again the vessels were abreast and the action went on as furiously as ever the wreck of the top hamper on the java lay over her starboard side so that every discharge of her gun set her on fire footnote lieutenant chad's address and a footnote and in a few minutes her able and gallant 
commander was mortally wounded by a ball fired by one of the american main topmen footnote surgeon j c jones's report end of footnote the command then developed on the first lieutenant chads himself painfully wounded the slaughter had been terrible yet the british fought on with stubborn resolution cheering lustily but the success was now hopeless for nothing could stand against the cool precision of the yankee fire the stump of the java's foremast was carried away by a double-headed shot the mizzenmast fell the gaff and spanker boom were shot away also the main yard and finally the ensign was cut down by a shot and all her guns absolutely silenced when at four o five the constitution thinking her adversary had struck footnote log of the constitution as given in bainbridge's letter and footnote ceased firing hauled aboard her racks and passed across her adversary's bow to windward with her topsails jib and spanker set a few minutes afterward the java's mainmast fell leaving her a sheer hulk the constitution assumed a weatherly position and spent an hour in repairing damages and securing her masts then she wore and stood toward her enemy whose flag was again flying but only for bravado for as soon as the constitution stood across her forefoot she struck at five twenty five she was taken possession of by lieutenant parker first of the constitution in one of the latter's only two remaining boats the american ship had suffered comparatively little but a few round shot had struck her hull one of which carried away the wheel one eighteen-pounder went through the mizzenmast the foremast main topmast and a few other spars were slightly wounded and the running rigging and shrouds were a good deal cut but in an hour she was again in good fighting trim her loss amounted to eight seamen and one marine killed the fifth lieutenant john c alwyn and two seamen mortally commodore bainbridge and twelve seamen severely and seven seamen and two marines slightly wounded in all twelve killed and mortally wounded and twenty-two wounded severely and slightly footnote report of surgeon amos a evans and a footnote the java sustained unequalled injuries beyond the constitution says the british account footnote naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four hundred fifty two and a footnote these have already been given in detail she was a riddled and entirely dismasted hulk her loss for discussion of which see further on was forty eight killed including captain henry lambert who died soon after the close of the action and five midshipmen and one hundred two wounded among them lieutenant henry ducey chads lieutenant of marines david davies commander john marshall lieutenant james saunders the boatswain james humble master batty robinson and four midshipmen in this action both ships displayed equal gallantry and seamanship the java says commodore bainbridge was exceedingly well handled and bravely fought poor captain lambert was a distinguished and gallant officer and a most worthy man whose death i sincerely regret the manoeuvring on both sides was excellent captain lambert used the advantage which his ship possessed in her superior speed most skilfully always endeavouring to run across his adversary's bows and rake him when he had foreached and it was only owing to the equal skill which his antagonist displayed that he was foiled the length of the combat being due to the number of evolutions the great superiority of the americans was in their gunnery the fire of the java was both less rapid and less well directed than that of her antagonist the difference of force against her was not heavy being about as ten is to nine and was by no means enough to account for the almost five-fold greater loss she suffered the foregoing is a diagram of the battle it differs from both of the official accounts as these conflict greatly 
both as to time and as regards some of the evolutions. I generally take the mean in cases of difference. For example, Commodore Bainbridge's report makes the fight endure but one hour and fifty-five minutes. Lieutenant Chad's two hours and twenty-five minutes. I have made it two hours and ten minutes, etc., etc. The tonnage and weight of metal of the combatants have already been stated. I will give the compliments shortly. The following is the comparative force and loss. Tons, Constitution 1,576, Java 1,340. Weight of metal, Constitution 654, Java 576. Number of men, Constitution 475, the Java 426. Loss, Constitution 34, the Java 150. Relative force, Constitution 100, Java 89. Relative loss inflicted, Constitution 100, Java 23. In hardly another action of the war do the accounts of the respective forces differ so widely. The official British letter makes their total of men at the beginning of the action, 377, of whom Commodore Bainbridge officially reports that he paroled 378. The British state their loss in killed and mortally wounded at 24. Commodore Bainbridge reports that the dead alone amounted to nearly 60. Usually I have taken each commander's account of his own force and loss, and I should do so now if it were not that the British accounts differ among themselves, and whenever they relate to the Americans are flatly contradicted by the affidavits of the latter's officers. The British first handicapped themselves by the statement that the surgeon of the constitution was an irishman and lately an assistant surgeon in the british navy naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four fifty two which draws from surgeon amos a evans a solemn statement in the boston gazette that he was born in maryland and was never in the british navy in his life then Surgeon Jones of the Java, in his official report, after giving his own killed and mortally wounded at twenty-four, says that the Americans lost in all about sixty, and that four of their amputations perished under his own eyes. Whereupon Surgeon Evans makes the statement, Niles Register, Volume 6, page 35, backed up by affidavits of his brother officers, that in all he had but five amputations of whom only one died and that one a month after surgeon jones had left the ship to meet the assertions of lieutenant chads that he began action with but three hundred seventy seven men the constitution's officers produced the java muster roll dated november seventeenth or five days after she had sailed which showed four hundred forty six persons of whom twenty had been put on board a prize the presence of this large number of supernumeraries on board is explained by the fact that the java was carrying out lieutenant general hislop the newly appointed governor of bombay and his suite together with part of the crews for the cornwallis seventy four and gun sloops chameleon and icarus she also contained stores for those two ships besides conflicting with the american reports the british statements contradict one another the official published report gives but two midshipmen as killed while one of the volumes of the naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four fifty two contains a letter from one of the java's lieutenants in which he states that there were five finally commodore bainbridge found on board the constitution after the prisoners had left a letter from lieutenant h d cornick dated january first eighteen thirteen and addressed to lieutenant peter v wood twenty second regiment foot in which he states that sixty five of their men were killed james naval occurrences gets around this by stating that it was probably a forgery but aside from the improbability of commodore bainbridge being a forger 
this could not be so for nothing would have been easier than for the british lieutenant to have denied having written it which he never did on the other hand it would be very likely that in the heat of the action commodore bainbridge and the java's own officers should overestimate the latter's loss footnote for an account of shameless corruption then existing in the naval administration of great britain see lord dundonall's autobiography of a seaman the letters of the commanders were often garbled as is mentioned by brenton among numerous cases that he gives may be mentioned the cutting out of the chevrette where he distinctly says our loss was much greater than was ever acknowledged volume one page five hundred five edition of eighteen thirty seven end of footnote taking all these facts into consideration we find four hundred forty six men on board the java by her own muster list three hundred seventy eight of these were paroled by commodore bainbridge at san salvador twenty four men were acknowledged by the enemy to be killed or mortally wounded twenty were absent in a prize leaving twenty four unaccounted for who were undoubtedly slain the british loss was thus forty eight men killed and mortally wounded and one hundred two wounded severely and slightly the java was better handled and more desperately defended than the macedonian or even the guerriere and the odds against her were much smaller so she caused her opponent greater loss though her gunnery was no better than theirs lieutenant parker prize master of the java removed all the prisoners and baggage to the constitution and reported the prize to be in a very disabled state owing partly to this but more to the long distance from home and the great danger there was of a recapture commodore bainbridge destroyed her on the thirty first and then made sail for san salvador our gallant enemy reports lieutenant chads has treated us most generously and lieutenant-general hislop presented the commodore with a very handsome sword as a token of gratitude for the kindness with which he had treated the prisoners partly in consequence of his frigate's injuries but especially because of her decayed condition commodore bainbridge sailed from san salvador on january sixth eighteen thirteen reaching boston february twenty seventh after his four months cruise at san salvador he left the hornet still blockading the bon citoyen in order to see ourselves as others see us i shall again quote from admiral jurien de la graviere footnote guerres maritime volume two page two hundred eighty four paris eighteen eighty one end of footnote as his opinions are certainly well worthy of attention both as to these first three battles and as to the lessons they teach when the american congress declared war on england in eighteen twelve he says it seems as if this unequal conflict would crush her navy in the act of being born instead it but fertilized the germ it is only since that epoch that the united states has taken rank among maritime powers some combats of frigates corvettes and brigs insignificant without doubt as regards material results sufficed to break the charm which protected the standard of st george and taught europe what she could have already learned from some of our combats if the louder noise of our defeats had not drowned the glory that the only invincibles on the sea are good seamen and good artillerists the english covered the ocean with their cruisers when this unknown navy composed of six frigates and a few small craft hitherto hardly numbered dared to establish its cruisers at the mouth of the channel in the very centre of the british power 
but already the constitution had captured the guerriere and java the united states had made a prize of the macedonian the wasp of the frolic and the hornet of the peacock the honor of the new flag was established england humiliated tried to attribute her multiplied reverses to the unusual size of the vessels which congress had had constructed in seventeen ninety nine and which did the fighting of eighteen twelve she wished to refuse them the name of frigates and call them not without some appearance of reason disguised line of battleships since then all maritime powers have copied these gigantic models as the result of the war of eighteen twelve obliged england herself to change her naval material but if they had employed instead of frigates cut down seventy fours it would still be difficult to explain the prodigious success of the americans in an engagement which terminated in less than half an hour the english frigate guerriere completely dismasted had fifteen men killed sixty-three wounded and more than thirty shot below the water-line she sank twelve hours after the combat the constitution on the contrary had but seven men killed and seven wounded and did not lose a mast as soon as she had replaced a few cut ropes and changed a few sails she was in condition even by the testimony of the british historian to take another guerriere the united states took an hour and a half to capture the macedonian and the same difference made itself felt in the damage suffered by the two ships the macedonian had her masts shattered two of her main deck and all her spar deck guns disabled more than a hundred shot had penetrated the hull and over a third of the crew had suffered by the hostile fire the american frigate on the contrary had to regret but five men killed and seven wounded her guns had been fired each sixty-six times to the macedonians thirty-six the combat of the constitution and the java lasted two hours and was the most bloody of these three engagements the java only struck when she had been raised like a sheer hulk she had twenty-two men killed and one hundred and two wounded this war should be studied with unceasing diligence the pride of two peoples to whom naval affairs are so generally familiar has cleared all the details and laid bare all the episodes and through the sneers which the victors should have spared merely out of care for their own glory at every step can be seen that great truth that there is only success for those who know how to prepare it it belongs to us to judge impartially these marine events too much exalted perhaps by a national vanity one is tempted to excuse the americans showed in the war of eighteen twelve a great deal of skill and resolution but if as they have asserted the chances had always been perfectly equal between them and their adversaries if they had only owed their triumphs to the intrepidity of hull decatur and bainbridge there would be for us but little interest in recalling the struggle we need not seek lessons in courage outside of our own history on the contrary what is to be well considered is that the ships of the united states constantly fought with chances in their favor and it is on this that the american government should found its true title to glory the americans in eighteen twelve had secured to themselves the advantage of a better organization than the english the fight between the constitution and the java illustrates best the proposition that there is only success for those who know how to prepare it here the odds in men and metal were only about ten to nine in favor of the victors and it is safe to say that they might have been reversed without vitally affecting the result in the fight lambert handled his ship as skilfully as bainbridge did his and the java's men proved by their indomitable courage that they were excellent material 
the java's crew were new shipped for the voyage and had been at sea but six weeks in the constitution's first fight her crew had been aboard of her but five weeks so the chances should have been nearly equal and the difference in fighting capacity that was shown by the enormous disparity in the loss and still more in the damage inflicted was due to the fact that the officers of one ship had and the officers of the other had not trained their raw crews the constitution's men were not picked but simply average american sailors as the javas were average british sailors the essential difference was in the training during the six weeks the java was at sea her men had fired but six broadsides of blank cartridges during the first five weeks the constitution cruised her crew were incessantly practiced at firing with blank cartridges and also at a target footnote in looking through the logs of the constitution hornet etc we continually find such entries as beat to quarters exercised the men at the great guns exercised with musketry exercised the borders exercised the great guns blank cartridges and afterward firing at mark and a footnote the java's crew had only been exercised occasionally even in pointing the guns and when the captain of the gun was killed the effectiveness of the piece was temporarily ruined and moreover the men did not work together the constitution's crew were exercised till they worked like machines and yet with enough individuality to render it impossible to cripple a gun by killing one man the unpractised british sailors fired at random the trained americans took aim the british marines had not been taught anything approximating to skirmishing or sharpshooting the americans had the british sailors had not even been trained enough in the ordinary duties of seamen while the americans in five weeks had been rendered almost perfect the former were at a loss what to do in an emergency at all out of their own line of work they were helpless when the wreck fell over their guns when the americans would have cut it away in a jiffy as we learn from commodore morris's autobiography each yankee sailor could at need do a little carpentering or sail mending and so was more self-reliant the crew had been trained to act as if guided by one mind yet each man retained his own individuality the petty officers were better paid than in great britain and so were of a better class of men thoroughly self-respecting the americans soon got their subordinates in order while the british did not to sum up one ship's crew had been trained practically and thoroughly while the other crew was not much better off than the day it sailed as far as it goes this is a good test of the efficiency of the two navy the u s brig vixen twelve lieutenant george u reed had been cruising off the southern coast on november twenty second she fell in with the southampton thirty two captain sir james lucas yeo and was captured after a short but severe trial of speed both vessels were wrecked soon afterward the Essex, 32, Captain David Porter, left the Delaware on October 28th, two days after Commodore Bainbridge had left Boston. She expected to make a very long cruise, and so carried with her an unusual quantity of stores and sixty more men than ordinarily, so that her muster roll contained 319 names. Being deep in the water, she reached San Iago after Bainbridge had left. Nothing was met with until after the Essex had crossed the equator in longitude 30 degrees west on December 11th. On the afternoon of the next day, the sail was made out to windward and chased. At nine in the evening, it was overtaken and struck after receiving a volley of musketry which killed one man. The prize proved to be the British packet Nocton, 
of ten guns and thirty-one men with fifty-five thousand dollars in specie aboard the latter was taken out and the nocton sent home with lieutenant finch and a prize crew of seventeen but was recaptured by a british frigate the next appointed rendezvous was the island of fernando de norona where captain porter found a letter from commodore bainbridge informing him that the other vessels were off cape frio thither cruised porter but his compatriots had left on the twenty ninth he captured an english merchant vessel and he was still cruising when the year closed the year eighteen twelve on the ocean ended as gloriously as it had begun in four victorious fights the disparity in loss had been so great as to sink the disparity of force into insignificance our successes had been unaccompanied by any important reverse nor was it alone by victories but by the cruises that the year was noteworthy the yankee men-of-war sailed almost in sight of the british coast and right in the tract of the merchant fleets and their armed protectors our vessels had shown themselves immensely superior to their foes the reason of these striking and unexpected successes was that our navy in eighteen twelve was the exact reverse of what our navy is now in eighteen eighty two i am not alluding to the personnel which still remains excellent but whereas we now have a large number of worthless vessels standing very low down in their respective classes we then possessed a few vessels each unsurpassed by any foreign ship of her class to bring up our navy to the condition in which it stood in eighteen twelve it would not be necessary although in reality both very wise and in the end very economical to spend any more money than at present only instead of using it to patch up a hundred antiquated hulks it should be employed in building half a dozen ships on the most effective model if in eighteen twelve our ships had borne the same relation to the british ships that they do now not all the courage and skill of our sailors would have won us a single success as it was we could only cope with the lower rates and had no vessels to oppose to the great liners but to-day there is hardly any foreign ship no matter how low its rate that is not superior to the corresponding american ones it is too much to hope that our political short-sightedness will ever enable us to have a navy that is first class in point of size but there certainly seems no reason why what ships we have should not be of the very best quality the effect of a victory is twofold moral and material had we been as roughly handled on water as we were on land during the first year of the war such a succession of disasters would have had a most demoralizing effect on the nation at large as it was our victorious sea fights while they did not inflict any material damage upon the colossal sea might of england had the most important results in feelings they produced at home and even abroad of course they were magnified absurdly by most of our writers at the time but they do not need to be magnified for as they are any american can look back upon them with the keenest national pride for a hundred and thirty years england had had no equal on the sea and now she suddenly found one in the untried navy of an almost unknown power british vessels captured or destroyed in eighteen twelve the guerriere forty nine guns thirteen hundred forty tons macedonian forty nine guns thirteen hundred twenty five tons the java forty nine guns thirteen hundred forty tons the frolic nineteen guns four hundred seventy seven tons recaptured the alert twenty guns three hundred twenty three tons total one hundred sixty seven guns four thousand three hundred thirty tons 
deducting the frolic. American vessels captured or destroyed the Wasp, 18 guns, 450 tons, Nautilus, 14 guns, 185 tons, and the Vixen, 14 guns, 185 tons, total 46 guns, 820 tons. Vessels built in 1812. The Nonsuch Schooner, 14 guns, 148 tons, built in Charleston, cost $15,000. The Carolina Schooner, 14 guns, 230 tons, built in Charleston, cost $8,743. The Louisiana Ship, 16 guns, 341 tons, built in New Orleans, $15,500 cost. Prizes made. Footnote. These can only be approximately given. The records are often incomplete or contradictory, especially as regards the small craft. Most accounts do not give by any means the full number. End of footnote. Prizes made. The President, seven prizes. The United States, two prizes. The Constitution, nine prizes. The Congress, two prizes. Chesapeake, one prize. Essex, eleven prizes. The Wasp, two prizes. The Hornet, one prize. The Argus, six prizes. Small Craft, five prizes. Total number of prizes, forty-six. End of Part 6Part 7 of The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7. Chapter 4. On the Lakes. 1812. At the time we are treating of, the state of Maine was so sparsely settled and covered with such a dense growth of forest that it was practically impossible for either of the contending parties to advance an army through its territory. A continuation of the same wooded and mountainous district protected the northern parts of Vermont and New Hampshire, while in New York the Adirondack region was an impenetrable wilderness. It thus came about that the northern boundary was formed, for military purposes, by Lake Huron, Lake Erie, the Niagara, Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence, and, after an interval, by Lake Champlain. The road into the States by the latter ran close along shore, and without a naval force the invader would be wholly unable to protect his flanks, and would probably have his communication cut. This lake, however, was almost wholly within the United States, and did not become of importance till toward the end of the war. Upon it were two American gunboats, regularly officered and manned, and for such smooth water sufficiently effective vessels. What was at that time the western part of the northern frontier became the main theater of military operations, and as it presented largely a waterfront, a naval force was an indispensable adjunct, the command of the lakes being of the utmost importance. As these lakes were fitted for maneuvering of ships of the largest size, the operations upon them were of the same nature as those on the ocean, and properly belonged to naval and not to military history. But while on the ocean, America started with too few ships to enable her really to do any serious harm to her antagonist. On the inland waters, the two sides began very nearly on an equality. The chief regular forces, either belligerent possessed, were on Lake Ontario. Here the United States had a man-of-war brig, the Oneida, of 240 tons, carrying 16 24-pound carronades, manned by experienced seamen and commanded by Lieutenant M. T. Woolsey. Great Britain possessed the Royal George, 22, Prince Regent, 16, Earl of Moira, 14, Gloucester, 10, Seneca, 8, and Simcoe, 8, 
all under the command of Commodore Earl. But though this force was so much the more powerful, it was very inefficient, not being considered as belonging to the regular navy, the sailors being undisciplined, and the officers totally without experience, never having been really trained into the British service. From these causes it resulted that the struggle on the lakes was to be a work as much of creating as of using a navy. On the seaboard success came to those who made best use of the ships that had already been built. On the lakes the real contest lay in the building, and building an inland navy was no easy task. The country around the lakes, especially on the south side, was still very sparsely settled, and all the American naval supplies had to be brought from the seaboard cities through the valley of the Mohawk. There was no canal or other means of communication, except very poor roads intermittently relieved by transportation on the Mohawk and on Oneida Lake, when they were navigable. Supplies were thus brought up at an enormous cost, with tedious delays and great difficulty, and bad weather put a stop to all travel. Very little indeed beyond timber could be procured at the stations on the lakes. Still a few scattered villages and small towns had grown up on the shores, whose inhabitants were largely engaged in the carrying trade. The vessels used for the purpose were generally small sloops or schooners, swift and fairly good sailors, but very shallow and not fitted for rough weather. The frontiersmen themselves, whether Canadian or American, were bold, hardy seamen, and when properly trained and led made excellent man-of-war's men. But on the American side they were too few in number and too untrained to be made use of, and the seamen had to come from the coast. But the Canadian shores had been settled longer, the inhabitants were more numerous, and by means of the St. Lawrence the country was easy of access to Great Britain so that the seat of war, as regards getting naval supplies and even men, was nearer to Great Britain than to us. Our enemies also possessed, in addition to the squadron on Lake Ontario, another on Lake Erie, consisting of the Queen Charlotte 17, Lady Prevost 13, Hunter 10, Caledonia 2, Little Belt 2, and Chippeway 2. These two squadrons furnished training schools for some five hundred Canadian seamen, whom a short course of discipline under experienced officers sufficed to render as good men as their British friends or American foes. Very few British seamen ever reached Lake Erie, according to James, not over fifty, but on Lake Ontario and afterward on Lake Champlain they formed the bulk of the crews picked seamen sent out by government expressly for service on the Canada lakes. Footnote, James, volume 6, page 353, end of footnote. As the contrary has sometimes been asserted, it may be as well to mention that Admiral Codrington states that no want of seamen contributed to the British disasters on the lake, as their sea ships at Quebec had men drafted from them for that service till their crews were utterly depleted. Footnote Memoirs, Volume 1, page 322, referring especially to Battle of Lake Champlain. End of footnote. I am bound to state that while I think that on the ocean our sailors showed themselves superior to their opponents, especially in gun practice, on the lakes the men of the rival fleets were as evenly matched in skill and courage as could well be. The difference, when there was any, appeared in the officers, and above all, in the builders, which was the more creditable to us, as in the beginning we were handicapped by the fact that the British already had a considerable number of war vessels, while we had but one. The Falls of Niagara interrupt navigation between Erie and Ontario, so there were three independent centers of naval 
operations on the northern frontier. The first was on Lake Champlain, where only the Americans possessed any force, and, singularly enough, this was the only place where the British showed more enterprise in shipbuilding than we did. Next came Lake Ontario, where both sides made their greatest efforts, but where the result was indecisive, though the balance of success was slightly inclined toward us. Our naval station was at Sackett's Harbor, that of our foes at Kingston. The third field of operations was Lake Erie and the waters above it. Here both sides showed equal daring and skill in the fighting, and our advantage must be ascribed to the energy and success with which we built and equipped vessels. Originally we had no force at all on these waters, while several vessels were opposed to us. It is a matter of wonder that the British and Canadian governments should have been so supine as to permit their existing force to go badly armed, and so unenterprising as to build but one additional ship when they could easily have preserved their superiority. It is very difficult to give a full and fair account of the lake campaigns. The inland navies were created especially for the war, and after it was allowed to decay, so that the records of the tonnage, armaments, and crews are hard to get at. Of course, where everything had to be created, the services could not have the regular character of those on the ocean. The vessels employed were of widely different kinds, and this often renders it almost impossible to correctly estimate the relative force of two opposing squadrons. While the Americans were building their lake navy, they, as makeshifts, made use of some ordinary merchant schooners, which were purchased and fitted up with one or two long heavy guns each. These gun vessels had no quarters, and suffered under all the other disadvantages which make a merchant vessel inferior to a regularly constructed man-of-war. The chief trouble was that in a heavy sea they had a strong tendency to capsize, and were so unsteady that the guns could not be aimed when any wind was blowing. Now, if a few of these schooners, mounting long thirty-twos, encountered a couple of man-of-war brigs armed with carronades, which side was strongest? In smooth water the schooners had the advantage, and in rough weather they were completely at the mercy of the brigs, so that it would be very hard to get at the true worth of such a contest, as each side would be tolerably sure to insist that the weather was such as to give a great advantage to the other. In all the battles and skirmishes on Champlain, Erie, and Huron, at least there was no room left for doubt as to who were the victors. But on Lake Ontario there was never any decisive struggle, and whenever an encounter occurred, each commodore always claimed that his adversary had declined the combat, though much superior in strength. It is, of course, almost impossible to find out which really did decline the combat, for the official letters flatly contradict each other. And it is often almost as difficult to discover where the superiority in force lay when the fleets differed so widely in character as was the case in 1813. Then Commodore Chauncey's squadron consisted largely of schooners. Their long, heavy guns made his total foot up in a very imposing manner, and similar gun vessels did very good work on Lake Erie. So Commodore Yeo, and more especially Commodore Yeo's admirers, exalted these schooners to the skies, and conveyed the impression that they were most formidable craft, by means of which Chauncey ought to have won great victories. Yet when Yeo captured two of them, he refused to let them even cruise with his fleet, and they were sent back to act as coast gunboats and transports, which certainly 
would not have been done had they been fitted to render any effectual assistance. Again, one night a squall came on, and the two largest schooners went to the bottom, which did not tend to increase the confidence felt in the others. So there can be no doubt that in all but very smooth waters the schooners could almost be counted out of the fight. Then the question arises in any given case, was the water smooth? And the testimony is as conflicting as ever. It is not so easy to reconcile the official letters of the commanders, and it is still harder to get at the truth from either the American or British histories. Cooper is very inexact, and moreover paints everything couleur de rose paying no attention to the British side of the question, and distributing so much praise to everybody that one is at a loss to know where it really belongs. Still, he is very useful, for he lived at the time of the events he narrates, and could get much information about them at first hand from the actors themselves. James is almost the only British authority on the subject, but he is not nearly as reliable as when dealing with the ocean contests, most of this part of his work being taken up with a succession of acrid soliloquies on the moral defects of the American character. The British records for this extraordinary service on the lakes were not at all carefully kept, and so James is not hampered by the necessity of adhering more or less closely to official documents but lets his imagination run loose. On the ocean and seaboard, his account of the British force can generally be relied upon, but on the lakes his authority is questionable in everything relating either to friends or foes. This is the more exasperating because it is done willfully when, if he had chosen, he could have written an invaluable history. He must often have known the truth when, as a matter of preference, he chose either to suppress or alter it. Thus he ignores all the small cutting-out expeditions in which the Americans were successful, and where one would like to hear the British side. For example, Captain Yeo captured two schooners, the Julia and Growler, but Chauncey recaptured both. We have the American account of this recapture in full, but James does not even hint at it, and blandly puts down both vessels in the total American loss at the end of his smaller work. Worse still, when the growler again changed hands, he counts it in again, in the total as if it were an entirely different boat, although he invariably rules out of the American list all recaptured vessels. A more serious perversion of facts are his statements about comparative tonnage. This was at that time measured arbitrarily, the depth of hold being estimated at half the breadth of beam, and the tonnage of our lake vessels was put down exactly as if they were regular ocean cruises of the same dimensions in length and breadth but on these inland seas the vessels really did not draw more than half as much water as on the ocean, and the depth would, of course, be much less. James, in comparing the tonnage, gives that of the Americans as if they were regular ocean ships, but in the case of the British vessels, carefully allows for their shallowness, although professing to treat the two classes in the same way. Thus he makes out a most striking and purely imaginary difference. The best example is furnished by his accounts of the fleets on Lake Erie. The captured vessels were appraised by two captains and the shipbuilder, Mr. Henry Eckford, their tonnage being computed precisely as the tonnage of the American vessels. The appraisement was recorded in the Navy Department and was first made public by Cooper, so that it could not have been done for effect. Thus measured, it was found that the tonnage was in round numbers as follows. Detroit, 490 tons, Queen Charlotte, 400, Lady Prevost, 230, Hunter, 180, Little Belt, 90, Chippeway, 70. 
James makes them measure respectively 305, 280, 120, 74, 54, and 32 tons, but carefully gives the American ships the regular sea tonnage. So also he habitually deducts about 25% from the real number of men on board the British ships. As regards Lake Erie, he contradicts himself so much that he does not need to be exposed from outside sources. But the most glaring and least excusable misstatements are made as to the Battle of Lake Champlain, where he gives the American as greatly exceeding the British force. He reaches this conclusion by the most marvellous series of garblings and misstatements. First he says that the Confiance and the Saratoga were of nearly equal tonnage. The Confiance, being captured, was placed on our naval lists, where for years she ranked as a 36-gun frigate, while the Saratoga ranked among the 24-gun corvettes, and by actual measurement the former was half as large again as the latter. He gives the Confiance about 270 men, one of her officers, in a letter published in the London Naval Chronicle, footnote, volume 32, page 272, the letter also says that hardly five of her men remained unhurt, end of footnote, gives her over 300. More than that number of dead and prisoners were taken out of her. He misstates the caliber of her guns and counts out two of them because they were used through the bow ports, whereas from the method in which she made her attack these would have been peculiarly effective. The guns are given accurately by Cooper on the authority of an officer, footnote, Lieutenant E. A. F. Lavalette, end of footnote, who was on board the Confiance within fifteen minutes after the Lynette struck and who was in charge of her for two months. Then James states that there were but ten British galleys, while Sir George Prevost's official account, as well as all the American authorities, state the number to be twelve. He says the Finch grounded opposite an American battery before the engagement began, while in reality it was an hour afterward, and because she had been disabled by the shot of the American fleet. The galleys were largely manned by Canadians, and James, anxious to put the blame on these rather than the British, says that they acted in the most cowardly way, whereas in reality they caused the Americans more trouble than Downey's smaller sailing vessels did. His account of the armament of these vessels differs widely from the official reports. He gives the Lynette and Chubb a smaller number of men than the number of prisoners that were actually taken out of them, not including the dead. Even misstating Downey's force in guns, underestimating the number of his men, and leaving out two of his gunboats, did not content James, and to make the figures show a proper disproportion, he says, volume 6, page 504, that he shall exclude the Finch from the estimate because she grounded, and half of the gunboats because he did not think they acted bravely. Even were these assertions true, it would be quite as logical for an American writer to put the Chesapeake's crew down as only two hundred, and to say he should exclude the other men from the estimate because they flinched and to exclude all the guns that were disabled by shot would be no worse than to exclude the finch. James's manipulation of the figures is a really curious piece of audacity. Naturally, subsequent British historians have followed him without inquiry. James's account of this battle alone amply justifies our rejecting his narrative entirely as far as affairs on the lakes go whenever it conflicts with any other statement, British or American. Even when it does not conflict, it must be followed with extreme caution, for whenever he goes into figures, the only thing certain about them is that they are wrong. 
he gives no details at all of most of the general actions. Of these, however, we already possess excellent accounts, the best being those in the Manual of Naval Tactics by Commander J. H. Ward, U.S.N., 1859, and in Lossing's Field Book of the War of 1812 and Cooper's Naval History. The chief difficulty occurs in connection with matters on Lake Ontario. Footnote. The accounts of the two commanders on Lake Ontario are as difficult to reconcile as are those of the contending admirals in the battles which the Dutch waged against the English and French during the years 1672 to 1675. In every one of de Reuter's last six battles, each side regularly claimed the victory, although there can be but little doubt that on the whole the strategical and probably the tactical advantage remained with de Reuter. Every historian ought to feel a sense of the most lively gratitude toward Nelson. In his various encounters he never left any possible room for dispute as to which side had come out first best. End of footnote where I have been obliged to have recourse to a perfect patchwork of authors and even newspapers for the details, using Niles' register and James as mutual correctives. The armaments and equipments being so irregular, I have not, as in other cases, made any allowance for the short weight of the American shot, as here the British may have suffered under a similar disadvantage and it may be as well to keep in mind that on these inland waters the seamen of the two navies seem to have been as evenly matched in courage and skill as was possible they were of exactly the same stock with the sole exception that among and under but entirely distinct from the canadian english fought the descendants of the conquered canadian french and even these had been trained by englishmen were led by English captains, fought on ships built by English gold, and with English weapons and discipline. On Lake Ontario, there being, as already explained, three independent centres of inland naval operations, the events at each will be considered separately. At the opening of the war, Lieutenant Woolsey, with the Oneida, was stationed at Sackett's Harbour, which was protected at the entrance by a small fort with a battery composed of one long thirty-two. The Canadian squadron of six ships, mounting nearly eighty guns, was of course too strong to be meddled with. Indeed, had the Royal George twenty-two, the largest vessel, been commanded by a regular British sea officer, she would have been perfectly competent to take both the Oneida and Sackett's Harbour. But before the Canadian Commodore Earl made up his mind to attack, Lieutenant Woolsey had time to make one or two short cruises, doing some damage among the merchant vessels of the enemy. On the 19th of July, Earl's ships appeared off the harbour. The Oneida was such a dull sailor that it was useless for her to try to escape, so she was hauled up under a bank where she raked the entrance, and and her off guns landed and mounted on the shore, while Lieutenant Woolsey took charge of the battery, or Long 32, in the fort. The latter was the only gun that was of much use, for after a desultory cannonade of about an hour, Earl withdrew, having suffered very little damage, inflicted none at all, and proved himself and his subordinates to be grossly incompetent. Acting under orders, Lieutenant Woolsey now set about procuring merchant schooners to be fitted and used as gun vessels until more regular cruisers could be built. A captured British schooner was christened the Julia, armed with a long thirty-two and two sixes, manned with thirty men, under Lieutenant Henry Wells, and sent down to Ogdensburg. On her way thither, she encountered and actually beat off, without losing a man, the Moira of fourteen and Gloucester of ten guns, 
footnote james volume six page three hundred and fifty end of footnote five other schooners were also purchased the hamilton of ten guns being the largest while the other four the governor tompkins growler conquest and pert had but eleven pieces between them nothing is more difficult than to exactly describe the armaments of the smaller lake vessels the american schooners were mere makeshifts and their guns were frequently changed footnote they were always having accidents happen to them that necessitated some alteration if a boat was armed with a long thirty two she rolled too much and they substituted a twenty four if she also had an eighteen pound carronade it upset down the hatchway in the middle of a fight and made way for a long twelve which burst as soon as it was used and was replaced by two medium sixes so a regular gamut of changes would be rung and a footnote as soon as they could be dispensed with they were laid up or sold and forgotten it was even worse with the british who manifested the most indefatigable industry in intermittently changing the armament rig and name of almost every vessel and the records being very loosely kept it is hard to find what was the force at any one time a vessel which in one conflict was armed with long eighteens in the next would have replaced some of them with sixty-eight pound carronades or beginning life as a ship she would do most of her work as a schooner and be captured as a brig changing her name even oftener than anything else on the first of september commodore isaac chauncey was appointed commander of the forces on the lakes except of those on lake champlain and he at once bent his energies to preparing an effective flotilla a large party of ship carpenters were immediately dispatched to the harbor and they were soon followed by about a hundred officers and seamen with guns stores etc the keel of a ship to mount twenty four thirty two pound carronades and to be called the madison was laid down and she was launched on the twenty sixth of november just when navigation had closed on account of the ice late in the autumn four more schooners were purchased and named the ontario scourge fair american and asp but these were hardly used until the following spring the cruising force of the americans was composed solely of the oneida and the six schooners first mentioned the british squadron was of nearly double this strength and had it been officered and trained as it was during the ensuing summer the americans could not have stirred out of port but as it was it merely served as a kind of water militia the very sailors who subsequently did well being then almost useless and unable to oppose their well-disciplined foes though the latter were so inferior in number and force for the reason that it was thus practically a contest of regulars against militia i shall not give numerical comparisons of the skirmishes in the autumn of eighteen twelve and shall touch on them but slightly they teach the old lesson that whether by sea or land a small well officered and well trained force cannot except very rarely be resisted by a greater number of mere militia and that in the end it is true economy to have the regular force prepared beforehand without waiting until we have been forced to prepare it by the disasters happening to the irregulars the canadian seamen behaved badly but no worse than the american land forces did at the same time later under regular training both nations retrieved their reputations commodore chauncey arrived at sackett's harbor in october and appeared on the lake on november eighth in the oneida lieutenant woolsey with the six schooners conquest lieutenant elliot hamilton lieutenant mcpherson tompkins lieutenant brown pert sailing master arundel julia sailing master trant growler sailing master mix the canadian vessels were engaged in conveying supplies from the westward 
Commodore Chauncey discovered the Royal George off the False Duck Islands and chased her under the batteries of Kingston on the ninth. Kingston was too well defended to be taken by such a force as Chauncey's, but the latter decided to make a reconnaissance to discover the enemy's means of defense and to see if it was possible to lay the Royal George aboard. At 3 p.m. the attack was made. The Hamilton and Tompkins were absent chasing and did not arrive until the fighting had begun. The other four gunboats, Conquest, Julia, Pert, and Growler, led in the order named to open the attack with their heavy guns and prepare the way for the Oneida, which followed. At the third discharge, the Pert's gun burst, putting her nearly hors de combat, badly wounding her gallant commander, Mr. Arundel, who shortly afterward fell overboard and was drowned and slightly wounding four of her crew. The other gunboats engaged the five batteries of the enemy while the Oneida pushed on without firing a shot till at 3.40 she opened on the Royal George and after twenty minutes combat actually succeeded in compelling her opponent, though of double her force, to cut her cables, run in, and tie herself to a wharf where some of her people deserted her. Here she was under the protection of a large body of troops, and the Americans could not board her in face of the land forces. It soon began to grow dusk, and Chauncey's squadron beat out through the channel against a fresh headwind. In this spirited attack the American loss had been confined to half a dozen men, and had fallen almost exclusively on the Oneida. The next day foul weather came on, and the squadron sailed for Sackett's Harbor. Some merchant vessels were taken, and the Simcoe 8 was chased, but unsuccessfully. The weather now became cold and tempestuous, but cruising continued until the middle of November. The Canadian commanders, however, utterly refused to fight. The Royal George, even fleeing from the Oneida, when the latter was entirely alone, and leaving the American Commodore in undisputed command of the lake. Four of the schooners continued blockading Kingston till the middle of November. Shortly afterward, navigation closed. Footnote. These preliminary events were not very important, and the historians on both sides agree almost exactly, so that I have not considered it necessary to quote authorities. End of footnote. Lake Erie. On Lake Erie there was no American naval force, but the army had fitted out a small brig armed with six six-pounders. This fell into the hands of the British at the capture of Detroit, and was named after that city, so that by the time a force of American officers and seamen arrived at the lake there was not a vessel on it for them to serve in, while their foes had eight. But we only have to deal with two of the latter at present, the Detroit still mounting six six-pounders, and with a crew of fifty-six men under the command of Lieutenant of Marines Roulette of the Royal Navy, assisted by a boatswain and a gunner, and containing also thirty American prisoners and the Caledonia a small brig mounting two four-pounders on pivots with a crew of twelve men canadian english under mr irvine and having aboard also ten american prisoners and a very valuable cargo of furs worth about two hundred thousand dollars moved down the lake and on october seventh anchored under fort erie footnote letter of captain jesse d elliot to Secretary of Navy Black Rock, October 5, 1812, end of footnote. Commander Jesse D. Elliott had been sent up to Erie some time before with instructions from Commodore Chauncey to construct a naval force, partly by building two brigs of 300 tons each. Footnote. 
that is of three hundred tons actual capacity measured as if they had been ordinary sea vessels they each tonned four hundred eighty their opponent the ship detroit similarly tonned three hundred and five actual measurement or four hundred ninety computing it in the ordinary manner End of footnote and partly by purchasing schooners to act as gunboats no sailors had yet arrived but on the very day on which the two brigs moved down and anchored under fort erie captain elliot received news that the first detachment of the promised seamen fifty one in number including officers footnote the number of men in this expedition is taken from lossing's field book of the war of eighteen twelve by benson l lossing new york eighteen sixty nine page three eighty five note where a complete list of the names is given End of footnote. was but a few miles distant he at once sent word to have these men hurried up but when they arrived they were found to have no arms for which application was made to the military authorities the latter not only gave a sufficiency of sabres pistols and muskets to the sailors but also detailed enough soldiers under captain n towson and lieutenant isaac roach to make the total number of men that took part in the expedition one hundred twenty four this force left black rock at one o'clock in the morning of the eighth in two large boats one under the command of commander elliot assisted by lieutenant roach the other under sailing master george watts and captain towson after two hours rowing they reached the foe and the attack was made at three o'clock elliot laid his boat alongside the detroit before he was discovered and captured her after a very brief struggle in which he lost but one man killed and midshipman j c cummings wounded with a bayonet in the leg the noise of the scuffle roused the hardy provincials aboard the caledonia and they were thus enabled to make a far more effectual resistance to sailing master watts than the larger vessel had to captain elliot as watts pulled alongside he was greeted with a volley of musketry but at once boarded and carried the brig the twelve canadians being cut down or made prisoners one american was killed and four badly wounded the wind was too light and the current too strong to enable the prizes to beat out and reach the lake so the cables were cut and they ran down stream the caledonia was safely beached under the protection of an american battery near black rock the detroit however was obliged to anchor but four hundred yards from a british battery which together with some flying artillery opened on her getting all his guns on the port side elliot kept up a brisk cannonade till his ammunition gave out when he cut his cable and soon grounded on squaw island here the detroit was commanded by the guns of both sides and whichever party took possession of her was at once driven out by the other the struggle ended in her destruction most of her guns being taken over to the american side this was a very daring and handsome exploit reflecting great credit on commander elliot and giving the americans in the caledonia the nucleus of their navy on lake erie soon afterward elliot returned to lake ontario a new detachment of seamen under commander s angus having arrived on the twenty eighth of november the american general smith dispatched two parties to make an attack on some of the british batteries one of these consisted of ten boats under the command of captain king of the fifteenth infantry with one hundred fifty soldiers and with him went mr angus with eighty-two sailors including officers the expedition left at one o'clock in the morning but was discovered and greeted with a warm fire from a field battery placed in front of some british barracks known as the red house six of the boats put back but the other four containing about a hundred men dashed on 
while the soldiers were forming line and firing the seamen rushed in with their pikes and axes drove off the british capturing their commander lieutenant king of the royal army spiked and threw into the river the guns and then took the barracks and burned them after a desperate fight great confusion now ensued which ended in mr angus and some of the seamen going off in the boats several had been killed eight among whom were midshipmen rag dudley and hold up all under twenty years old remained with the troops under captain king and having utterly routed the enemy found themselves deserted by their friends after staying on the shore a couple of hours some of them found two boats and got over but captain king and a few soldiers were taken prisoners thirty of the seamen including nine of the twelve officers were killed or wounded among the former being sailing masters sisson and watts and among the latter mr angus sailing master carter and midshipmen rag hold up graham brailsford and irvine some twenty prisoners were secured and taken over to the american shore the enemy's loss was more severe than ours his resistance being very stubborn and a good many cannon were destroyed but the expedition certainly ended most disastrously the accounts of it are hard to reconcile but it is difficult to believe that mr angus acted correctly later in the winter captain oliver hazard perry arrived to take command of the forces on lake erie chapter five eighteen thirteen on to the ocean at the beginning of the year eighteen thirteen the british had been thoroughly aroused by the american successes and active measures were at once taken to counteract them the force on the american station was largely increased and a strict blockade begun to keep the american frigates in port the british frigates now cruised for the most part in couples and orders were issued by the board of admiralty that an eighteen pounder frigate was not to engage an american twenty four pounder exaggerated accounts of the american forty fours being circulated a new class of spar deck frigates was constructed to meet them rating fifty and mounting sixty guns and some seventy fours were cut down for the same purpose footnote james volume six page two hundred six and a footnote these new ships were all much heavier than their intended opponents as new england's loyalty to the union was not unreasonably doubted abroad her coasts were at first troubled but little a british squadron was generally kept cruising off the end of long island sound and another off sandy hook of course america had no means of raising a blockade as each squadron contained generally a seventy four or a razee vessels too heavy for any in our navy to cope with frigates and sloops kept skirting the coasts of new jersey the carolinas and georgia delaware bay no longer possessed the importance it had during the revolutionary war and as the only war vessels in it were some miserable gunboats the british generally kept but a small force on that station chesapeake bay became the principal scene of their operations it was there that their main body collected and their greatest efforts were made in it a number of line of battleships frigates sloops and cutters had been collected and early in the season admiral sir john warren and rear admiral cockburn arrived to take command the latter made numerous descents on the coast and frequently came into contact with the local militia who generally fled after a couple of volleys these expeditions did not accomplish much beyond burning the houses and driving off the livestock of the farmers along shore and destroying a few small towns one of them hampton being sacked with revolting brutality footnote james 
volume six page three hundred forty says the conduct of the british troops on this occasion was revolting to human nature and disgraceful to the flag and a footnote the government of the united states was in fact supported by the people in its war policy very largely on account of these excesses which were much exaggerated by american writers it was really a species of civil war and in such a contest at the beginning of this century it was impossible that some outrages should not take place the american frigate constellation had by this time got ready for sea and under the command of captain stewart she prepared to put out early in january as the number of blockaders rendered a fight almost certain within a few days of her departure her crew were previously brought to the highest state of discipline the men being exercised with a special care in handling the great guns and in firing at a target footnote life of commander tatnall by c c jones savannah eighteen seventy eight page fifteen end of footnote however she never got out for when she reached hampton roads she fell in with a british squadron of line of battle ships and frigates she kedged up toward norfolk and when the tide rose ran in and anchored between the forts and a few days later dropped down to cover the forts which were being built at craney island here she was exposed to attacks from the great British force still lying in Hampton Roads, and fearing they would attempt to carry her by surprise, Captain Stewart made every preparation for defence. She was anchored in the middle of the narrow channel, flanked by gunboats, her lower ports closed, not a rope left hanging over the sides. The boarding nettings boiled in half-made pitch till they were as hard as wire, were triced overboard toward the yard arms and loaded with kentledge to fall on the attacking boats when the tricing lines were cut while the carronades were loaded to the muzzle with musket balls and depressed so as to sweep the water near the ship footnote for an admirable account of these preparations as well as of the subsequent events see cooper volume two page two hundred forty two and a footnote twice a force of british estimated by their foes to number two thousand men started off at night to carry the constellation by surprise but on each occasion they were discovered and closely watched by her guard boats and they never ventured to make the attack however she was unable to get to sea and remained blockaded to the close of the war at the beginning of the year several frigates and smaller craft were at sea the chesapeake captain evans had sailed from boston on december thirteenth eighteen twelve footnote statistical history of the u s navy by lieutenant g e emmons end of footnote she ran down past madeira the canaries and cape de verde crossed the equator and for six weeks cruised to the south of the line between longitude sixteen and twenty five degrees thence she steered to the west passing near suriname over the same spot on which the hornet had sunk the peacock but a day previous cruising northward through the west indies she passed near the bermudas where she was chased by a seventy four and a frigate escaping from them she got into boston on april ninth having captured five merchantmen and chased unsuccessfully for two days a brig sloop the term of two years for which her crew were enlisted now being up they for the most part left in consequence of some trouble about the prize money captain evans being in ill health captain james lawrence was appointed to command her he reached boston about the middle of may footnote he was still on the hornet at new york on may tenth as we know from a letter of biddle's written on that date in letters of master's commandant eighteen thirteen number fifty eight and so could hardly have been with the chesapeake two weeks before he put out 
and had to get his crew together and train them during that time. End of footnote. And at once set about enlisting a new crew and tried, with but partial success, to arrange matters with the old sailors who were now almost in open mutiny. When the year 1812 had come to an end, the Essex 32 was in the South Atlantic, and Captain Porter shortly afterward ran into St. Catherine's to water. Being at a loss where to find his consort, he now decided to adopt the exceedingly bold measure of doubling Cape Horn and striking at the British whalers in the Pacific. This was practically going into the enemy's waters, the Portuguese and Spanish countries being entirely under the influence of Britain, while there were no stations where Porter could revictual or repair in safety. However, the Essex started, doubled the horn, and on March 13th anchored in the harbor of Valparaiso. Her adventurous cruise in the Pacific was the most striking feature of the war but as it has been most minutely described by commodore porter himself by his son admiral porter by admiral farragut and by cooper i shall barely touch upon it on march twentieth the essex captured the peruvian corsair nereida sixteen hove her guns and small arms overboard and sent her into port she made the island of san galan looked into Caleo, and thence went to the Galapagos, getting everything she wanted from her prizes. Then she went to Tumbez and returned to the Galapagos, thence to the Marquesas, and finally back to Valparaiso again. By this year's campaign in the Pacific, Captain Porter had saved all our ships in those waters, had not cost the government a dollar, living purely on the enemy, and had taken from him nearly 4,000 tons of shipping and 400 men, completely breaking up his whaling trade in the South Pacific. The cruise was something sui generis in modern warfare, recalling to mind the cruises of the early English and Dutch navigators. An American ship was at a serious disadvantage in having no harbor of refuge away from home. While on almost every sea there were British, French, and Spanish ports into which vessels of those nations could run for safety, it was an unprecedented thing for a small frigate to cruise a year and a half in enemy waters and to supply herself during that time purely from captured vessels, with everything, cordage, sails, guns, anchors, provisions, and medicines, and even money to pay the officers and men. Porter's cruise was the very model of what such an expedition should be, harassing the enemy most effectually at no cost whatever. Had the Essex been decently armed with long guns instead of carronades, the end might have been as successful as it was glorious. The whalers were, many of them, armed letters of mark, and though of course unable to oppose the frigate, several times smart skirmishes occurred in attacking them with boats or in captured ships, as when Lieutenant Downs and twenty men in the prize Georgiana, after a short brush, captured the Hector with twenty-five men, two of whom were killed and six wounded, and when under similar circumstances the prize Greenwich of twenty-five men captured the Seringapatam of forty. The cruise of the Essex, the first American man-of-war ever in the Pacific, a year and a half out and many thousand miles away from home, was a good proof of Porter's audacity in planning the trip and his skill and resource in carrying it out. End of part seven.